on Zoom that won't send you the link till you've paid your money. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we haven't gone into that one. No, just, uh, I was just asking the question, that was yeah. all. No, that's a reasonable question to ask, but... Uh, and and I, was so, quite, I was quite willing to pay my five pounds or whatever. Well... Um, and I'd come down to London, it's saving me a lot of money, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what Alan Ronsley said in his... Uh, Email to some of his customers yesterday, which sort of said, We're not, you know, no trip to London and two nights in the hotel we're not paying for. So, uh, that's right.
Oh, I'll mix, otherwise the children will like to come.
Um, okay. I've got I've got the meeting. Okay. I'll do that. I, I did. Oh, no, you have to. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Uh, not putting the camera on yet because I'm going to be going backwards and forwards. Uh, Rick Murray insists that I need to update the website uh, before the, or before or after the talk. So uh, I might actually do some website work this morning in between the talks. Right, well good morning everyone, we're coming just about coming up to 11 and we will be starting any minute. Okay, I can see Rob down there as well, that's good. You can hear me too. everyone uh yes good morning everyone to this um our first attempt at a virtual show um, so this is all a bit of an experiment i don't know how it's going to go but hopefully it will run relatively smoothly and we'll get from one talk to the next on time um, we will be trying to keep to a schedule so any speakers who start running over don't be offended when i cut you off <laughs> It will probably happen at some point. Right, I think we have now hit 11. And yeah, people are in. People are in the live stream as well on YouTube, so welcome to them. Uh, right, Rob, if you want to unmute yourself and take over, I will hand over to Rob. I'll do that. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether it's a blessing that I'm the first uh, person on or whether it's a, uh, a curse because this is where we find out uh, everything that goes wrong. So let's see if I press some buttons and share. Ah, post has disabled sharing. Brian can hand me the com. Sorry about that, it should be working now. Okay. <laughs> ah, that looks more normal. Right. Okay. That's not what Okay, yeah, so uh, 
welcome to the London show, uh, except I'm sitting in Cambridge, so I saved myself a train journey this time. I'm uh, talking on behalf of LSR. Uh, yes, I've got the uh, first slot, which uh, I hope for, uh, hopefully is uh, a blessing rather than a curse. So let's see how this goes uh, and whether I can fit myself into the 30-minute uh, uh, slot. So uh, we've got a few things to talk about, and hopefully I'll talk fast enough. Um, there are some fun things, uh, some serious things, some hobby things, and some titanium things. Um, so I don't know who is at today's show, um, but uh, Amcod Games uh, has teamed up with LSR, and you can then buy through our store uh, two exclusive collections. Uh, those are the um, Space Collection, which contains Protector, Xeroid, and Starmine, uh, or the um, Puzzle Collection, which has got Legends of Magic, Mock Tops, and the Escape from the Arcade. Both of those are $19.99. Fantastic. Move the microphone goes away from my face. I'll do that. Hopefully, that's a bit better. Okay. Uh, and then uh, back earlier in the year, so the other half of the word collection, um, LSR ran an offer which is perhaps not uh, the smartest business acumen that I came up with, which was to buy both copies and you save £10. And then that £10 is donated to Med Sans Song Frontier. Uh, to help out people in less fortunate uh, places in the world. So uh, thank you very much to everybody who uh, bought both of them uh, on behalf of me and uh, Tony. Thank you very much. On to some more serious things, I'm afraid. Uh, we all have to pay taxes. Nobody likes doing it. Um, and one of the applications that LSR uh, sells is profit accounts, which was originally um, produced by Apricot Studios. Uh, and it's kind of a, a, a kitchen sink application uh, in that it has everything that you might need to be able to handle stock control, everything that you might need to uh, sell items to customers. It has a customer database, manage your bank account, uh, even deals with uh, foreign exchange rates. Uh, and one of the things that it outputs uh, is a reporting feature and that allows you to um, that allows you to uh, deal with VAT uh, in particular and obviously do your year end accounts that you submit to your um, your accountant. Along with that, because accountants is rather a complicated topic, there's a, a monster 262 page manual. Um, you can probably skip through most of that just to the bit that you're stuck on, but uh, in particular, I'm thinking about. Uh, VAT at the moment. Now, there's a scheme called Making Tax Digital, which again, you have to be excited by VAT to know what all that means. Uh, it's basically an electronic scheme that was introduced uh, just over a year ago, so April 2019, where instead of filling in a paper VAT return, like the one shown on the right, or doing it through their website, um, HMRC now allow you to directly submit your back return straight into their computer. So from your computer to their computer, with no intervening uh, technology required. And I think probably long term, the aim for that is to get more up to date uh, back return. So you still only need to do it quarterly, but I can see a, a situation in a few years' time where they decide that they want to see data monthly um, or, or to be able to see more fine grain data. But at the moment, it's uh, quarterly as usual, and you still just need to fill in the same nine boxes uh, that you ever did in the paper form. Now, originally, the plan was to extend that to everyone uh, from April 2020 this year, but uh, I guess events uh, took, took over that this year, and that's now been kicked forward. So I think you've got another year, you've got until April uh, 2021 to deal with that. And as you do everything you might expect, submit, uh, look at your previous ones, and uh, complete the future ones. Now, not everyone wants to use profit. I will fully admit that. Uh, to do all of their accounting, it's obviously a, a big jump 
uh, if you're and you've got a small business and doing things in Excel is fine, or doing them on uh, bits of paper. So one now way to bridge from your paper napkin or Excel method uh, to send that to HMRC, and that's called bridging. So it is an officially supported term. So making tax digital bridging, there are many bridging solutions, and one of those bridging solutions is profit. So we open our accounts for the Macadam Bridge Construction Corporation. Uh, all that you need to do is enter some dummy sales in the sales ledger. So if you put in the date, and the date just needs to land somewhere in the period that you're submitting, and then give it a sales, uh, the things that you owe back on. The account doesn't really matter, that can just be any old account. So let's pretend we made £6,000 worth of sales, 10% of that. pounds we owe them market is paid so we've now sold six thousand pounds of which we owe a thousand pounds in that and then uh, if you had uh, sold something to someone in the eu and they had sent you a uh, their back number you still need to declare that data even though you didn't charge them any back um, i think that just goes into some big statistics pool so let's say we sold 200 pounds something like that but we don't owe any VAT, because that's the person at the other end's problem. So it's stuff within the UK that we owe VAT on and stuff that we don't owe VAT on. And then the reverse is also true. So for purchases, uh, bung in an entry for uh, a quarter, things that I made, things that I purchased rather, because I can claim back that on that, so £3,000 worth of stuff that I bought, 20% that, uh, so let's say £500, mark is paid. And then similarly, if I imported something from the EU in that period, that would have come in that free, so I need to then pay the VAT on that to Batman. So, so £6, pounds, we've got a tenner, I'll do, mark that as pay. And that's basically all there is to do, bridging. So you can work out all those numbers however you want on a piece of paper or in Excel. Uh, and then you just need to uh, load up the current back period. Everything that you have. So those are just the nine boxes that you always have to fill in and paper, and then you click submit, and then send it off to the Batman. And that's pretty much it. So obviously I'm not going to submit that today, because uh, then I would end up with a very strange back return this quarter, but look, those are the basic principles involved. Now, excitingly, uh, in order to um, be approved as a supplier of uh, making touch digital software, um, I have to go through a, an interview process, um, but now if you go to the HMRC website, you can do this this afternoon, and search for um, LSR Profit, you'll find that I'm listed in the results. It's very exciting. It's the only risk loss application approved by uh, HMRC to do their uh, transactions. I don't know who the other company is, though. Someone else annoyingly got in first with the name Profit. Definitely not me. So LSR is the top one. So uh, all of these are available now. Um, so if you're starting from scratch, you'll need a new copy, which is £94.80. Uh, if you already used Profit prior to this, um, and you have a version that was done by Quentin Payne, uh, you can upgrade and there's a 33% discount off that. And then if you need the making tax digital option, in other words, your turnover is £80,000 currently, uh, then you can buy that on top. That's, that's an optional add-on. You don't have to buy that. I thought, you know, in, in risk loss terms, those are relatively expensive uh, pieces of software. And but then I thought, well, I wonder how much, if I was doing this same bridging on Windows, how much would that cost me? And I looked at both Zero accounts and Sage accounts, which are online um, 
account packages for Windows, uh, they're, they're done on like a rental model, so you pay per month, uh, and they're typically in their sort of 20, 25 pounds a month. Um, so you quickly get to 250 pounds a year without too much trouble. So it actually still works out to um, but you can run a small business on RiskOS and not have to spend too much money, which is good. Okay, that was enough of the serious stuff. I promise I won't mention tax once more. Uh, onto hobby type things. So, uh, onto a Raspberry Pi. So, uh, you've got a device in the drawer, and you may or may not know that uh, there's add on boards that you can get called hats. And the hats are um, basically it's sort of hardware attached on top, and they're um, defining a particular shape board with screw holes in a particular place um, that will add various bits of functionality to your Raspberry Pi that's not on the main board. And about two years or so ago, uh, somebody emailed in to LSR and said, "Oh, I, I really need to control my CNC router. I'm trying to uh, route out some bits of metal or plastic, um, but." Uh, the software that they had only ran uh, using a parallel port. So I thought, well, I think we could make a parallel port hat. Um, and as it happens, there's space on the board um, to stick in a serial port as well. So although the Raspberry Pi already has a serial port, uh, it doesn't come out on a 9 pin D sub anywhere. So it's in the hat. You basically just squeeze it onto the um, 40 pin GPIO headers. And then for mechanical stability, you need uh, some mounting, some more pillars, and then not the bolt. And there should actually be four nuts and bolts. Lots of my uh, demo time uh, showing you how to do up a screw, uh, but I'm only bothering with two screws. 10 or 4. So that's the hardware aspect of the installation. And then back over in RISC-OS, uh, you've got a parallel port device driver that you uh, merge into your boot sequence using the normal boot merge tool. And that's the software side of things. So, putting my other hat on, uh, one of the other uh, interested is the PIC micros. The uh, PIC micros are little 8 bit uh, microcontrollers, often that come in uh, nice big DIL uh, packages, easy to solder into your demo projects. Um, and about uh, 20 years ago now, I put together something called PIC Suite, which comprises an assembler that takes BBC Basic syntax as its input. Uh, obviously with some uh, pick assembler instructions inside the square brackets. And then also a disassembler if you want to go in the opposite direction, a simulator so you can check your algorithms, and then uh, a, a programming tool, and that's the thing that's shown on the right. And the circle is complete, uh, that has a parallel port on it, so uh, I needed a way of uh, controlling that through my Raspberry Pi. So the project that we're going to look at is a, a pretty simple, it's a traffic lights project, uh, and it uses a PIC 16F28A, or more you too much to what that is, so it's a, a flash-based microcontroller from the PIC 16 family. Uh, it's got a load of GPIO lines, uh, some timers, serial ports, that sort of thing. Now, all we're going to do with it is uh, control three LEDs, red, amber, and green. Pretty simple. Uh, in, a, in a loop, uh, and then uh, program that down into the pick. So we plug the Centronics connector into the um, pick program, and then the uh, parallel port into the hat, and then stick our pick 16 into the, um, into the zip socket. That's the hardware ready. Back over the next step, so we go to the which comes with a uh, traffic light example. 
I think it's just basic. You can uh, edit it in your favorite editor. I'm using Strong Edit here. Uh, a lot of this is just defining uh, port definitions and, and register numbers and things that are not desperately interesting. Don't worry too much about that. Uh, the thief of it starts here with a little bit of initialization. So this is just setting up the ports to be output pins to drive the LEDs and uh, setting up the timers. And the bulk of the program is the main loop, which is just a state machine that cranks through four separate states, one, two, uh, not one, two, three, and then with a time make delay. And the time of delay, I'm afraid, is just done with a few cheesy not instructions just to waste a bit of processing time, but nothing to get advanced here. And at the bottom, our four states are red, red and amber, green, and back round to amber again. Okay, so if you run the big launch, that gets me a desktop front end to pick basic, which we're running in 14 bit mode. You can get 12 and 16 bit picks as well. Yeah, that's it. So that's my code image that I'm going to program into the chip. Open up PicPog, this is the programmer. Select the device, which is a PIC16F68A. Uh, and go over to do the programming step. Got my code memory in. Don't need any data memory, that's um, extra E squared memory you don't have. And then the configuration for users set up how the processor is uh, going to run. I can never remember what they are. So fortunately, I've left them there. So I've lost later up. Don't need code protection. Don't want the burn out. Don't want the watchdog. That then downloads into the pick, so it's only a 2K pick. And this is just using the normal parallel swise underneath. So if you have a RISC PC or an Ionix or a Titanium with a parallel port uh, add on card, it will work just the same as, as we do on Raspberry Pi. Oh, oh, oh. Just the configuration there. On the chip. To the other strip board and my LEDs. Touch the battery. There we go, red, red, amber, green, amber, red. Or just lights and traffic lights. So, parallel port and serial port hats is available now. It's £38.40. Uh, and uh, there's also a, uh, a Wi-Fi hat available in the same family, which uh, I'm not going to demonstrate today. I've got time. And the last thing I'm going to cover are uh, some things to do with Titanium. And back in June, um, we updated the uh, version of Debian that's provided with the Titanium. And so uh, you can use that through Go Linux. So Go Linux is an application that runs from RiskOS. Once you double click on it, it loads Linux, uh, usually from the micro SD card socket because there's, there's nothing normally in that socket. Um, but you could also uh, load it off of uh, a spare uh, SSD, for example. Now, uh, Linux has some advantages in that it's able to use both of the cores in the titanium, so you can get uh, the sort of 3 gigahertz equivalent uh, processor, which is useful if you're running. Uh, applications for which there is no risk less equivalent. So for example, if you're doing some audio editing, uh, you can launch into Linux and go and do your editing there. So LSR provides that on a micro SD card for eight pounds prospect. Um, and that includes the XFC desktop and the latest version of Firefox pre-installed uh, and running the uh, long-term stable release of Linux as well. Uh, don't want to buy an SD card, that's fine too. You can go to uh, gitshub.com and look for the LSR UK 
uh, username, uh, all the sources are there, and instructions on how to burn an SD card as well. So this morning, it's, uh, I know it's one minute to seven this morning, I was awake. Uh, I took a screen capture of uh, Firefox running in, a, in the desktop. Uh, in Linux. And that uh, are all the things I was going to have talking about. And I finished with no minutes to spare. <laughs> right, Does anyone thanks. have any questions? Thank you, Rob. I can see there's one question in the chat which says, What's the performance on the titanium like under Linux? Okay, uh, so I would say it's um, the processor is um, perfectly acceptable speed. And um, so when you launch um, uh, Firefox, you know, it'll take around five seconds for it to load. Um, the, the bottleneck is probably running from a micro SD card. So if you want um, particularly to have a, um, a more performance experience, then I would use definitely use an SSD. So um, titaniums have uh, four. Um, SATA sockets anyway, so if you dedicate one of those to a SSD for use with um, RISC-OS, one for your CD drive, you can still um, bung in a spare SSD purely for use with Linux. So um, Linux does thrash the, um, the drive quite a lot. So that's the, that'd be my recommendation. Right, if anyone else has any quick questions, we've only got a few minutes to spare, but if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask Seven minutes or less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, hello. Hi. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I, I was hoping you was going to talk about the cloud software, actually, because I was interested in that. Um, quick, two quick questions, if I may. Is, is there a show price for it? And also, I was looking on the website, and it says it runs from the cloud, I think it said. But it, on your website, it says it's free 10 gig storage, but I can't find that anywhere. When you go to pCloud, it's only offering you two tiers and they're quite expensive. Okay, so for, yeah, for pCloud, um, what you need to do is uh, sign up for their free account. And I think that gives you an initial two gigabytes. And then there's a little game that they play that you have to upload a dummy photo. You can, you can delete it 10 minutes later and then they'll give you another gigabyte. And then I think they send you a text message and they give you another 10 gigabytes. So and basically you can build your way up to the 10 gigabytes. It, it used to be a much simpler where you just signed up and you immediately got 10. Yeah. Uh, but then they made it into a game about six months ago. So yeah, you, you get an initial two and then you have to do, you have to jump through a few hoops to get the remainder. No, no, no so, sorry. What I mean is I could only see, see two tiers and they were both expensive. I couldn't see anything that was either free or a, a base tier that you could start from. They were like really crazily expensive. There was only like two tiers. Well, as of about two weeks ago, there was definitely a free tier. I, I couldn't find it on the website, but I'll have a look again. Okay. Oh, yeah, if you've got me an email, I can, I can send you a link. No, normally, it's just if the mere process of creating the account. Oh, okay. they, then, they then give you the, obviously, they're trying to sell you the tiers because they want, it's like Dropbox, you know, they'll give you a, 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 some space for free. But okay. what they really want you to do is to buy the, uh, the, the larger storage. So yes, there's a, there's a lifetime option and there's a right, right. Think there's a something like a one terabyte option. But yeah, you can yeah. ignore that. Just create an account. Okay, great. Another question, if I may. What what's the licensing on it? Is it per user or per machine when you buy when you buy the cloud software? It's it's per user on a, a fair use basis. So the assumption is that most people have at least two riskless machines. So that's fine. Just just install it. <laughs> Right, so, I, I, I can do it on more than two if I want because I've got quite a few risk cost machines, but I personally own them. Okay, right, yeah, so, yeah, there, there is an upper limit to the total number of times where, you know, if, if you try to install it like five times or something like that, that's probably been a little bit cheeky. Okay, right, okay, cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Right, I think we're probably about there. So Hello. thank you very much, Rob, for, oh, sorry, oh, that's another question coming in. Right, just following on, um, Rob, from the P Cloud. Is it possible to access more than one P Cloud account? I'm trying yes. to access the second one, and I just keep getting um, not logged on. 
Yeah, so if you had two accounts, so um, for example, um, if, if you, like me, you have your own uh, email domain and, and so you can change the first part of it, uh, then if you go into OmniClient and then the username that you're using OmniClient is the thing that it decides which eCloud account to go to. So, so I have one as LSR, and then I also have one as myself as Spo. So yeah. I, I can log in as two people that way. Yeah, I've, I've tried doing that, and I finish up just getting the not logged on error message. I think it is. Okay. And the username and password is right. So there's nothing within the program that would uh, need to be changed. Yeah, no, 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 no. When, it, when it's deciding uh, which account to log on, it, it merely takes what you typed into OmniClient and yeah. sends it uh, directly to them. There's no, no intervening magic. There's nothing baked into Cloud of S that, that knows that it's there. Right. No. Yeah. Um, if, yeah, if you're still stuck, um, send, send an email to support at lsr.co.uk, I'm sure, can figure out where it's gone wrong. Yeah, I'll have another play. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, thank sorry, you very much. Sorry, just another question, if I may. Um, what, what's there any show prices, or is it any what's on the website? Uh, we, have, we haven't changed any uh, uh, show prices specifically for today, no, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right, appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Right, thank you, Rob. Okay. You start sure, ready to move over now. Let's talk. So, thank you for kicking us off in style. Although you're Hello. definitely struggling this morning, more than the other day. Uh, I have one question. Oh, hello, Stefan. Um, might it be possible to uh, add some other cloud systems like uh, um, uh, what is it now? Uh, Dropbox. Uh, yeah, so under the bonnet, um, CloudFS knows um, it's kind of it's layered in the way that uh, it knows about protocols. So there's one CloudFS filing system, and then underneath that, there are different protocols, and one of those is pCloud. And the intention was and is still to add other protocols, and yeah, Dropbox, um, OneDrive, and Google Drive are all the obvious ones to do. And the reason for picking pCloud first was that um, um, the API that they present maps really easily, or really obviously, to risk less filing systems. So, um, for example, if you want to open a file and write 10 bytes to it, there is an open file API and there is a write some bytes API. When you look at the, uh, the way that Dropbox and uh, Google and Microsoft present their drives, they're intending you only ever to upload an entire file at a time. So that doesn't map very easily to being able to seek within a file as you would in risk if you're doing it in basic, for example. Um, so the, the technical barrier there is always how you deal with um, wanting to look within small parts of a file when the API that the, the providers give you doesn't allow you. And I think probably the solution to that is to keep a cached local copy so that you're actually dealing with it all locally and then only when you finally close the file do you bother uploading it to the, the cloud. Okay. Okay, Stefan. Well, that yeah. nicely yes. leads on to leads on to your turn, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, thankfully, it sounds like your internet connection is working better than Rob's was. So halfway yeah. down is better than just up the road. <laughs> right. So, uh, yes, it's now eleven thirty. So, I'm going to hand over to Stefan. Tell us mm -hmm. about the Cloverleaf project and crowdfunding and other things. Away you go, Stefan. Okay. Um, must I click here something? Or... You should be able to share your screen. Okay. Um, yeah. I first share the graphics. Um, oh. Well, I'm Stefan Fröhling and I'm the creator of the Cleverleaf Risk OS project, um, which has the aim, I mean, four main goals. Number one is to promote Risk OS worldwide. 
because it's obviously a very good operating system and I think uh, more people should know about it. And um, also more people should have a choice for different operating system, not only two, three or four. So um, that's one aim of my project to um, make RiskOS more known around the globe. And uh, that we will do also by uh, our crowdfunding, uh, which will be on Kickstarter. So we get a big audience there automatically. So I hope we can attract uh, more people internationally to RiskOS and get also some funders for our project. Then the other main task of my project is to upgrade RiskOS so that it's really usable on daily means that um, <clears throat> yeah, you can use a browser and have the drivers for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, USB 3 and NVMe drives. Uh, also some handling stuff about uh, the graphics user interface should be improved. For example, I mean, users that come from Windows or Linux, they might have some uh, problems about the handling with RiskOS and um, there could be the option that uh, we adjust uh, the handling, I mean, make it configurable so that um, they uh, can more easily switch between the uh, systems. Then uh, number three of the goals is uh, to buy, provide plug-in hardware for new RiskOS users, which is, I think, very important because uh, most people, I mean, not hackers or programmers, they want to go in the shop or order a system online and then get it and plug it in and use it and not uh, get a motherboard and a case and a charger and then must program a SD card or whatsoever to uh, finally start working with the system. So that's, uh, I think, a very important uh, step to make RiskOS more usable for new users. And number four is, uh, to represent RiskOS with a new brand so that this brand can more easily promote RiskOS as you need a platform to do this. If you want to spend money for advertising, for example, you must have a product behind it to make money. So that we want to do also I'm working not alone on this project. Uh, my partner in UK is uh, Andrew, Andrew uh, Ronsley. So he is uh, responsible for the hardware adoption for the RK3399 chip boards. And with this uh, chipset, uh, we can provide a wide range of um, hardware like desktop PC, laptop, and also all-in-one PC. So that should attract also more users to RiskOS and give also for current RiskOS users more choices. And I think uh, this hardware will um, deliver also state-of-the-art performance. So, um, that hopefully will give a good base for our project. Okay. Um, 
Mit einem Switchback. Das hier. Motivation for the program project is um, I think risk is a, it's a very unique operating system and more people deserve to know about it so that they will be able to use it. That is also, uh, for example, Raspberry users, uh, they can install it easily on their Raspberry, but uh, most are still not using RiskOS because at the moment there is some lack of uh, software and uh, drivers. So that um, we hope to solve with the project also. Then the second part, that I want to offer the people around the world more choices for their operating system, for their computers. Number three is uh, that I want to fight with this uh, project also against monopolists like uh, Google, Windows, Apple, that the people have more choices and don't need to rely only on their products and these companies. And number four is that, uh, the, of course, with the ARM CPUs, we have a system that uses a lot, very small amount of uh, energy. And this will contribute also for the fight against global warming because we should all reduce our CO2 food step. So I think this is a very interesting package for anybody who wants or needs to use computers around the world. Well, you all should know about the features of RiskOS, which is... is uh, yes. Are you yeah. still supposed to be screen sharing? Because your screen sharing has stopped. So oh. we're not seeing any slides. You don't see anything? No. Okay. Okay, this is not. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I forget That's to it. activate it. Uh, well, just can jump back. Okay, this, this was the motivation. The, uh, that, you also didn't see, yeah? Yeah, that's the one we missed. Okay, yeah. So that we had already, and that is about the unique features about RiskOS. Uh, well, one is the, the modular concept of RiskOS, uh, that you have different modules that uh, allow to do different tasks or implement different features to the operating system that might exist uh, in different operating systems also a similar way. Uh, but I think um, in the original concept, this was uh, quite rev revolutionary um, when Acorn did RiskOS. And another unique feature is a cooperative uh, multitasking, which uh, as I know only RiskOS offers at the moment. All other operating systems are preemptive multitasking. And that is also, um, I think, one key feature that RiskOS has good performance on uh, low uh, power hardware, like the Raspberry, for example. The unique user interface. I mean, there are some concepts that differ from uh, other operating systems and which I like also very much. Then the, that RiskOS was a very low amount of um, memory, which uh, is based um, that the original system had just uh, one megabyte ROM as basis. So uh, Acorn had to squeeze anything into one megabyte and still have some memory free for programs and data. So that's, I think, a very good 
argument for the operating system also, and the low power consumption of the ARM CPUs. Ah, uh, status, well, you should know all as a RISC-OS user what are the problems with RISC-OS and what is lacking. Uh, one thing, I mean, the most important thing is a lack of a browser that uh, supports HTML5 and JavaScript. Luckily, that is covered by um, RISC-OS developments and hopefully they will release soon the browser to public so that this major problem is solved for the RISC-OS world. Then the next is uh, the implementation of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NVMe driver, which has to do also um, with internet, especially uh, Wi-Fi is needed because uh, it looks a little bit uh, strange when you offer a notebook, but uh, you don't have a Wi-Fi support for it. And, um, we will try also to work on the GPU support because it's a shame that we have quite um, powerful ARM CPUs on the boards, but we don't have any access to the GPU. Yeah, this makes totally no sense. And um, I hope uh, we can get uh, some way the access to that. There might be a possibility uh, by adopting the open source uh, Panfrost uh, driver, which is a Linux, Linux project mainly to access uh, the arcade, not the, what, uh, which one is it? Uh, I forget which Mali, Mali version they access. But I think it's working on the Aircar 33992. So that might be a possibility to adopt or get access to GPU drivers. And uh, NVIDIA has promised to the Panfrost uh, open source project also that they get a better support. So maybe we can benefit from that. And if RISC-OS get more users, then we uh, will have also a bigger voice in the computer world. So maybe um, ARM or NVIDIA can give us better support also for, for access to the GPU. Then another um, part of my project is to uh, fill the gaps of um, programs in RISC-OS, um, which we did already with the uh, ChatCube um, Messenger. Uh, that is a um, native RISC-OS uh, instant messenger program, which also will provide other clients, other messenger clients. And we have already um, included the Telegram client and we plan to add uh, also the IRC and Twitter and it's possible to add any um, instant messengers uh, that have a API so that we can access their um, system. The next uh, we are working on a new photo editing program that has uh, also support for the multi-core module that is uh, uh, Lee, Jeffrey Lee is working on. And um, yeah, due to my project, uh, Jeffrey wants to finish uh, his uh, module now so we can have access to multi-core on the CPUs.
So to achieve all this, uh, we need uh, the funding for this. Uh, my company uh, has uh, two workers, more or less full-time working on this. But we need, of course, some money to uh, finance this. And uh, we will start uh, active crowdfunding on Kickstarter at the 12th November this year. And that will take uh, 60, year, uh, 60 days until the 12th uh, January. But there's other ways also to support us, uh, for example, by assisting us with programming. And there are a lot of uh, programmers that uh, are helping also with that already, like Jeffrey Lee or um, Jason. Tribeck is writing a new um, sound system for RiskOS. And there's many different uh, ways also to support us by writing documentations for RiskOS or promoting our project on your social network or finding some reporters that want to report about RiskOS and our project and so on. So there's many ways uh, you can support RiskOS and our project, not only with money. So how I get back. How I can show my video signal. Want to unshare? Uh, unshare, okay, no. You're yeah. back. Yep. So that's basically what I wanted to say. And if anybody has questions, then we can start with that now. Right, so if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask questions, feel free. I've just posted in the chat the link to the download chat cube. Um, and there is some show chat going on in chat cube as well at the moment. So if anyone wants to join that. So do you have chat, chat cube running there, Stefan, whether you could? Uh, wait. Uh, I've installed to uh, Stormwater. Uh, me? Hi, Timo. Yeah. Okay. But I see also uh, Sean, uh, Sean Carmel uh, waving, and I'm not sure who was first. OK, if, if I may, uh, I have from uh, way back uh, uh, an A9 home, uh, a RISC PC, uh, one RISC PC, all the rest of mine have, have gone elsewhere. Uh, and I use RISCOS on uh, a, a Mac as a, 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 whatever they call it, sorry, uh, brain's gone. Uh, I know how to use RISCOS, uh, but when I've ever uh, advised, uh, suggested somebody uh, who hasn't used RISCOS before to have a try, use a, a, a Raspberry Pi to have a go at RISCOS, uh, the big problem is that to a very large extent, they've got nowhere unless I set the thing up for them because the instructions, the uh, background, the access hasn't been straightforward. And what I'm certainly looking for in the project now is something that will make everything straightforward, as straightforward as it was when I got my wrist PC in the first place and plugged it in and switched it on. Is that what we're going for? Are we going for something that will be easy for people who haven't used Viscos for, uh, before to get to using it and to use software, uh, to have software there and to be able to upgrade to new software from that. 
Is that our aim? Is that our clear aim? Um, yes, for sure. Um, but the question is how far um, we want. Can you hear me or not? Yeah, fine. Um, how far we will want to go to um, yeah, to change RISC-OS to be the same as uh, other operating systems. Yeah, I agree uh, that we should um, make it configurable, for example, about the mouse, which uh, mouse keys, are, uh, my mouse buttons are used. Yeah, which is a menu button, for example, but that is already uh, implemented in uh, risk OS Direct. Yeah, that you can choose uh, if uh, the middle mouse button or the right mouse button is a menu key. Yeah, there might be other stuff uh, about the window handling, for example, or about the clipboard and this um, that should be also um, configurable. Uh, so it can be switched to a mode that is like Windows or like Linux or Mac OS or whatsoever. Yeah, so when the people switch between different operating system, they not must switch uh, all the time their thinking and uh, of course will be upset. Can I um, just point out, John, uh, there's risk, there is already a risk of direct which is already aimed at starters, new people being pushed around rather than jams when COVID cut in and stopped it all. So we have already got a, if you like, a starter system. Uh, obviously it needs enhancing. And I know Andrew Rawns is already talking about doing an update to that for the end of the year uh, to try and improve it. Uh, that's Tom, isn't it? Was that Tom? Or no, that's that Chris Hughes. Oh, that's Chris, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm 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 aware of uh, of that, uh, which is uh, I should I thought I said in the past. Uh, I mean things have improved recently, but I'm hoping uh, that the ease of access is something uh, that obviously uh, developed quite uh, recently uh, is something that uh, will be accelerated uh, 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 by the new project. I mean, I know uh, what you've done, what Tom's done, and a, a, a whole lot of others has, has been great, uh, but I want even better. Sorry. I think Tom has commented I, in the chat that, oh, sorry. as well as the Viscos Direct distribution to be easy to use, there's also his video series. Yeah, that, that's YouTube. fabulous. That's fabulous. Sorry, uh, team, uh, we yours. Yeah. But just uh, actually two questions. Uh, you are working together with, uh, for example, Rule or RiskOS uh, development, because uh, else we get a very splintered uh, landscape again, I think. And secondly, um, we have in May next year, hopefully the next annual Big Band Club Day. Uh, can I invite you? Um, of course, uh, I would like uh, to come there. Um, well, the plan is uh, for sure to work with all groups together um, because uh, our aim is not to make a fork of RiskOS. Yeah, we want to support RiskOS and to improve RiskOS for all RiskOS users. Yeah. Um, so, anyhow, uh, we are working together with uh, the people in rural. Yeah. Um, but that really will start only um, after uh, we got the funding for the project. Um, and there might be uh, some better coordination because, uh, I mean, we are, I'm talking with people in rule. When I have an idea about risk OS, I post something in rule. And then there is a discussion about it. Yeah. And then all people say what they have to say and also I get new information about it yeah because I'm not a low level risk risk uh, freak yeah so uh, I don't know about many uh, low level issues of risk risk um, I'm more a normal user I just want to use risk risk for my daily life 
yeah and i want that it works good yeah and that is uh works for everyone for mainstream users and uh not only for computer hackers and programmers and this kind of people yeah so um yeah that's it i mean we will I'm working with Andrew, so he will also make sure or likely make sure that there will be no problem with risk course development or rule. Yeah. So we want to work together with everyone. Yeah. And what uh, the aim of my project is also to, uh, um, to get it done faster than in the uh, past, because uh, there was not too much going on in the last 10 years yeah so that is also my aim uh, of my project to push uh, the people in the risk risk world so that they implement the stuff faster than they did so far there was a question on the chat uh, about the chat cube uh, that it's a telegram client um, you can add uh, different clients. I mean, that is uh, uh, the uh, the plan that you can even add different client to ChatCube. So at the moment, there's only uh, one client, and that is for Telegram. Yeah, so you can log in uh, in ChatCube to your Telegram account, or you also can create a Telegram account in ChatCube. Yeah. You don't need to go to Telegram and do it there. Um, and the minimum, uh, this I don't know, the minimum OS needed for Trap Cube, I'm not sure. But I think it might work also on a 26 bit version, but I'm not sure about it. um so so about um gp support what kind of api do you plan on making available to risk us hmm. uh, i cannot tell about that uh, yet because uh, first we must have uh, any way to access a gpu and then uh, we can think about uh, how we implement it in uh, risk -wise. but um I was told that we should uh, implement some like OpenGL or OpenES or something like that library so everyone can access it, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that will be, uh, well, some end of next year or something, not before for sure. Mm -hmm. Hi, Stefan. This is Paolo. Yeah. Um, a quick thing. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I um, liked it. Uh, one thing that you may want to add, I don't know if this is a value for the general user, but because seems to be a lot of, you know, there seems to be a lot of interest around the desktop. Uh, one of the features that, because nowadays this is a feature that RiskOS has, is that it doesn't spy on the user. You probably want to add that. It doesn't spy on the user. Uh, all all uh, modern operating system and proprietary they nowadays they are collecting a lot of information about how the user is using the operating system, when he's doing updates, and all this stuff, uh, which RiskOS at the moment um, is not, and hopefully will stay so forever. Yes, uh, that is also uh, one thing that I like about RiskOS uh, is that it's not uh, constantly communicating with uh, different companies in the world by internet and like Windows updating all the time and downloading new updates without the knowledge of the people. I mean, you can contribute that it will not do it without your knowledge, but um, well, 
99% of the people will not uh, set it like that. Uh, so that I want to keep also, um, yeah, that the risk rest users have uh, total control about uh, their internet uh, connection or activities, so that not various pro pro programs start updating or communicating with their home server or whatsoever, yeah. Cool, thank you. Thank you also for the question. Uh, there was somebody asking about the uh, um, Telegram security. Um, currently, uh, the um, messages uh, run over our server because um, we, uh, the Risk OS, uh, doesn't support the libraries that will allow a direct access to the Telegram server. And the information about that is on the download page uh, for the chat cube at the bottom of the page. There, uh, I've written down uh, how the Telegram uh, stuff is communicating with chat cube. Any more questions? Uh, just one question. How much do you think it's going to take to achieve the goals that you sort of set out in the presentation? Oh, that's uh, difficult to <laughs> estimate. Um, I mean, uh, we have set the um, target of our um, Kickstarter to 100,000 euro. But that is really um, only the total minimum goal because it will more or less only cover our costs that we had to uh, organize the Kickstarter. And only when we get more than 100,000, then we really get funding for what we want to do. And um, But the first Kickstarter, um, will be only a first step because we are planning after that to make uh, on Indiegogo and then also a second one on Kickstarter again uh, because we have seen uh, about the Spectrum Next Kickstarter that they had um, quite a good success on the first Kickstarter but a tremendous success on the second one. The first one was uh, 150,000 pounds and the second one, I think, 1.5 uh, million pounds or maybe even more. I, I didn't check uh, what was the final result. Yeah, And uh, we hope to achieve something similar like that. Thanks. Yeah, welcome. Thanks for the question. Any more question? That is a lot, uh, 100,000 uh, euros, because if I look to the uh, bounties uh, from RiskOS Open, I see that there is 11,000 pounds uh, available for the TCIP uh, stack. So, uh, uh, how are you going to achieve the 100,000 uh, euro goal? In the 100,000 is not only included uh, direct fundings of the project, but um, also hardware. Yeah, so um, if we get uh, 100,000 only by funding, I mean direct funding, for example, you uh, you donate 100 euros or something like that uh, just for the project, then of course uh, 100,000 is a lot of money. Yeah, but um, we um, offer a lot of uh, hardware um, as options. So um, I think that uh, most of this 100,000 will go to the hardware. So we have maybe um, 70,000 only for the hardware cost. 
and then we make a so-called profit of 30,000 for our project to fund our work and project programming for the RiskOS project. And when you say the money's going to the hardware, is that, um, what are you developing? I mean, I saw the actual, uh, the idea of the machines, um, you know, so that seems like an interesting idea. Um, is it about, does that money sort of fund bringing uh, all the facilities of those to life? Like for instance, when you're talking about Wi-Fi, is that sort of native Wi-Fi support for those, those bits of hardware? Um, yes. Um... I mean, with hardware, I mean uh, that we will deliver the um, desktop PC or the laptop to the funder, not actually the development cost of the drivers for the hardware, yeah, which is a Andrew uh, is doing. Um, And we use uh, a valuable hardware for our project because otherwise we are, we would have a much, much higher cost uh, for the project. Um, so we just use uh, a valuable hardware. So we are also, uh, it will be possible to deliver more um, computers if we get orders after it we don't need to always order 1000 desktop pcs or 1000 laptops or whatsoever so we can in worst case we can also um, still continue uh, deliver for our project the hardware when we get much lower numbers Pardon? Next question. We've run out of questions. Is everyone busy? Uh, maybe there is more question. I must look in the text. I think people are admiring your t-shirt is one thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we will also have different uh, designs uh, as uh, the t-shirts. Uh, for the funding, and there will be 19 euro. Uh, and I can show you some other designs, but maybe in the meantime, somebody can ask a question. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, Bluetooth. Uh, is there somebody actually uh, working next to me on Bluetooth? Because uh, I'm uh, trying to get it working on the Pi. Uh, are you already working on that? or? Uh, currently, uh, David Hickton is uh, working on it. Yeah, I mean, he had, uh, he had a Bluetooth uh, driver already. So it's working on it already uh, some years, yeah. And um, while well, he is uh, looking into it, I cannot say he's working on it. Yeah, but the idea is uh, that if nobody is working on it, then my programmers will do it. Yeah, uh, but in case you are working on it, then my programmers don't do it. They don't need to do it, yeah. Uh, can you just type the name from that programmer in the... In the chat, yeah. because I, then I at least I have a name. But yeah. Do you know if he is on the on the rule form or? Yeah, yeah. Ah, David Hickton. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, Stefan. <coughs> uh, I just want to talk with Timo again. Um, yeah, this is one thing that we should coordinate. Uh, better i mean um that not multiple people are working on the same stuff yeah so um that we should really uh, coordinate uh better in the future um that uh, we know who is working on what yeah so we don't make double work and so on yeah yeah that uh, that's sometimes a little bit problematic uh, so uh 
do you know a good place where we can coordinate this action? Because I put some things on the uh, rule farm, uh, also mm. with the status, but that's some time ago. But uh, I see. Yeah, maybe. Well, I'm not sure. I saw your post. Yeah, I'm not checking now every day. Every day also. No, that's the, that's the problem. And sometimes I, I'm active on the startup farm. So if you know a way where we can coordinate this action, that would be uh, nice. Yeah, I mean that uh, we need to figure out what is the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, Rule is not uh, always the best way um, to do it. I mean, it's good for get ideas and so on, but uh, we should have a better way that uh, really everyone uh, gets updates uh, about this uh, issues. Mm. Um, who should know about it? Yeah. And I don't know, uh, I don't, for example, I don't get any emails if there's updates in the, in the topics. Yeah, well, that's uh, yeah. yeah but, uh, uh, but I have the same problem with uh, Stardot. Uh, sometimes I'm also on the Stardot form, which is also very good uh, with uh, technical things. But, mm. uh, yeah, uh, to get a uh, push update, oh, uh, there is something about your subject that's that's sometimes a little bit problematic. Mm. And uh, as you know, uh, the the development. If if I may give uh, give an idea for as well for uh, Risco as uh, I think uh, if somebody could work on a good. Uh, development environment for uh, the risk os that would be fantastic mm, because it's yeah. now, um, straightforward uh, very um, <clears throat> annoying to say the least to work with make yeah. files and that sort of things you mean uh, mainly debugging or what do you mean about uh, development uh, if uh, if i uh, want to write software for risk os i uh, can use a uh, gcc or i can use the uh, norcroft compiler from uh, from rule but uh, I wouldn't say that environment is very friendly, uh, certainly if you are used to uh, Microsoft Visual Studio. Yeah. So, yeah, so because that you said, sure. sorry. Yeah, that's said, for sure one thing uh, that, that we should look into. Yeah. Um, there we should, uh, I mean, all developers uh, should have uh, a talk together what uh, they would like to see and uh, what would uh, be the best approach to achieve that. Yeah, and that is uh, not only, I mean, there's uh, the, like the programming editor and uh, um, yeah, the handling of the user interface of risk OS, I mean, uh, to implement a, a program, you need a better support, maybe like Delphi or something like that. Uh, because uh, you told in your presentation, you are more a user than a programmer. But yeah. uh, to make good software and also improve the operating system itself, you really need a good uh, environment for developers. And I wouldn't say uh, that it's a good uh, environment right right now. Yes, yes. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not banned for, from this forum, but uh, it's, it's my no, personal. No, no, that is 100% uh, correct. And um, yeah, I would like to uh, hear some uh, feedback or ideas uh, about it. Um, yeah, so we can do something about it to improve the situation, which is of for sure not uh, convenient. And uh, in the future, uh, I mean, uh, we should program on RiskOS and not on Windows or Linux PCs for RiskOS, yeah. Well, you can program uh, for RiskOS on the RiskOS, that, that's, but it's it's very agaric. And also, if you do it on the Linux with a cross compiler, it's not ideal. Mm, yeah. Right. Um, hey, Stefan, I have a quick question um, as a software developer. Okay, so uh, on risk cost, there's always been historically a lack of support for dynamic link libraries. Um, there was an attempt to add this to the AIF uh, file format. Um, and right now we have support for dynamic link library in the ELF or ELF file format. So what's the plan for the future uh, for risk cost, uh, 
is ELF becoming the main file format and therefore we should uh, focus on it or is going to still use AIF. And so there are plans to add uh, dynamic link library support uh, to AIF as well. And this question actually connects back to the discussion that you were having about the IDE because powerful IDE do require shared libraries to be built and, and, and uh, work or, or work closely to what Visual Studio or Eclipse or other famous uh, IDE does. Um, about this file format, I uh, know uh, not very much, yeah, as I'm not uh, currently not an active programmer. Uh, so that is also your task uh, to join our programmer group. Yeah, so we should all together decide about this, what will be the best approach for it, yeah. And uh, that is, uh, I think, one of the major tasks that we have also to uh, uh, get uh, the better programming environment, yeah? Because without programming environment, you cannot make programs effective, effectively, yeah? So this is uh, maybe one of the most important points uh, that should be uh, solved, yeah? So I'm uh, happy to get your input. And I mean, we will decide all this together, hopefully, and uh, find a common ground. Uh, so what should be done? Yeah, this might be also a problem uh, with many people that come many op opinions. And then at the end, we must choose one. Sure, thank you very much. It's just a curiosity because there is never uh, an opportunity to actually discuss are we gonna go stick to AIF and expand it or we're gonna migrate, migrate to ELF, what else? Um, it, it's kind of unknown to me right now. And you know, was just curious to know what was yeah. going to the future. Thank yeah, you. but uh, we, we don't have any plans about that yet because, well, but it is, uh, what I need is also feedback from the community what is needed for risk OS, yeah. Because I'm not aware about everything, so this is a very important point um, that uh, you give uh, feedback to me so we can decide uh, what is the most important to do next, yeah, and how it is done, yeah because there's a million ways how you, uh, you can do things and we must find hopefully the right one, the most so, effective one. Absolutely, yeah. and, and we'll do as usual. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Good, thank you. Any more questions? <laughs> Stefan, can I ask about uh, support for foreign languages? You mentioned that you wanted to encourage worldwide use of RISCOS, and RISCOS yes. has been very much an uh, English-centric language. Yeah. So I wondered what your thoughts were in terms of making it, I mean, in previous years, Acorn occasionally did a, a German promotion or tried to do a German version, but I wondered what mm. you felt, particularly with languages that, for example, are 16-bit or right to left, so what are your thoughts on improving RISCOS or are you focusing on essentially keeping it as an English operating system with worldwide users? No, um, I mean, one, uh, one thing is that font, the font manager must be uh, improved, that it uh, supports a full UTF-8 uh, range. Yeah, about the right to left writing, uh, I don't know. Um, how difficult uh, is that to implement? Yeah, but for sure, uh, I want uh, support for any Asian uh, languages uh, like Chinese, Thai, uh, Japanese, Korean, and so on. Yeah, so, and also um, we should have uh, tr um, translation for the user interface to all main uh, languages, yeah, I mean, there's uh, not only European, but uh, maybe in the future also like Chinese or something like that, yeah. That might be a big uh, user base also in China. 
uh, maybe they might be also uh, interested to get rid of uh, Microsoft and Google and so on. Yeah, so I mean, there's a big uh, market there. Um, that is for sure also one of the first steps uh, that I want to look into to get a, a German, Spanish, uh, French translation, Portuguese and so on. Yeah, that will be the first step and then later maybe Chinese also. Yeah. Yes, I mean units, Unicode support, yeah. Okay, we're getting towards the near the end of the slot. Um, so if anyone has any last questions. Well, there's one question about Kickstarter. Well, there will be more details in the Kickstarter, but I'm not sure um, that it's so detailed like uh, you want to have. Um, about 64-bit uh, uh, RISC-OS, um, I think uh, there must be a, a future with 64-bit uh, uh, RISC-OS, um, but that will be in the range of two, three years at least um, that we can work on that here. That will be um, a very big step in the risk of history and a big effort also. So I'm not sure um, when that can be achieved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Well, we, um, there was a question about GIMP. I mean, we are uh, looking to uh, use GIMP or at least uh, the um, software background of GIMP to port it to uh, RISC-OS. Uh, I'm not so fond of the user interface of GIMP, so I would like to uh, uh, make a risk less version. Yeah. There might be some other. Yes, uh, I'm talking with Simon Bird Whistle about the font manager, and he said he uh, wants to work on it. Uh, but, um, well, we will see uh, what will be the result of that, but he is of course giving a good advice about a font system as he is, a, is an expert about it. And then we will see if he can do it or we need to do it with his uh, help. And um, I want to encourage also anybody who is uh, working in RISC-OS um, to, well, release uh, their old programs, maybe, that they have still somewhere. Make them free if you don't uh, work on it anymore, so that um, we, we get a bigger software base for RISC-OS. And I'm happy to work with anybody who will want to do something to uh, make some ports of uh, open source programs. Yeah, if they feel they cannot do it alone, yeah, then I'm always happy to uh, give support for these people or find some other people who can work with them so that we can get a result for risk less. That seems like a good place to wrap things up, Stefan. Thank you very much for coming along. Thanks. Uh, updating us on the project. Uh, we'll look out for the Kickstarter next month. And yeah. See how that goes. Yeah. Thank you very I much. Hope positive. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so coming up next, we have uh, a new kind of a new visitor for the show, which is um, Phil Pemberton. He's going to be 
talking about the uh, need for software preservation to in some ways ties back to what Stefan was saying about getting old getting a lot of old programs actually stored so that it can be used in the future so that's coming up in about oh, in about four minutes time so for a minute people can chat as they want and they'll we'll be back in a in a second I'd just like to ask can anyone hear me just want to make sure my mic works yes Phil that's yes, okay excellent <laughs> cheers that's an impressive set of equipment in the background you've got there that's oh. <laughs> that looks like a busy workshop yeah well there's a playstation 3 that sadly failed in the repair process sat there at the minute um largely the the repair workload in the last couple of weeks has been uh risk pcs and archimedes kit so that's all uh that's all the kit to repair that lot <clears throat> Right, and got you just a, probably got can't see minutes, on the left hand so. side the soldering iron and stuff. Hi. Oh, Chris oh. Newman. Hi, Chris. Um, just going back to what uh, was said previously. It seems that we're a bit fragmented. Now, I've been on risk os 4 with uh, risk pcs and virtual Acorn, and I wanted to go to 5 and try out a Pi and so on. But it was a quite a convoluted business to find out how to do it easily and how to understand it. I eventually got to risk os Direct and Wi-Fi Sheet. And talking about the, the fact that programmers all over the place and companies all over the place, we don't seem to have a one-stop shop for risk os where you could go and then be directed to various places that you need it. I mean, for a beginner, that, that I would think that would be what you wanted. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, is he talking with me or still? Or? I think we're on general chat at the moment, really. So, okay. <laughs> anyone who feels like they can answer. Can yeah, everyone say something, Stefan? Yes, uh, if I understood it right, yeah, that's the idea, yeah, that uh, we uh, can uh, supply to uh, RiskOS users or the more than new users a complete system. Yeah. So just looking at the, you know, the overall picture of, of who's what and where, it's a case that Cloverleaf is about sort of getting um, RiskOS machines and risk us as a brand um you know so that people can go and buy that thing am i right in then thinking that uh, risk us direct is your, where your beginners learn how to use it and get something that's sort of um you know a great way of getting into it so would they be running risk us direct on your hardware for instance and then risk us uh, or open is where you go if you're a coder and um you know you sort of uh, get harvested for all of your uh, your your hopeful ability to uh, code stuff for risk us <laughs> is that right there's a rough kind of broad idea um basically yes um i'm not really sure what is the agenda of risk risk development yeah I mean, they uh, supported uh, <coughs> RiskOS for all the time, yeah. Um, but I don't know what is their plan, yeah. What is their long-term plan, uh, what they want to do with RiskOS or more why they are doing it, yeah. But that you can uh, uh, ask uh, Andrew, maybe. What I wouldn't, what I don't want to see is the uh, pauses and the, uh, the 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 blanks that we've just had in response to that question. Uh, I want the same response as you get if somebody said. What about these Apple machines? Where, where, where do you find out about them? And they said, well, go to the Apple shop. You can find their uh, what's 
being sold, what hardware you can find instructions for a whole host of things and you can get started there. I want the same immediate answer. I want everybody on this uh, 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 forum now to say immediately, yeah, well, you go to the risk cost shop. It's one place where you can start, where it's everything that's been sold is indicated there, where uh, what it's about is indicated there, where instructions are indicated there, either on that site or linked to. But we need everybody to be able to give an immediate answer that a newbie can go to and say, ah, right, I'll find out about it. I think that... If you... Sorry, go on, Paul. I oh, know, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I, I mean, in principle, I agree. I think the, the, the only challenge is, is um, who is actually coming to risk us as a new user? You know, and, and I don't specifically mean let's profile one person. I, what I'm saying there is you, you might get someone who's uh, been part of a, you know, Raspberry Pi jam who's interested in hacking around with bits of motors and GPIOs. Then you might get someone who's looking to run their, um, their accounts on, you know, Elsa's bit of kit and you know software like that in which case their 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 journey into finding out about the platform is going to be very very different you know they won't want to know about led so maybe um you know through all these various brands that are popping up uh, particular signposting away to the right person if they're not the right person or right brand for instance you know i um and and signposting towards themselves of, of course if they are catering for that market and maybe then a website to join them all together. Yeah, but we need one answer. Sorry to jump in on this. But we uh, need one starting point. Can I say something? Uh, I mean, rather than inventing yet another website and another place to go to, what, isn't Rule the obvious um, place for this? Now, I mean, Rule is not uh, up to what's being spoken about at the moment. It needs to be improved for people who don't know about Riscos, I think. But that's the obvious place to put all this information and direct people. Although, you know, I say it's not doing it very well at the moment. I, I, well, I find the rural website very confusing. I'm, I'm finding my way around it and what's needed and what bits to download. I find it horrendous. I think the rural website is is absolutely ideal for the, the purpose that it sort of exists for, which was um, and and. Do, you know, don't take my word in terms of what I'm saying here as, as, as this. This is my interpretation. But um, it's a great place to go if you want to find out about how the code is developing, where resources are being put. There's also a place you can download it. Because of course, they, you know, they were, I won't say the first, but maybe they were, um, you know, certainly a prominent space to kind of get into that if you wanted to put risk costs on a Raspberry Pi. But, um, you know, it's great doing what it does but if you're coming into it let's say um, I'm a business owner I want to find a stable machine to run my accounts on which is really what we're talking about if we we're talking about attracting new users we're not talking about necessarily attracting excessive enthusiasts to random computers you know if I'm a business person I want a stable machine that isn't running necessarily stage as uh, stage sage or or you know those various other things or I'm looking for options this is this this is where that communication is very very different to the sort that should be on rule, and I, I don't think rule should adapt to be that either. I don't think that would serve any purpose. Uh, you see, all that you would need for the rule website is. Sorry for that, Dave. Sorry, I'm going to have to mute everyone at this point because we're now running five minutes over. <laughs> so sorry about that, Dave. Um, I was trying to find a good place to break in. So um, we can carry. We've got lunch coming up at one o'clock, and we can carry on that conversation then. So for now, I need to hand over to Phil to uh, tell us all about plans for software preservation. Right, let me just get my screen share going. Thank you, Phil. That's good. Uh, excellent. Right. I was going to say good morning, but we're well into the afternoon now. Good afternoon, folks. Um, so after a morning of discussing the future of RISCOS, I'm going to drag us into the past a little bit but also talk about how we preserve that past for the future. Um, so for this, I'll go a bit uh, over a little bit about what ABUG is, uh, how it relates to uh, some of the um, forums that have been mentioned this morning, Stardot in particular, uh, what we've been up to as a team, 
what software preservation is and actually how you can help us out a little bit with this as well. So this is um, definitely a volunteer participation exercise. Um, I'm sure quite a few of you have got things scrolled in the uh, cupboard that uh, nobody else has at this point. So anyway, um, ABUG itself is um, a, a little group of, um, it's one of the user groups, it was founded by members of the Stardot forums, which I'm sure many of you will know about or um, possibly be regulars on, had in-person gatherings since 2014 and switched to online due to the um, situation this year. Uh, recently, we've had a, an absolute, um, I'm not sure how to describe it actually, uh, something of a miracle. The BBC Micro Massam Assembler, the Acorn Assembler source code turned up along with the version 1.2 uh, BBC Micro Operating System, several versions of the BBC Basic source code, DNFS, and the 6502 tube ROM. Um, and then the icing on the cake was uh, we've uh, cleaned up and made ready for release the 65 host, 65 tube emulator code and the emulator for the Acorn internal turbo 6502 second processor, which was a unreleased version of the 6502 second processor with extra RAM that was needed to build the MOS and BASIC. So this has been something that was widely thought to be lost, but thanks to uh, several people in the community, it was uncovered on an old hard disk, uh, cleaned up, we figured out how to build it and made it available to people via the forums to look at, explore, enjoy. Um, so my point with this really is we can't do this without you. Um, <clears throat> So work in progress, we've taken this work forward. Um, there are a, quite a few disparate archives of RISCOS and BBC code kicking around the internet, uh, application software, games, games seems to be the main thing, educational software. Um, the problem is everyone kind of has their own way of doing it. So we've come up with a way of organizing the files for disk images, the magazine scans, the box scans, even the labels on the floppy disk, how to organize that into a structure that makes it easy to navigate um, just in a file browser on a PC or a Linux machine or a, a RISCOS machine. Um, and we're sort of starting on the policies for what we define as complete, correct, how we keep track of what we've got, uh, on top of that, we're building a content management system so we can present what we've got online in a clear, accessible way. So you can drill down through maybe you're interested in fourth dimension games, or you're just interested in E-type, or you're interested in uh, gods, or you maybe you want to look at a software package like Specs. You want to know who made it. You want to download it, use it, how to run it on your emulator, all that information in one place in an easy to access form. Um, so part of that as well has been identifying what archives are out there, what do people have already, what's already been archived, what quality, you know, what sort of condition is it in? Is it a virus infected ADF file that's barely of use? Is it a an image that's been taken raw off a floppy disk with a tool like a, a disk ferret, a cryoflux, or a grease weasel? Is it something that we can look at closer and say maybe there's something else there? It's unmodified and go on from there. So software preservation in a nutshell is preserving the history of our platform for the future. So it's taking images of these disks, scanning the manuals for them, um, not just concentrating on games, but also on application software, because a lot of people still have data which is relevant for um, LSR talked about um, profit this morning, which is still under active development. Maybe someone has their old accounts in an old profit-free database that they need to access to uh, support a customer or to to look at what was sold, you know, old records. It still has value today. Maybe someone has an old impression document, same story. This, you know, is they're updating a new book, uh, an old book for a new new re-release, for instance. 
So the software is useful to gain access to that data. And without the software, the data is useless. Um, we also had a lot of innovative software, which in some cases predated what was available on other platforms. The example I keep going back to is Acorn Replay, um, which you, know, you, you had full motion video going on a machine with a 30 odd megahertz processor in 1994, which you know, PCs at the time could only you know, really dream of actually having that, that kind of feature. So what we want to do is image the contents of these disks and CDs that store this software. Uh, there are tools out there to do it. I've linked a few of them here. The slides, are, I'm going to leave a link on the, last, um, on the last slide so you can download these and click the links. So there's Grease Weasel, Disk Beast, which are fairly recent. They're the, kind of the top, top two recent uh, additions to the uh, tree, uh, which do raw reading of um, of floppy disks, also known as flux imaging. But also, it's important as well to get scans of the manuals, key strips, other paper materials that came with this software so people know how to use it. Um, for instance, Impression is a wonderfully powerful package, but also quite hard to use some of the more advanced features if you don't have the documentation in front of you. The easy stuff you can breeze through with the tutorials and guesswork. But when you get into actually needing the advanced features, you need the documentation. Um, so it's important to preserve that as well. Once we've got all these scans, there is a layer, um, a layer behind that, which is kind of what uh, ABUG's uh, ACOM preservation team is getting into. So this is sitting down with a copy of Photoshop or GIMP and cleaning up the scanned books, images, uh, cleaning up the paper scans of the manuals, OCRing them so you can search the text that's in there, um, checking the disk images that we've got for damage, you know, viruses, bad sectors, scratches on the media. Um, I file copy protection as a form of damage out of my own sort of personal opinions. Um, if the install credits are used up on a copy of specs, you can't install it. Uh, a lot of the Claire software did similar things. Acon Advance had a similar copy protection scheme, but locked it to the first machine it was installed on, uh, which Acon later removed. Um, if we've got disks with damage, if we have multiple reads of the same disk, we can use the multiple reads, merge them together uh, in a similar way to what the Domesday 86 project was doing with laser disks. You take um, a bad block from one and a, the next disc hopefully doesn't have an error in the same place. Merge the two images together, you have a good image that you can use to, to run the software and to convert that to something you can run under an emulator. With these being disks that people have actually used, there's going to be user information on there. There's going to be things like people's names, addresses. You obviously don't want that to go out in the public domain, so we're taking steps to vet these images before they're released in any way, shape or form to make sure we haven't accidentally, you know, going back to the example of profit, included someone's company records from, for an active company that are from a few years ago, maybe. It's really not a good thing to have out in the wild. It's, it's private data that shouldn't, you know, should be in the possession of the owner only. Um, but there is also the, the reason for reading these at a low level is, is also we found potentially interesting stuff on there. Um, some of the BBC discs from Aconsoft, if I remember correctly, that were archived, actually included pieces of the mastering software on them, not a full runnable copy, but in uh, sort of end sectors of these discs, they'd been reformatted and reused, but hadn't been completely wiped. So there's little bits of, of things on there that are quite interesting from a preservation standpoint. Um, the other thing that's interesting about me is a lot of uh, BBC software was professionally copied and mastered. So we have mastering data, things like traceback data, which includes the date of duplication. So we know how old these disks are. We have an idea of what the release date might have been. Um, you know, we convert this stuff to open formats after we've dug the, the details out of it and cleaned these images up made them ready for release, stuff that's supported by emulators, so formats that are supported by emulators. So these people can actually download these and use them and make that available to people. 
Um, so why now all of a sudden? Well, we're on borrowed time, basically. Uh, floppy disks and CDs were the primary source, uh, primary method of distribution for risk os software and BBC software. Uh, we're well past the 10 year lifetime that was expected of these disks. Some software was produced on very poor quality media that was barely readable when it was new. Um, things like mold weakening magnetic fields on these disks and being exposed to magnets. You know, the old story of uh, the secretary pinning a, uh, a floppy disk to the office fridge with a fridge magnet and wiping the, you know, the company's financial uh, year details. You know, there's a lot of stuff can happen that makes these unreadable, uh, even to issues that are normally seen on tapes, you know, sticky shed where the, um, the magnetic coating physically doesn't stick to the plastic base anymore. It needs special treatment. Um, cheap CDRs have laser rot die degrades over time. Sometimes they were mastered incorrectly to begin with, no lead out. The last couple of sectors are unreadable. Um, like I said earlier, we've got a lot of games archived thanks to the JASPP project, JASP, uh, which has also led to the development of ADFFS, which can, you know, you can use that to browse ADF images and JPD images on a RISC PC access for data, image disks. But until now, there's not really been an effort to do the same for software. People have sort of concentrated on the games for various reasons. So you know, there are easy ways to archive your software, ADFFS I've just mentioned. So you archive your, your data and your software. Um, if you want to get everything off the disk, Grease Weasel or Disk Beast are the best two at the moment. Cryoflux works too, a lot of people have those. If you only have a RISC PC or a, an Acorn Archimedes or a series machine, ADFFS, the imager, if all you want is the data and it's not a, a software disk, chances are that will get all you need from the disk. Um, but you need to be careful. Like I said on the last slide, these disks are sometimes 30 years old. Um, poor storage, poor quality media can hurt quite badly. Some of them need special treatment to get the data off, to clean you know, physical dirt off the disks. If you have something particularly rare, the best bet is often to just hop on the Stardock Discord or the forum and say, hey, I've got this, how do I archive it? We've got a lot of people who know their stuff and have the equipment to archive this. You, know, you don't have to go out and buy you know, hundreds of pounds worth of equipment to do this. There are people who can help you. Um, but also you can help us. You know, there are people out there, I don't doubt, that have got boxes in their lofts, cupboards, sheds, garages of old software that they've bought back in the day in the 90s uh, and maybe in the 80s of Arthur risk or software that may be the only copy known uh, of some of this stuff uh, or software that was so rarely distributed and there's so few copies that, again, it might be the only one. Maybe you know someone back in the old days who wrote software that has just shoved everything in a cupboard and but still has it. You know, We'd love to talk to these people and get the software, even just binary releases of software is good because you can run it. But we'd love to get hold of soft source code and especially distribution uh, agreements if people still own the copyright or if the copyright reverted back to them when, for instance, the publisher lost interest after a certain time after release or the publisher no longer exists. We'd certainly you know, love to get this on a, um, a legal positive level that we can release this stuff. Um, but also, if you've got something that isn't quite as rare, Duplicates are good too. Like I said earlier, we can put multiple disk images together, reads of different disks to recover data that at one point might have been lost. Um, we can also use it to spot mistakes or high score changes in disks. You know, it's all really good stuff. Um, and you know, it's preserving the past for the future is a big thing here. There's Doomsday is the big example that I keep coming back to as well, because 
there is still interest in that. It was produced in 1986 by the BBC. P people who contributed to it to this day have not seen what they uh, their contribution amounted to. Um, and it's just getting that back. Um, <laughs> yeah, Dave Rook has just pointed in the um, the comments. Claire's basic software was protected from modification by naming every variable and function Claire's micro supplies with different cases for each letter. Yeah, stuff like that is a nightmare to to deal with. But once the software is is archived, you know you, you've got and then you're freed from the time constraint. Um, you can then look at this almost at leisure and it can be multiple people working on this um so that's all i really had to say it's really just an encouragement to the community to step in and help us out here you know just tell us what you've got uh make yourselves known if you know you know maybe your next door neighbor um worked for um claire's back in the day or aconsoft and has some stuff shoved on an old risk pc you know let us know put them in touch um and we'll uh we can make the, the release happen we can figure out what it is and what state it's in and make it work again and and you know share it with the community share the history um so i'm going to open up for questions now uh, in the last is that eight minutes i've got left all right thanks for that phil yeah, um, I think the first question is probably in the chat as someone said, is there some sort of index of what you've already got? We have a spreadsheet of what we've already got. And unfortunately, I couldn't find the blasted link. It is on the Stardot forums in the Disk Beast thread, I believe. Um, and that is a list of what's been archived by the Disk Beast team. So that's predominantly BBC software, I believe. Uh, my own collection i am ashamed to say is in boxes and isn't in any form of order or archive that's slowly changing i suspect a lot of people will be in a similar boat that they have stuff in the closet they just don't know what they have and it's just going to amount to you know and tell us what you've got we'll tell you if we've already got it um quick question if i may yep um, I've just, I've just joined the Discord, which I think is a really good idea um, to have um, a project like this so we can download old software for old machines. Yep. But just looking around, you may need to kind of, uh, this might be a really basic question that everybody knows that I should know the answer to, so I'm sorry, so, sorry about this. But just looking around, you've just um, like listed 8-bit and 32-bit, but isn't like RISCOS 3.1 up like 26-bit? So why is it not a 26 bit um, section anywhere? Because for the purposes of RISCOS, it's uh, at least as far as we're doing it, it's largely the same thing. The, you're right, the 26 bit software is what we're mainly concentrating on, but that's primarily, if it's been converted to 32 bit, it's probably still for sale somewhere. So the 26 bit, 32 bit distinction is important to an extent but not so much for archiving we'd rather get everything archived first but so, but sorry that, that maybe i've missed your is, point it, there yeah sorry as far as archives concerned and 20 if if 26 bit is for risk offs 3.1 and up how how would you download and archive that if you've only got two sections of 8 bit i presume is is um is bbc and 32 bit is a new stuff how would you archive Discuss 3.1 stuff and higher anyway. If you've only got the forum is concerned, 32 bit applies to the um the 26 bit machines as well, just post oh. on the 32 bit forums. Oh, okay. So don't sorry make the that. distinction. 32 bit is Archimedes, 8 bit is BBC. And oh, sorry uh, about that. I, um, I, I, yeah. I thought I thought Riscos um um 3.1 and up was was 32 bit and then all the new stuff um was 16 um 26 bit. And all the new stuff was 32-bit. Sorry. 26-bit is the weirdness of the program counter register on the earlier ARM chips because uh, okay. they carved off several bits for use for status flags. That's where 26-bit comes from. Oh, so, sorry. Shouldn't I have asked this question? Was it a stupid question? <laughs> no, it's uh, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. 
Right, turns okay. out to be right. important. Appreciate that. Thank you, mate. There Thank you. Uh, legal. Bill. Okay. Bill, you mentioned uh, manual. It's uh, not manuals. Uh, tutorials. Yep. Uh, I presume you've got uh, or sorted out access for all the archives for the magazines, in which there are plenty of tutorials. Uh, and what you will be missing is permission to use them. If for Acon user, Acon publisher, and Quercus, uh, there are permissions for times when I was editing it, then you have permission. That goes right. to everybody else uh, to use appropriately. Um, I would appreciate it if you'd be so gracious as to drop that in an email that we can, uh, or on the forums, then. Yeah, you need it in writing, so this way. of course, uh, for, for copyright. Uh, but uh, I have obviously I haven't got copyright to the whole lot, but any bits I do have copyright for, then anybody who's making proper use of it like this has just needs to ask and they've got uh, access to it. The Thank you very, very much for that, John. I'm sure people will uh, will really appreciate that because there's an absolute mountain of stuff that was published uh, in Quercus and Acorn Publisher. Was a, there was a series in, Aco, in uh, BBC Acorn User, or Acorn, no, Acorn User, uh, about uh, incorporating machine, uh, not machine code, uh, assembler uh, with uh, BBC Basic. Uh, and I started uh, to uh, bring that up to date in uh, Quercus, uh, that re uh, update certainly uh, anybody's got access to. But if anybody wants to continue that series, it might be a good idea. Someone was asking for the link for the Discord, so I'm going to just pop that slide. Oh, I've got my screen share turned off. If you bear with me a second, I'll grab that and drop that in the chat. Save you digging the forums for that. Yeah, so thanks a lot for that, John. I'm just going to dip into one of the questions in the chat here. Uh, I love the idea of software preservation. My concern is more on the legal reuse with or without modernization and legal distribution of old titles. So this is a perfect follow-on from what you've just said, John. Um, so our plans here are to make contact with the previous developers of these packages, the publishers of these packages, find out what the legal situation is, if they've still got copies of the contracts they've signed, that's ideal. Um, find out who owns the rights and get permission. We absolutely don't want to step on companies like LSR that are 32-bitting these applications and re-releasing them uh, for something like, for instance, font directory or profit, we would much rather say, you know, we've archived profit two, three, we've got the manuals scanned if anyone, you know, has a faulty disc and can prove that they're the legal owner of that disc, you know, we'll help them out, get access to their stuff. But the easier way is if you've got a risk PC, you can buy this here. You know, support the um, the market as we can. And copyright has to be transferred in writing. Yeah, that's why I'm saying contracts. Yeah. <laughs> if it's in, if we've got it in writing and we can track the trail, that's the ideal. Yeah. Here's a challenge then. If I send you my copy of Sibelius, can you remove the protection? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> don't know. Haven't tried. <laughs> I understand that CJE have possibly managed it, but uh, it's a rumor. Oh, it may not be CJE. It might have been someone else. Well, I know our comp can do a version of it. But, Sorry, uh, yes, yeah, not CJE. Our comp. Yeah. I mean, that was seven, 700 quid when I bought it. Mm. And it's, yeah. it's, it's basically useless now on anything other than a wrist PC. Mm. The, the difficulty is that um, 
every yeah some of the copy uh, copy protection schemes are downright nasty um and the, the the issue the reason i count them as damage is because often the only reason things won't work on a risk pc is because of the software the copy protection schemes uh and once you do remove that i've i've seen quite a lot of software that i've personally knocked the copy protection off of and oh suddenly it works on everything it's mm. um, a little bit of a, a disappointing situation, really. But it's okay. not one that's really changed over the years. I mean, you've got current software. Photoshop CS2 and 3 recently, they turned the activation servers off and you can't run CS2 or 3 anymore. It's a is pain. It, it only hurts legal customers. Is, it, is, is anybody allowed to chip in now? Or, or, um, because um, you I just can't. had a thought about that. Probably when yeah. copy protection was around, it was during when the, the, the acorns were around and people were buying stuff like that. They probably never thought it would last this long. And people, oh, had, yeah, like, like now we want to be using the software. So back then, the copy protection wasn't an issue, was it? Because you have people that you could buy the software from and have the de- talk with the dealers. But now that's not there now, is it? Because we're talking 20, 20 odd years past the original date, aren't we? You know, yeah. But also the the copy protection is another reason why it's good to get in touch with the original developers and get hold of the source code because with the source code, largely, you know, maybe the copy protection was a wrapper around the software and you just build it and it goes away. Or with the source code, everything becomes kind of every issue becomes kind of shallow in a way as you just sort of dig through it and you can see the comments, if any. Um, but certainly things like SWI names tend to remain in there and it's just a case of finding the bit that does for copy protection and looking for any calls to that bit and getting rid of it or making it return always okay system normal nothing to see here in terms of um, hardware to uh sort of preserve the discs is there i mean you mentioned some of those those projects which i just had a quick look on now is there anything um any hardware that we can actually just buy if we wanted to sort of run through bits and pieces ourselves grease weasel um that's kia fraser's project so a couple of years ago i did a magnetic disc reader project uh, was, uh, the, the term for miss flux imager it literally reads the individual magnetic transition changes so from north south to south north and back. and from that you have everything that's on the disc so um i don't really sell them anymore but the spiritual successor in a way is grease weasel which uses one of these really cheap microcontroller development boards and you just wire it to a floppy disk and away you go a floppy drive sorry okay. um so that's probably the easiest way in these days uh cryoflux was something a little bit earlier but hasn't really seen much development um in in the interim the stream format it spits out is known Uh, it can be used as a a a baseline for analysis if you've got one it's fine i wouldn't go and buy one for the lack of support really grease weasel is all open source uh if you're looking at bbc micro the disc beast is worth a look as well but it's not going to be any use to you at the moment, I'll emphasize, uh, for Archimedes discs. Um, but the, I'll go back to my previous point briefly as well. If you've got something that might be particularly rare, um, just make yourself known on the Discord uh, and let someone know what you have because some of these discs have picked up mold and things from bad storage you put them in a drive it will ruin the disc and the drive so i do there are sort of cleaning procedures that we can clue you in on um if you've had some that have been badly stored so you can you've got the best chance of getting the data back thanks cheers yes that goes back slightly to that earlier question about is there a list of what's already exists because then people could find out whether what they've got is rare or wanted or not. Best way at the moment is to just say what you've got, make a list and say what you've got. The, again, it's 
I don't want people to kind of come away from this and think we're only interested in the rare stuff. I said duplicates earlier. Mm. You know, if we've got a bad copy of, for instance, Genesis, which is, yeah, that's actually an example where we've got a partial image of that. Um, someone turns up with another copy of Genesis that was stored a little bit better. We've got a few more tracks of that disk image. We can just merge them together and we've got, you know, maybe from three or four discs, we've got a perfect image. Can I can I ask you a quick question, do you mind? Go ahead. If if you've got software that you uh, um you might be interested in, say um old stuff, and you've got discs, but you don't want to image them, but it's like software that I don't want. Have you got like a postal address I could send stuff to you if you're if you're interested? If I say I've got this, you could have the discs, for instance, because I don't, I don't want them kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of my collection actually came from that means and the Wakefield Show Charity uh, stand. <laughs> no, no, so no, if no. you're if you're willing to donate, make yourself known. Drop me an email on the uh, okay. yeah. Uh, it should be on the visible. Yeah, because no, slide. Did you mind? or the Discord. I didn't know if I ha I think I've thrown it away now, but I don't know if I had that something like that on a disc. But but it wasn't of any interest to me, so I just. Throw it away. Just that that name rang a bell, but it might have been some other software. I'm not sure, but I'll, yeah. I'll bear it in mind next time because I um I could go to charity um um well not not I, I shouldn't say I can go to charity stores and pick stuff up and then not want it. But I mean, if I get stuff in the future yeah. that that I that is no use to me, but you might be interested in, I'll let you know, shall I? Yeah, absolutely. And if you uh, I'm sure there are people here listening that organised the uh, computer shows. Um, I rem I who must have been many years ago. There was some discussion about what one of the show charity stands would accept. And if you know, if someone's got like a box of software that you don't want to accept for the charity, I'm quite happy to uh, pay the postage and um, exchange that box of discs for a. Uh, uh, a charity donation and you know we can sit down and agree on the amounts i'm more than happy to uh to support good causes cool. all right cool thanks well that's, that's something for next year's show i think with the charity well, stand <laughs> yeah if people are, are still you know digging through their cupboards and offering stuff to shows and you can't accept it by all means get in touch with us if i can't take it on there will be someone in the preservation team on star dot that has the space for them and the equipment to uh, uh, to archive this stuff. Um, yeah. Thank you very thank you very much, Phil. Problem. I think we'll, we'll have to wrap that up there so that people Thanks for having me. Lunch. Um, can, can I just stay open? Just for a quick question. Lunch. Well, I'm going to I say I'm going to leave it for leave it open for lunch now, so you can carry on chatting. <laughs> so. I'll hang around for a little while. I'm getting me curry. Chat. Um, people may see Chris Evans, CJ has just posted in the chat. He's got some news as well that people might want to look at while they're having their sandwich or whatever. Other than that, got... um, I'm, going to, I'm going to take a quick break myself now and uh, we'll be back at half one for risk cost developments. Thanks. Uh, Phil? Yeah. Quick question. Uh, for the preservation project, are you guys also trying to contact the old hardware companies? Because I, I really wish to know how the HS, uh, CCS uh, cards worked. You know, the multi, uh, multi card expansion. Oh, the Ultima. Yeah. Um, right. Ooh. Andy Armstrong would probably know. Um, I have his email address. Um, but it, for hardware, again, post on the forums. Um, ROM images are very useful for those because uh, EEPROMs, the data on them degrades over time. Again, you can mix and match images yeah, so, from multiple to fix some. Right. So I, I fixed recently... An, uh, it's not software uh, only. We're yeah. interested in hardware too. an HCCS that uh, was completely broken. Now it's working fantastically. Hmm. And thanks to CJE for uh, finding that part and finding the replacement ROM uh, with the latest version that allowed me actually to use even the MIDI and sound sampling on a Mi 3010. Um, and there are, by just playing and hacking the card, I also noticed that we could actually use it to create an EEPROM expansion for the yeah. 3010 and the 3020 where there's still modules, like for the risk cost uh, 320 project and all this stuff those cuts could actually help there 
without yeah. any, you know, crazy um, hassle for the user to solder stuff and replace things. So if we could... It's actually a, a way, just to interject briefly, to tack the uh, modules onto the end of the RISCOS ROMs as a thread I started on Stardot on how to do that. You need a four megabyte EEPROM or a pair of EEPROMs. Yeah. And you just, it will scan for um, extension ROMs at the end of the RISCOS ROM. Yeah. So you just put it right at the end and it'll load it. Yeah, yeah, I know. I noticed that. So um, I think if we could preserve that those type of cards and even, you know, run a kickstart or something to start to reproduce using them, because there, there are a lot of uh, 3010 and 3020 that would benefit. Mm. From them. They're still being sold on, on eBay. And so I, I believe that people would, would like that. Yeah, it's same. Um, I've personally reverse engineered the Castle IDE card for the 3010 uh, with the intent of running ZIDFS on it. So my 3010 has that card um, and it's running ZIDFS with, with thanks to, um, I'll remember his name. I can never say his name. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, I can remember the website address, but I can never, someone can jump in and, and tell me. <laughs> John Cortink, thank you. Um, so yeah, um, I sat down and reverse engineered that, uh, reverse engineering is a pretty long job, but imaging the ROMs is pretty easy. If you've got the equipment getting, uh, photos of these cards and, you know, you can sometimes reverse engineer them from software, just pull the, the modules apart. Did that with the HCCS IDE card, figured out how the, uh, user port and analog port works on it. It's off spike calls, spoiler. But yeah, it's lovely to get the hardware archived as well. Stuff like the IC, uh, ICS interfaces we need for software to configure them, need the manuals to tell you how to configure them and set them up. And also the hardware, even if they won't work with current compact flashcards, chances are there are other IDFSs we can you know, modify to work with them. The HCCS works brilliantly with 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 the uh, Compa Flash and the yeah. uh, thirty ten model. Mine now has hard drive, has MIDI port, has sound sampling, and supports SCSI. It, it's fantastic. It's an incredible device. Mm. Um, we definitely should should do something to preserve that device, especially as I said for all those uh, users of thirty uh, tens and thirty twenty. But there was also a model for the A five thousand. Um, so for the regular, you know, big box uh, Archimedes, which uh, potentially we could modify and also adapt for the for the 310. Mm. I mean, in order to create some some kind of some sort of expansion device that will allow extra EEPROM for extra modules and you know have IDE and all the stuff. Um, I don't know, just as an idea. Yeah, yeah, it's a good idea. Um... There's, there are a lot of cards that you could do a modern version of with modern components. Uh, SCSI is certainly doable. The standards are open. You may not be able to get like an Emulex SCSI controller chip anymore, but you can probably do it on a, a Gator A chip with a bit of effort. Um, Ethernet is definitely doable. I'm in the process of doing a mini module for that and an Acorn A4. Um, for expansion port Ethernet. Um, as you say, it's finding out what's being done, getting the software. The software is usually the hard part. Uh, Phil? The, um, just to finish that off, the H, no, not HCC, let's try again. Uh, Stuart Turrell slash uh, Simtech Unipod actually has an expansion port on it, but I don't think data on that has ever been released. I would love it if Simtech or um, ST Devel actually released the pin out and the spec for that because it looks like it's an Ethernet uh, interface. It would be brilliant for adding things onto Unipods. Have we spoken to Matt Edgar? Um, I've got his email address, but uh, he's the last email I sent to him was uh, that he replied to. It took six months for a reply. The second one where I asked about this, he never replied. Uh, it, it, yeah, and Matt is a bit. Um, rather deep. Yeah, it's. Um, I think my question on what the, how you wire a uh, hard drive LED up to a Unipod was a very easy one, and um, what's the expansion interface like? 
Uh, I remember asking back in the day when I just got the card and the answer was, that's proprietary. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if the answer's changed. Uh, Phil, um, is there any centralized mechanism for uh, contacting original authors of software to see if they're willing to either release the source code or update it to 32-bit. Because it seems that if individuals contact the software authors, the software authors are not particularly bothered because it's oh, it just one person. It's a lot of effort. It's not worth it. But if we had some method of working out how many people were interested in something being updated or 32-bitted, then the software authors might be more encouraged to release their software or update it. I mean, I've not noticed that problem in the ones I've spoken to. Um, certainly, um, a, a f quite a few years ago, I spoke to Merlin Klein about Clearview, and that's how that became open source. Um, and he was very positive about it. He was the, the usual reaction is surprise. I'm stunned that people still use these machines. I've still got mine. Wow, people are interested in what I did. I'll I'll dig it out. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't have a lot of spare time, but I'll dig it out when I've got some. Um, I've very. I don't think I've encountered anyone yet who's just said, "Oh, I'm not interested. I'm not going to bother. Nobody cares about this." Well, I've I've contacted one or two people who said, oh, uh, well, we could do it, but, um, you know, there's no money in it and we're too busy. So, you know, go away, basically. That sounds like an answer more from a company than an individual. It, well, there may be companies which are single individuals, but. Well, yeah, with a company, you have to think of the business angle and it's do you spend you know, however many pounds an hour of developer time costs times potentially weeks plus the distribution costs. But if they're willing to hand, uh, if they want to maintain copyright on the thing and hand a license to, uh, for instance, a, a non-profit use license, like a Creative Commons license for, to the company, uh, to the community, to maintain it, I'm sure there are people out there like me who are just as <laughs> mad enough to take on a task like 32-bit in Clearview. Um, and, yeah. you know. Yes, I, I, I'm just thinking that if there were a centralised method of approach where you had some idea of how many people were interested in doing this, then it might make it a bit more either interesting or worthwhile for the person being contacted or at least there'd be a standardized method of saying this is the license we could offer this is how we could protect it this is who would be looking after the software etc rather than just feeling it's going to someone they've never heard of who might you know do anything with it yeah yeah it, um it sounds a little bit along the lines of the rural bounties kind of system, actually putting a number on how many people are interested in it, which could be useful in that regard. But it relies on people actually logging in and you know saying, oh, I'd, I'd like Sibelius, or I'd like, oh, Sibelius is a no-hoper with Avid owning it at this point. Um, you know, I, I'd like Impression to be updated, or I'd like this to be updated, or that to be updated. Yes. Well, I mean, there are several examples. Uh, for example, SharpEye has been updated to 32-bit, but it's not the latest version of SharpEye. Um, mm. The um, ProSound, uh, uh, Pedersen's software, is very good. It's been 32-bitted, but when it was 32-bitted, a lot of the functions were taken out because presumably it took too much time to convert them. So mm. now the new version on 32-bits is actually not as useful as the 26-bit version, but it's fast. This is why I'd encourage authors to release their source code because the bits they don't want to do, someone will say, someone well, this might. audio filter is missing and I want it, so I'll 32-bit yes. it. Yes. Well, exactly. I mean, things like filters were cut out and then the undo function and things like that, which <laughs> are extremely useful. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, once you've had undo, you don't want to go without it. <laughs> <laughs> to air is human. <laughs> yes, indeed. The, the trouble with Sibelius is that there is a now a PC version, a Windows version. So if we develop the RISCOS version, that would seem seen as a rival. Now that may happen with other forms of software where there are sort of rival versions, and the people who did the RISCOS one might not want to get that back into circulation, as it were. Mm, that's a fair point. Um, but I don't think that applies to the majority of RISCOS software. I mean, well, the probably big... only a handful. Yeah, it's it's going to be things like Profit. It's going to be things like Impression, which is Impression X these days, Tech Writer, Artworks. And I'm not going to begrudge Martin Werfner his, um, you know, his uh, few coins every now and again. You know, he does fantastic work on the stuff he works on. Uh, and he's a, an absolutely wonderful guy to talk to, having spoken to him at a show. So, you know, um, it's, the target really is the stuff that, has fallen by the wayside and hasn't been updated and has no real successor. Um, I would love, absolutely love, to see the stuff that uh, David Holden, APDL, took mm -hmm. on in the latter years. The Claire's stuff, the, um, I mean, the ISV stuff is out there, but a lot of the Claire's stuff is behind the password wall. Um, there was a master file I have an incomplete copy of the CDs bad. Um, there was a lot of stuff that APDL had the rights to at the end that seemingly passed on to someone else and they've lost interest. Um, and I would love for them to just sort of come out and say, look, I'm not interested in this anymore. I don't have the time to do it. Can you help us out? We'd be happy to do so. If that's the situation, I'm assuming that's the situation. There's, there's not a lot out there to go on. This is again the community will help out if the community can. The problem, they, hello. hello. I can actually answer that question just a little bit. I, I did to, I take a message for. Oh, oh, okay. We've got three or four at once. Can I, Sorry. Can I uh, moderate and say Andrew Ronsley first, please? Hi. Yeah, I did actually talk briefly to Aaron about that, I think last year. Uh, right. Might be wrong on the exact timing, but it sort of we were talking around various subjects. A lot of the problem there is sort of promises made to people that Aaron feels honour bound to uh, to preserve, even if they were made a long, long time ago. Um, and that's also stymieing some of the uh, risk of adjust and risk of six stuff. Uh, if people were, you know, had had views that were sort of protective and, and, and private, um, sort of 12, let's say fifteen years ago then Aaron still feels that he wants to honour the promise. And I can understand that because it's, yeah. you know, there is a matter of honour and what have you. And it's not, these in this modern era, you don't often people find people, you know, honouring things like that. But equally, it's not, not good for software preservation, is it? No, um, I mean, he does. Uh, I'm sure I've, I think we've exchanged emails and he did strike me as a man of his word. Um, I think perhaps the question there is to if if possible go back to these people and um and you know discuss whether that is still the situation 15 years on or if they're not around you know perhaps talk to their families and see whether they you know how would you feel about us preserving the legacy of whomever this might have been yeah it's it's a, it's, a, it's a tough one for sure mm. especially when the people are involved are dead yeah, uh, and the fat and immediate family dead too. Um, but anyway, mm. in that case, I would you know probably go an, an extra layer down the family tree if possible. Yeah, that's why that's... we need heroes like yourself <laughs> 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 digging into the preservation. Yeah, um, even if it's not releasable, um, even just having information of who holds, for instance, the hard drives with the source code on. Um, and having multiple copies of that, knowing that it's not under, um, that if one more, uh, reducing the bus factor, basically, if one person dies, it's not lost to the world. Yeah. And maybe we end up in a situation like the National Archives are in, where things are held private until 50 or 70 years after the death of the last person involved. Yeah. That could, it's a long time, but 
it's better than nothing. I think a lot of people would even accept to sort of 10 years in the computing world, but yeah. I agree. Very interestingly, talking about Dave Holden, there was on the archive online uh, mailing list, people were asking about Sleuth, the OCR reader. And some people say it's been 32-bitted uh, and nobody knows which copy they've got and so on. And uh, people would, I think, like to download an updated version, but um, it's by yeah. ProAction Software, and that's not listed on the APDL legacy site. So who they were, I have no idea. ProAction was... David one of the other Davids, wasn't it? David Bradforth. He did. He be pro action, yeah. He, he did largely sign up with it with APDL towards the end. Um, he mm. his early oh. stuff was with us, but when I when I was at Risk uh, Limited, that's a long time ago, um, I didn't have the time to deal with his stuff. So he uh, his latter stuff came out through APDL. Mm. Who was that again? With David? David Bradforth. All right. B R A D F O R T H. He does resurface occasionally uh, with the odd project mm. here and there, although I don't know whether they come all come to fruition. Mm. Again, this is a community involvement side. The community will help where it can. Mm. Um, so I'm going to go on that. The thing about the APDL stuff in particular from an archiving perspective is I get the impression from the discs that I have in my collection that they weren't mastered in any kind of professional manner. Uh, and I mean that in the context of uh, not to, to, um, to take a swing at David, um, but to for instance, in a professional situation, you would create an ISO image of a CD and every CD would be largely the same. Um, whereas the impression I get from the APDL ones is that they were largely recorded by dragging the files into um, CD record and hit and go. So they're quite difficult to analyze from any perspective other than files on a disk, but it does mean that some of having multiple copies is very useful because some of them will have the application files at the end of the disk and be unreadable because the disks have, have failed over time. Others will have the application at the beginning and the tutorials at the end. You combine the two and you get a working disk. Um, the, he's kind of done us a favor um, in, in not doing it the, the pro way because his CD recording software had a bug. That means there's no lead out section. So the last bit of the disk is unreadable. I guess, I assume other than in the drive he was using at the time. Um, so you, it's little things like that. Um, I'm sure I saw John Cartmel speak up a second ago. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I mean, one example of those that I think have gone from Claire's would be uh, Artisan Pro, uh, Pro Artisan. Uh, which, if I've got the right name, is the uh, the one produced by John Warmson and Frank Dart. Now, John's died uh, since then, uh, but I know his daughter uh, was around, and I think he was on, on on that group was asking about various things. Uh, so would be approachable. As far as I'm aware, Frank's still around, uh, and maybe somebody needs to get in touch and say, "Hey." Can we have what you, you have, even if we can't release it? Can we have it for archiving? Yeah. Well, this is some of the stuff we're doing with um, the preservation group with the, um, I don't remember, uh, APG, was it? <laughs> it's in Disco, APT, sorry. Um, if we've got something, we have some things archived that we can't legally release. However, we have them spread around several people and we're happy to make agreements to hold things for people mm -hmm. provided that we know what the situation is even if it's put these on your hard drive and keep them for for indefinite you know just so it's not lost if it's in 10 years you can release this if it's you need to talk to the family members of this person who's died and you know if we 
you know, it's something to work from. If we can say to the family members, look, yeah. we've been given this by a colleague of your uncle, your father. Can you, you know, what, what is the family's opinion on this? Can we take this further? Or someone, we have the data, someone knows the family and, you know, sort of can liaise or put us in touch. They're all positions we can work from. And uh, it's now 13.31 and I'm not going to talk over the next talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for noticing without me saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> well thanks thanks for that phil you, you more, than, more than filled your time and i think hopefully it gets everyone thinking about what to do with their mm. preservation and get them rummaging in their drawers for what they forgot please your pardon <laughs> <laughs> and on that note we now have well kind of back-to-back -back presentations because andrew ornsley is going to be talking about risk cost developments first and i think that's kind of going to run into our comp and then there'll be a combined q a at the end i think is the plan so, well i had a bit of a rethink on that <laughs> um and um on the advice of my good lady uh we'll try and do q a on risk cost developments that probably sort of effectively what would be the beginning of the of the our comp talk um rather it's a long time for people to wait to have to sit through an hour of me monologuing to, <laughs> to get to q a I think there will be quite a few Q&A questions in, at the end of Risk Us Direct. So let's, going, let's get going. Um, can you do the honours, Brian? You should be good to go, I think. You should be able to share. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing myself full screen yet. but Yeah, you are on, you are on screen now. Uh, can people hear me? Yes. 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 Good, good. Right. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Ronsley, for those who aren't familiar with me. Um, I'm a partner uh, in uh, Risk Cost Developments, which is the company that was founded initially to develop uh, a brand new web browsing solution for Risk OS, but has subsequently gone on to become the home of the Risk OS IP following the collapse of Castle a few years back. Without further ado, I'm going to concentrate right from the beginning on the new web browser and um, we'll then progress through risk loss developments activities and take a Q&A at the end. It's going to be quite packed, so without further ado, I will share my screen and begin demonstrating the new Iris web browser. All being well, you should be seeing my desktop now. Yep, looks good. Yes. Great stuff. So, um, the primary web browser that we will be releasing uh, is presently known as Iris. Uh, we have actually developed two web, web browser products uh, behind the scenes, one called OWB and one called Iris. Uh, but right now, Iris is looking to be the most promising of the projects, and that's the one that we are promoting first and foremost. Iris is based on uh, the WebKit engine, which also powers things like Apple Safari um, and was also the basis for Chrome, which even Microsoft and now uh, made uh, their browser engine. Admittedly, Google have sort of split their code off a little bit, so it gets a bit muddy, but um, WebKit DNA is all over the modern, uh, modern web. By basing the browser on that technology, we ensure a level of compatibility um, and uh, future proofing that no standalone web browser would be able to achieve. Without further ado, I will load the latest build of iris in fact that's not actually technically correct this is actually a slightly updated version of the august build the october build is somewhat work in progress as there have been some fairly major changes behind the scenes uh, and for demonstration purposes uh, this october uh, this august build is actually a nicer version uh, this has been made available to all of the risk cost developments uh, investors and it is my hope that uh, before christmas this will be in the hands of everybody who supported our O-Browser initiative 
uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, I hope it could be even sooner than that. Uh, I, we were just concentrating on get, making sure everything was uh, as stable as possible. Um, so you can see here it displays the RISCOS open site. Performance will be dictated somewhat by the speed of my broadband connection. So um, what I will do is just open NetServe so that you can sort of see the scrolling speeds in comparison and then you'll be able to judge what's iris and what's the um, what's the limit of the broadband zoom connection so if we go to the same website in netsurf and we scroll up and down in netsurf and then we do the same thing in iris um, Go to the forums. We have actually changed the scroll step in Iris in the latest build because it is actually jumping quite a lot in this build, whereas we've made it slightly smoother in the new one. But hopefully that gives you some idea of the smoothness of the of the scroll versus the connection. If we look at these pages uh, straight away, even on a simple site like uh, RISCOS Open, you can see the, uh, the quality of rendering in Iris is excellent compared to what we're seeing here on NetSurf. Uh, I'm not trying to rubbish NetSurf at all, by the way. NetSurf is a fantastic piece of software that's got us through a lot of very lean years. Uh, but also I think we need to see the advantages that come with something like Iris. You can immediately see that things like uh, image rollovers are working as I highlight things in the page. Uh, this is done with JavaScript and style sheets. Uh, these things just simply do not happen when I try and do the same thing in NetSurf. Of course, a website like RISCOS Open isn't really what you're all interested in seeing. You, uh, we need bigger, more complicated sites. So, without further ado, um, let us try the good old BBC website. While that works away, I will bring up the same site in NetSurf, which gives you a comparison of why something like this is needed. You can see that NetSurf does, well, not a bad job at all, to be honest with you. It's actually looking a lot better than uh, I remember it doing. But you can also see that it's not right. You compare that to the Iris version. These images fade in with JavaScript as the, as the page scrolls. And you can see that Iris gets it all correct. Beyond that, um, we can look at online shopping sites like Argos. Again, if we compare it to what went before and what we see in Iris. It's quite a difference. You can see JavaScript features like pull down menus working perfectly in Iris. Um, and a fully interactive website is achieved. Many people will want to know about banking. Um, we use Lloyd's Bank. I'm not about to log into the uh, bank account for obvious reasons. Uh, but if we look at Lloyd's, you'll see that that comes up and works quite happily, just as you'd expect. The browser has a number of quality of life features present. Um, you saw me using a hot list. Uh, we also have a history list. Uh, we can clear selections or jump back to pages. 
and we can open in new tabs. We'll close the tabs. It also supports local HTML files, uh, so we can access files on our local drive, and also uh, supports RISCOS protocols, like being able to click on links on emails uh, uh, and in other programs. You can also download files. Um, I don't actually have a demonstration of that, but suffice to say that it opens a save box um, and downloads in exactly the way you would imagine on RISC OS. Uh, and a final demo site I will do will be Amazon, because, well, in COVID times, I think we've probably all been uh, here. Again, you see it looking correct. Uh, we can access menus and so on. Um, I won't show the compare and contrast on that one because I think you all know what will happen. Um, suffice to say that Iris is offering a major step forward in RISC-OS web browsing. Um, and you can see it running at quite a respectable performance level. It still will be nice to go faster, but I think most people would agree that this is eminently usable. At this point, I will now move on from Iris. Uh, obviously, questions at the end, please, uh, rather than doing extensive demoing, because we only have a short time for the talk. Next up, we have Pinboard 2.0, which is a new project that we've been developing this summer uh, based on feedback from our RiscOS Direct initiative to encourage new users to use RiscOS. One of the areas that was identified as uh, being perhaps an ob obstacle for new users was the RiscOS save system, where you have to drag and drop a save file into a file or window. Quite often, there isn't a file or window available for people to drag to. Uh, and many new users are used to the pinboard being an interactive space on other platforms where you can save work and uh, use it like a, a filer. This spurred us on to investigate the pinboard as an area of risk loss that has been neglected for quite some time. And so this summer we have been testing both in public and behind the scenes a new version of the pinboard known as pinboard 2.0. It has quite a range of features. At, uh, at the most basic, yes, we can take an edit file and we can save the text file to the pinboard. You'll notice that this text file has a regular filer icon, just like a filer icon would in a filer window. Compare that to the icons for the applications, which are in fact shortcuts to those applications, as they always have been in the pinboard, a somewhat unique feature of pinboard compared to the rest of RISCOS. You'll see that those items now have pins in them, indicating that they are pinned programs uh, rather than actually existing as files on the disk. The location that stores the files is completely configurable via the uh, configure plugin. If we take a quick look at that, um, the plugin is designed to accommodate both uh, old and new pin boards, although this build is focusing on the new pin board. Uh, the idea is that the new pin board can be configured to be completely seamlessly uh, equivalent to the old pin board for those of you who, uh, who don't care for the new features, but you can turn as much or as little of the new functionality on as you wish. It was very important to us that code be built to the same quality as the existing pin board and to meet rules uh, programming requirements for inclusion in the OS. Uh, that also meant that we also wanted to conform, conform to the necessary style guide and uh, user interface expectations of users wherever possible. Um, and we know that not every user wants every new feature. So we've tried to accommodate that in the design of the new pin board. You can see here in the setup tool, um, we can choose the pinboard directory. At the moment, it's in boot choices, uh, but you can store it elsewhere. The files that are saved to the pinboard can, in fact, 
be viewed as a regular file or window directly from the pinboard menu. It is also completely dynamic. If I now delete this file from the pinboard from the filer, it disappears also from the pinboard. If it goes into a recycle bin, uh, such as delegate or um, the one which I can't remember by Fred Grout, um, then uh, those uh, that the file will disappear into the recycle bin and can be recovered from the recycle bin. Similarly, we can place a file in here if we wish um, into the filer window. If uh, we take a document such as this disclaimer and place it in, you will note that it's appeared on the pin board. It defaults to the top left because uh, it doesn't have a better place to put it initially, but once we've placed it somewhere and saved, then it will be used in that location in future. If we delete it from the pin board, you will notice that it has full file uh, menu structure that has been designed to match the file structure that you would expect to see uh, with an ordinary file window. Again, if we delete it from there, you can see it's disappeared from the pin board window. There are a range of other features that have been introduced in the new pin board. For example, um, at the top left here, we have uh, what is known as a watermark. The meaning of the watermark will be made clear in the RCOMP talk, but for now, suffice to say that that is an introduction of a draw file element into the desktop. This is the first in inclusion of uh, vector graphics into the RISC-OS user experience that uh, I'm aware of, uh, and is significant uh, because it is screen mode, by being vector graphics, it is screen mode independent and overlaid upon uh, whatever bitmap background you're already displaying. So in this case, we have the stock risk OS Direct uh, wallpaper, and then this Forte logo uh, is in fact a draw file that is being watermarked on the top. With the watermark facility, we can choose where on the screen it appears and any offset from the edge of the screen. Another key feature is that of stickies. You'll see here that I have a list of things to talk about during the talk. Uh, it appears on the screen. We can have as many stickies as we like. We can start a new sticky um, or we can delete the sticky. For the sticky itself, uh, we can set a title. You can see I've got this set as a reminder. Uh, you can also uh, change the font. I have a personal preference for Sassoon, which gives a slightly handwritten look to the sticky. And we can change the colors. Uh, to match the desktop, we might choose a more sort of bluish background. The new pin board can be set to save automatically on shutdown so that you don't have to remember to manually save your changes to the pin board. But we also know that could be controversial. So again, it is configurable. Um, stickies are also normally saved there, but there is a save option on the menu if you want to be doubly sure that your stickies are indeed saved. Another aspect is the text. You'll notice that there is no background uh, behind the text under the icons. Um, we have used font blending for icon text. We've actually introduced several types of blending and background. You can have the standard text appearance, which has a fixed background color behind the text, the flaunt blending, which will blend the text into the backdrop of your choice. And finally, an outline text option, which you can see being used. Well, actually, I think that's not, not the final version of it, but it's not looking fantastic but in the corner of the screen there. Uh, the font blending is basically used to allow uh, similar colors to appear on similar colored backgrounds, much like Windows uses edged text um, for, for example, white text on a fairly pale or white background um, on a modern Windows desktop. We also support variable icon sizes. So you can have small icons, normal icons, or large icons. Uh, interestingly, the large icons will make use of the Sprites 11 files that come with the operating system and with many applications to provide higher quality artwork. So when using larger icons, don't be surprised if you actually see better quality icons as well, rather than just blocky scaling of the sizes. 
finally, I think I probably missed a few other features, but hey, we support a wide range of image formats. In fact, anything that ChangeFSI can support is now valid as a desktop background. You'll also see grayed out here a cache option. It's grayed out because I'm using a sprite at the moment, but if I was using another image type, cache would be the uh, would be available as an option. The purpose of this is to cache a converted high performance image uh, over a uh, over an attempt to render an image natively. Uh, large JPEGs that come out of modern cameras can be absolutely huge. And if you try and render those as a desktop wallpaper or pinball backdrop, as we would say, um, then dragging windows around can be extremely sluggish as it attempts to plot in the background for the large uh, high resolution JPEG. By using the cache option, it pre-converts it to a suitable sprite that can be used, that will update and redraw instantaneously. This makes moving around the desktop much smoother. And by automating it, it means the user doesn't have to manually convert that file, change the FSI before use. Uh, it makes life a lot easier when using uh, backdrops from other platforms. There's also a full screen option there, which is worth mentioning. Uh, many pinboard backdrops that you would download off the internet tend to be sized to specific resolutions, such as a full 1920 by 1080. Traditionally, the pinboard wallpaper was it began at the top of the icon bar. So in order to be accurately sized, you actually need to resize the backdrop down uh, by about 68 pixels. This wasn't a natural fit for the files that you would download off the internet. So often you had to live with either a, a scaling going on or missing the top of the, off the top of the screen. With the full screen option, the high, res uh, high resolution 1080p backdrop would actually fill the 1080p screen uh, behind the icon bar. So uh, you get a full 1920 by 1080 pixels on a 1920 by 1080 desktop, rather than having it reduced by the height of the icon bar. Um, so it makes it much more compatible with the images that you might download off uh, a Google image search, for example. At that point, I'm going to stop on uh, Pinboard because I'm looking at the time and it's rapidly moving on. Next up, RISCOS Direct. There will be a Raspberry Pi 4 update for RISCOS Direct delivered, I'd like to say immediately after this talk. I think in practice it's going to be um, some, sometime early this coming week. Uh, it's primarily just a case of just uploading the zip to uh, the RISCOS Direct website and making sure it's all available. This fixes a number of bugs in RISCOS Direct and adds full support for Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, these are the most common requests from new users wanting to try out RISCOS Direct. Uh, and we hope that uh, the new changes will make that product even better. The purpose of RISCOS Direct, for those who don't know, uh, is to have a version of RiscOS that is packed with as much content and uh, new user-friendly material as possible, uh, with the idea of using RiscOS Direct for outreach. Indeed, we've actually got a huge stack of uh, SD cards that we uh, intended to give out to Pi Jams before the dreaded COVID crisis hit. So we were all set to go earlier this year with, uh, you know, I think, you know, several hundred uh, discs to hand out to potential new RISCOS users. And then, of course, all the pie jams closed. So once the crisis is over, we intend to get back to this process of being able to hand out uh, discs to potential new users uh, and engage them in RISCOS to bring in a next generation of RISCOS user. So it's very important that features like the new pinboard and things are included to make RISCOS as enticing as possible in the future. The new pinboard is still in alpha beta test, but if anybody wants to get involved, please drop me an email. Uh, we're not hiding this in any way, so uh, anybody who wishes to beta test the new pinboard can do so. Uh, we also hope to make it available to users of RISCOS 4. Indeed, I'm actually testing it on a virtual acorn system as well. So you should be able to use the pinboard uh, on a broad range of computers. If you have any more questions on RISCOS Direct, we'll leave that to the Q&A. The next item on the agenda is the new TCPIP stack, which uh, hopefully comes as a nice surprise to everyone. 
I can't really demonstrate the new TCP IP stack because it is very much work in progress. Uh, I'm going to drop out of the uh, RISCOS Direct desktop now and return to talking to camera. The TCP IP stack is a project that we've undertaken for one of our commercial uh, partners, uh, but will hopefully benefit all risk of us users. And indeed, we've had meeting with Rural about just that. The new stack is designed to build a firm foundation for networking on RISC OS. If you're familiar with the existing networking system, it actually dates back to the 1990s. Um, although there were some tweaks done around the time of the Ionix to 32 bit it, the raw, uh, raw underlying network stack can be traced back to um, Acon's work in the sort of 94 to 97 period. So it's almost 25 years out of date. And that means it precedes many modern networking technologies like Wi-Fi, VLANs, uh, IPv6, and so on. We simply don't have a robust underlying network stack, and it's difficult to deliver network-based projects when you don't have a firm foundation. The new TCP IP stack takes the secure and mature stack from OpenBSD and brings it over to RiscOS. We've worked hard to create tools to make that process as automated as possible so that we can in future track the OpenBSD development work. Um, there is still some manual elements to the process, uh, but hopefully it won't be another 25 years before we do this again. At the moment, we have created the stack. We have uh, produced something that works with existing Ether USB and Ether TH network drivers that covers things like Raspberry Pi, IMX6, but other network drivers can be added very easily. I think the Ether TH driver took the programmer about a day to produce uh, once you've got the uh, IMX6 hardware. The new stack is already capable of running simple tests like ping, um, both to, to other platforms and from itself. And indeed, we can actually run the existing RISC OS ping tool uh, using the new stack, which will demonstrate the fact that we are achieving a level of compatibility with the existing TCP IP stack. Indeed, the last words I heard from the programmer were, uh, Eureka, I have NetSurf running over the new TCP IP stack. I thought, well, that'll make a great demo for, this, for the show. But of course, trying to run a remote sharing session over VNC, over a new TCP IP stack, and NetSurf on top of that, I think that would have been a step too far. So for now, no demonstration of the new stack. But it's certainly making headway. For the time being, features like IPv6 and the Wi-Fi elements are commented out or, or rather compiled out. That's not because they won't work, but simply because when you're building something, you start from first principles and work upwards. You don't try and run before you walk. The code's all there. There's no reason to suggest that it uh, won't work. Um, the techniques that we've adapted to allow the new TCP IP stack to run on RISC OS will apply equally to the IPv6 work. And we are actually talking to various people about that, uh, including uh, people like uh, Justin Fletcher, who you may remember from the long past, who has actually got an IPv6 system working for his uh, pet project. And therefore, he's tre we're treading ground that um, he's touched on in his, his work. And therefore, we should be able to achieve a level of compatibility with what's being done elsewhere. And that will help with the testing of the new TCP IP stack. The stack will be offered free of charge to rule for inclusion in the main operating system, and it already has been. Um, we aren't trying to take advantage of the rule bounties because this work is being done uh, with the blessing of a commercial partner, then this work can be uh, offered back to the RISCOS community at no cost. And that is obviously one big advantage of RISCOS developments being able to work full time with commercial companies uh, to promote the development of RISC OS. Um, and of course, it allows RISC OS developments to oversee and manage these projects to ensure that they benefit the whole community uh, and that everything is done 
uh, in harmony with the rest of the community. The final elements I will quickly run over before we do the Q&A are the open sourcing of Landman 98. Um, we have the full source code to Landman 98, courtesy of Robin at Warm Silence. Uh, I will in be intending to get that out this coming week uh, for free download, uh, both the application and the source code. Um, so that application will be available uh, for people to work on and uh, evaluate. P uh, perhaps the best bits can be incorporated in with OmniClient and uh, Landman FS in the operating system. Uh, again, that will be made free of charge in the next few days. risk -cost Developments has also been supporting the development of the new Python 3 language uh, for risk OS. Python 3 is a major update over the Python 2 language that was already available on risk OS. Uh, and indeed, it's almost a completely different language in terms of the syntax uh, and the way it's used. Risk OS had dropped off the supported platforms list with Python 2.7. So the move to Python 3 was essentially a whole new project. But it's very important because Python is the de facto standard language for learning modern programming in the way that basic was for many of us back in the 1980s. It's very difficult to reach a new user base if you can't support the programming languages that they're learning at school and in universities. So Python is in inherently important to risk OS. And the goal is to make the Python 3 experience as similar and blended with the operating system as basic has been traditionally on risk OS. The Python 3 project is nearing release status. Uh, it's already available for public uh, beta. Uh, it supports a lot of common libraries like Pygame, which uh, provides graphics, keyboard sound, type operation uh, and is popular in type it in listings in magazines for Pi systems and the like. With this as part of Risk OS Direct, we feel that it's a much stronger platform for encouraging new users with Risk OS. Um, the system will actually auto download Python libraries from the uh, main Python repository. And there is also work being done uh, to produce a Risk OS desktop application library uh, for Python as well, and Python 3, so that uh, you can write desktop applications in Python 3. Moving on finally, because I have already overrun the 30 minute time slot that we were supposed to have, I will finally touch on the thorny issue that is 64-bit. And this is the big challenge facing Risk OS in the next 10 years. At the moment, Risk OS is a 32-bit operating system uh, and uses what is known as ARCH32. This is the actual language used by the ARM processor itself. Now, modern ARM processors use something called ARCH64, which is a 64-bit um, language, for want of a better term. ARCH64, unfortunately, it bears very little resemblance to ARCH32. I think because ARMs are so often used in mobile devices, where programs are typically written in, in Java or similar, there was much less requirement for the generations of processor language to remain the same uh, between 32-bit and 64-bit. In the Intel AMD world, uh, Intel tried to go it alone with a brand new 64-bit language in their Itanium processors, and that fell on very deaf ears. Ultimately, Intel 64-bit processors run an AMD-derived 64-bit uh, uh, language known as AMD64. And that is much closer to 32-bit uh, Intel code than, than Intel's offering was. ARM, however, ha didn't have the requirement for backwards compatibility in the same way. So ARCH64 is very different to ARCH32. And that makes a huge problem for Risk OS going forwards. For the time being, there are still 32-bit uh, processors and 64-bit six processors with 32-bit modes. But that won't always be the case. And so we need to have an eye towards 64-bit. 
since it's a whole new language, a lot of the code that's available from RISCOS will simply cease to work on 64-bit processors. So we need a plan to accommodate that. There are a number of approaches ranging from completely rewriting RISCOS from the ground up uh, to hybrid emulation systems to complete emulation systems. And the key is finding the right balance between native code and emulation, because certainly some level of emulation would be required, otherwise pretty much every piece of software would fail. Apple tackled this and perhaps give us a bit of a roadmap in a way with their Rosetta technology when they moved from PowerPC to Intel back in the day. That was a similar move. Uh, and that's something that we are taking note of. We have a program we're actively working on possible um, ways forward. And whilst there are many options, and I'm not going to skip, sort of give site one as being any better than any other, and at this point it is these very early days, but we have a programmer who has uh, taken a very tiny low level microkernel, 64 bit microkernel, that runs on uh, a range of CPU architectures, including 64 bit ARM, but actually also on top of 64 bit Intel. And by using this tiny microkernel layer, he can then run a 32-bit ARM layer on top of that. And he's able to use that to boot into a RISC-OS desktop in approximately six seconds. Now that matches the same time to desktop of an ARM X6, uh, which is still a top tier RISC-OS system. And the overall system performance, he tells me, is very similar to an uh, ARM X6 level of performance using his very early emula uh, emulation of the ARM32 system. He's looking to expand this by unlocking the restrictions of the emulation to take advantage of the native hardware. So instead of trying to uh, emulate a classic RISC-OS machine, uh, he, the, the goal is to allow the native components to be used to create effectively a more modern, I'm loath to use the word, but virtual risk os system that can take advantage of the best of the native hardware capabilities while still maintaining compatibility with the 32-bit system. As I say, it's very early days, uh, but he's shown me working demonstrations of where he's got to it uh, in a relatively short space of time. And we're looking forward to seeing where that goes in future. But I wanted to mention the project simply because I wanted you to understand that we are taking an active interest in where risk OS goes in the future, not just where it goes right now. Because as owners of the risk OS IP, it's in our interest to make sure that the risk OS IP blossoms and gets as much attention and use worldwide on as many hardware projects as possible. Um, and that can only happen if we embrace the future as well as the past. And it's certainly risk os development's goal to act as a place where such projects can thrive and be overseen and work together with partners like Rule and the other hardware and software vendors to create something as a community that is much better than the in some of the individual parts. You'll note that I'm not doing a sort of hat in hand be begging drive this time. Uh, the projects that I've talked about so far are currently fully funded. Um, we will obviously need to come back for more funding in due course, uh, but for now, rest assured that these projects are all in hand and um, we are very excited for the future. So if anybody has any questions, I'm now open to questions. Yeah, I, I've got two questions, if I may. Um, when, when, when might we um, see a, um, um, a version of Iris that people can use that aren't part of the scheme? If I really, really want to start using a decent web browser on risk, um, on risk loss, and I would love to start being able to use it, but obviously I'm not part of the um, funding scheme or anything like that. 
And also, um, I don't know, as you know, um, Andrew, I use old RISPOS um, operating system. So this might be an old question that is not relevant anymore with new, new RISPOS, but I'll, I'll ask and you can, you can fill me in. With Pinboard 2, um, is, is it a RISPOS thing now that we can still do multiple users? So is, is Pinboard 2 um, across a user base, if you were to log into another user, would their Pinboard be set up with their configuration files, their downloads and all, all their all their setup? Or is it or is Pinboard 2 just for one user? So or is it multiple users in RISCOS available anymore? Okay, that's quite quite a lot of questions there. I'll see what I can do to answer them. Um, so you're asking about the browser. The next stage, release stage, will be to anybody who has previously purchased the O browser CD at the shows and events. Uh, I will be making that easier to get hold of um, through Pling Store, et cetera, um, because I know that that's been a bit of a bugbear in the past. Um, so that's something that will be a priority once the, uh, once the browser is made available that way. That's basically to widen the beta test phase. Obviously, the browser will, browser will be available free of charge to everyone, but um we're doing a staggered release because frankly although it looked pretty good in the demonstration there are still quite a few rough edges um it was only just a couple of days before the show that i was able to get things to the stability that i wanted in order to be able to show the demonstration um and i did have to uh turn off a few things behind the scenes um for example uh, the latest october build wasn't being shown because uh that uh, I felt was a bit unstable to be used. As a result, we don't want to sort of put it around as the default RISCOS web browser when it may crash and, and leave a horrible experience for people. Additionally, the way it's currently packaged is not what we would like for a final release version. So that's why we're doing a sort of staggered release. Initially, it's been to investors, then to people who've got O browser, then to everybody else once we're happy that it's in a condition that everybody else will find acceptable. Um, so as for the O browser thing, I genuinely hope that that will definitely be before Christmas. I don't really see a reason why I can't put out the version that I was just demonstrating in the talk um, really very, very quickly um, in the next sort of, you know, first few couple of weeks of November. But I'm also extremely busy, uh, so I have to balance my time as to what I can actually realistically do in a day. Uh, but that that would be the goal to get it to the O browser people in the next couple of few weeks. Um, could even be days, but I don't want to make a promise to you that I can't keep. As far as users on Pinboard are concerned, RiskOS uh, in its uh, um, RiskOS Five incarnation doesn't support users. Uh, so that's really a non-question as far as RISCOS 5 is concerned. There is no reason why it couldn't do that, because all it's doing is saving to a fo folder and boot choices. And as far as I know on RISCOS Adjust, it should also work because the user system on RISCOS Adjust just basically has a series of choice, uh, you know, user-specific choices folders in the boot structure. So in other words, uh, when you save your results in one user, that would go into that user's choices folder. And then if you saved it in another user, that would go into the other user's choices folder. So it should handle multiple users without any modification. But I will put the caveat on that, that I personally don't use multiple users on my risk cost adjust system. So I have no first-hand experience of that to say absolutely that that will work. Uh, but I see no reason why it wouldn't. Anybody else have any Andrew, yes. Um, on Iris, will you be able to print to a normal printer? And is it intelligent? In other words, will it fit the full screen onto a sheet of A4? Or does it you know, fall over the edge, as a lot of browsers do? Uh, that's an excellent question. And that's also why Iris is beta or even alpha rather than being release version. Um, at the moment, uh, it can save effectively a screenshot of what it's doing. Um, you can save an extended screenshot, which would actually be a, a shot of the entire page, uh, which can then be printed uh, in a program of your choice. Uh, that isn't a proper printing feature, I'm well aware, uh, but it's what we've got right now. 
Uh, there is a print engine, I believe, in WebKit, but obviously it is not very Risk OS friendly. So, in theory, the technology is there, but it will require a level of Risk OSifying that uh, I don't want to even begin to um, make promises on at this stage because I'm not the lead programmer, and I'm sure the lead programmer would not appreciate me making promises on his behalf. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I am aware of printing. I make use of printing extensively for printing invoices in, uh, from web browsers uh, on Windows. So it is a feature that is pretty close to my heart in terms of things that I would want from a risk OS web browser. So uh, I'm not ignoring that, but equally the focus has been on just trying to deliver something that's usable first. Um, I can't stress, I mean, you can probably imagine how much work has gone into producing what you've seen today. And the very fact that it did, I hope you thought a pretty darn good job um tell uh, sort of hopefully sort of confirms our our faith in the project and and, and, and gives you faith in risk cost developments uh, capability to, de to de deliver the project i guess you could use snapper or something like that to take a screenshot well, as I say, that, that is already present that the say the save box uh for the page you it allows you to save a a snapshot of the window or of the whole page so you can already do that built into the browser Okay. I've got I've got another question if I may Andrew just quick with O browser um how much is it to buy and also is there any show prices at the moment uh, I believe the price that we asked for for O browser was 40 pounds it was a sort of donation system or more if you wanted to use it on lots of machines I have to say I thought you bought it in the past David but um I, I may uh, I, I may be I may be wrong on that I'd have to check any records that we have I'm, I'm not 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 sure off the top of my head. Um, my intention is to make it available again on Plingstore because traditionally O browser was something that Richard and I offered at, at shows um, because it was uh, mainly for practical reasons um, because risk cost development doesn't set out to be a, a vendor in the traditional sense. You'll note that most of the project or all the projects that I've talked about are free projects from risk cost developments. Uh, risk cost developments works as a sort of not for profit type ethos um, we develop products then we give them away um, the reason why we charge for o browser is simply as, as, as to help keep coffers full for that purpose um, but it's not our intention that that be seen as a barrier so if somebody says to me well look andrew i really can't afford 40 quid i'm not going to say oh no you cannot have o browser but on the other hand please don't take advantage of it because i promise you it takes an awful lot of 40 quids to cover um, the kind of development costs that uh, real life programming can accrue Andrew. sorry just one more fight one more final thing then so how, how would i go about getting o browser because obviously i want to try and um, test the new browser asap so how would i go about getting o browser at the moment i, think I just said that my intention was to bring it back onto Plin Store. Uh, in the next uh, few days. Um, right, I'm sorry, I see, I see what you mean there. I, and I can't buy it before, I can't buy it in between, you mean? Um, well, as I say, I, I, I wouldn't until I've got the, if you're buying it for the purpose of getting Iris, which yeah. I'm not entirely happy with that ethos, it doesn't quite. Oh, sorry. Uh, but I would I would wait till Iris was available if, if that's your thought process, um, okay. because that way you're not, uh, you know, uh, o browser was a product of its time. Um, it, it's 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 useful in its own right, but um, you know, with, with Iris being so close, I would wait till you've seen a press announcement about that, and then buy uh, it. It will be available. It will be on Pling Store by the time Iris is there, so that we can we can sort of sync all of that up. Okay, okay. I, I just really can't wait to to um, to use the uh, the um, Iris web browser. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I, I noticed a comment in chat from Paul Emerton about investing in risk cost developments. Uh, obviously, always appreciated. If you would like to contact either myself or Richard Brown, that's Andrew at Risk Cost Dev or Richard at Risk Cost Dev uh, offline uh, about that, then we would very happy to discuss that with you. Um, people who have invested in the company uh, or made donations to the company uh, of, uh, of a reasonable size. Uh, receive our regular newsletter. So uh, all of the information that I spoke about today was already known to all of our uh, uh, investor partners. Uh, and they have a much more active role in the running of the company in terms of um, generating feedback, uh, early access to content, testing, 
um, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we send out the regular newsletters to them uh, and the early access software and uh, try and respond as much as possible to uh, those people uh, to give them the best access to the company that we can. Although I should stress that the word invest is with extreme caution, this is primarily a donation rather than an investment at this stage, um, unless you're making a very large don uh, donation, in which case we would have to, to think about how that was handled. So, so Andrew, you, you mentioned about investments. So, uh, or, or I'm sorry, I can't, I can hear somebody talking, but I can't, uh, yeah. can't um, hear what they're saying. Yeah. Um, oh, hi. Hi, hi Andrew, yeah. You can hopefully hear me. Um, yeah, so you mentioned about um, uh, donations. Mm -hmm. um, were you looking at some sort of scheme that you could make regular donations or, or are you just looking at one-offs? Um, well, we do have some, 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 some partners who do actually make regular donations by various means. Uh, I think that's something that you would want to talk to, talk to Richard about. He deals with a lot of the sort of administrative stuff rather than myself. Um, you're seeing me today because it was more of a technical presentation of the different products and um, I knew there'd be quite a lot of technical questions. So um, that's why I'm up to date. Uh, Richard deals with all the sort of company type paperwork and that kind of thing. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, and okay. um, for developers like me that have an incredible small amount of time to, to work on this cost, where should we focus on in terms of investing our time? First of all, AIF, ELF, uh, are we going, if, we, if we're going to keep both, are we going to have uh, shared libraries, uh, DLL, call it whatever you want, for AIF as well? There was an initial project on that. Okay, so um, some aspects of that I think would probably be better targeted towards the rule talk later because I think they will be talking about the DDE and uh, the development tools. Um, I think it's important to remember that the, the, the future of RISCOS is very much a partnership of companies like RISCOS Developments, Rule, um, assuming the Cloverleaf project is successful, then um, you know it will be a it will be a way of, of us all working together. I mean, Riscos Developments, as holder of the IP, it has a clear vested stake in, in making sure that, that Riscos's future is as rosy as it can be, uh, and we'll do everything that we can to uh, to coordinate and and uh, ensure that happens. As far as your, your specific question. Um, with an eye to 64 bit, I think that that lead will have to come from Rule uh, uh, because as, as, as producers of the development tools. Uh, but I see um, certainly for sort of ported type programs, the uh, the GCC environment being critical going forwards. And that naturally leads into the ELF uh, approach uh, that with the shared libraries. I think, um, I think we probably need um, something to make upgrading and, and, and maintaining shared libraries is a little easier for, for people. Although package management uh, does help a lot with that with Pac-Man. Um, I think something that allows people, uh, Pac-Man assumes one level, of, uh, one method of software distribution. Um, I think we need to have things that can sync that with people buying the sort of the tr traditional software purchase of buying a CD to show or something or a USB stick with software on. Uh, so we need to find the necessary tool chain to make it easy to, to, to maintain that. But I think ELF has a big role to play in the future. Yes, certainly. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, with, with, a lot, with, with many things stemming from the, uh, the Linux world, that GCC is critical for that. Um, as far as AIF is concerned, I think most traditional risk loss programmers will continue to develop with Norcroft tools because that's what they're used to. But that does inherently mean um, being limited, at least at the time being, to the, to the present ecosystem, um, which is basically rendered uh, obsolete by AR64. But that's why it's so important to have uh, sort of technology similar to Apple's Rosetta to allow for 32-bit stuff to um, to exist within a 64-bit ecosystem. 
Um, I know there's been, uh, I haven't been following it, but there's been quite a lot of chat about the pros and cons of different methods. I'm absolutely not suggesting that the method that we're investigating at the moment is necessarily the best one, uh, but it's an approach that uh, can provide at the very least a stopgap solution and also a way of um, providing a more a sort of architecture neutral solution in future. I am cautious because it reminds me of some of Acorn's, or, or, or rather Peter Bond, I think it was Peter Bondar's ill-fated uh, plans with ART back in the Acorn era, which um, in hindsight were, were, were not the best plan in the world. I don't want to make the same mistakes. Um, but on the other hand, I also, I'm also painfully aware that um, if we don't do anything, then we could hit the skids in a couple of years time quite nastily. So I think there needs to be probably a selection of projects working ranging from a sort of new risk OS from the ground up project. Uh, personally, I'm not entirely convinced that sort of just going through all the ARM code and trying to convert it over to 64 bit is necessarily the smartest way forward. I think something written in C would be a better, better approach. I also feel that if you are going to go through effectively rewriting large chunks of the operating system, you might actually be better served by uh, sort of building on some, some newer programming concepts uh, and newer ways of doing things. Um, uh, but then uh, making sure that you have um, a compatibility layer on top that allows the existing code to operate. Uh, quite exactly how that would work is, is something really for bigger brains than myself. Um, but I envisage something along the lines of a sort of core operating system that takes the best ideas from modern operating system design um, with a, a sort of modernized window manager that perhaps preemptively multitasked, but with a process that uh, ran legacy web applications cooperatively within uh, uh, a sort of holder process. But I say that with very little idea of how best to, to, to achieve that beyond having seen something vaguely similar done by uh, with WIMP 2, but perhaps not in quite the same way back in the ACORN era. Um, but I am, but I do feel that perhaps building on a, on a, on a firmer foundation of modern OS design could yield benefits in future. Uh, certainly building something written in C, but I am also super aware that RiskOS without its software is not RiskOS, RiskOS at all. Right, Andrew, on that point, I think you've now got half an hour to do the Archon talk, so you probably right. have to move on. Okay, so let's move on to the Archon talk. Um, I will now switch back to screen sharing again, uh, because I will now reveal what uh, the forte is. Um, so if I click share screen and I switch back to, I hope that one, um, and I close that and that. The Forte is a brand new computer that we are launching at the show. Uh, with units being produced between now and Christmas and shipping out to users. Um, you'll be able to see the first batch here today. I will have uh, example units and the units will be available for sale um, pretty much straight away. I will just try and find where I put the, ah, oh, there we are, there are the pictures, that's what we want. So the Forte started out as a uh, prototype CAD design. You can see the front of the computer. Um, it developed into a more complete design once it was produced in the flesh. The purpose of the Forte project is to deliver a very low cost uh, computer in our range. Uh, our machines are known for being higher end systems, um, starting at around 500 pounds. The idea is to lower that barrier of entry to create something that is much more acceptable to the budget end of the market and potentially to newer risk OS users um, at around the 250 pound price point, while still incorporating all the key features that make our more expensive systems um, as well respected as they are. Uh, in particular, that includes features like our recovery systems, our operating system upgrades, 
the support, the software, and uh, the quality and attention to detail in the machines themselves. All of that carries over to the Forte. As the name implies, it's powered by the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, technology. The Raspberry Pi 4 offers an extremely high performance processor for the price. Indeed, in benchmarks, it can uh, reach or even exceed the titanium. Um, for example, um, when Iris loads, which is normally a very lengthy process, uh, on a titanium system, you will see loading times of about nine seconds. Uh, on a base forte, you can get that down to about eight seconds. And we've also developed some technology specifically for the forte, uh, which is what we call accelerator technology. And with accelerator technology, Iris will actually load in just on, under four seconds. Um, so at that point, it is running at uh, an impressive rate of knots. Uh, and uh, really helps demanding products like Iris. Indeed, it is intended that uh, in due course, uh, the Forte will actually ship with uh, a modern web browser because it's important that new users to this platform have access to modern web components and of course existing users too. You'll notice on the front of the Forte box, uh, you can see the RiscOS Direct logo. Uh, it's being done in partnership with uh, Tom Williamson of Wi-Fi Sheep and RiscOS Direct fame with the idea of presenting the computer to new users as a logical step up from uh, bareboard Raspberry Pi type solutions. It also means that they can have a, a solution that they just plug in, turn on and gives them a RiscOS desktop in the most elegant way possible. Uh, complete with all the necessary expansion, the sockets, and everything that you would want from a full RiscOS computer. Um, for existing users, uh, we think that the head nod to the Risk PC in the design language of the unit will be appreciated. We also think that the fact that you can get sort of titanium level performance for a third the price will be appreciated, um, or I should say Titan, uh, titan Stroke Time Machine level performance rather than titanium, that was unfair to the titanium itself, uh, for a third the price of those machines uh, will be appreciated. The higher end machines though do still have the edge in terms of uh, disk access um, with their native SATA drives. Uh, storage will remain an Achilles heel for Pi based products um, for the time being. Um, but thanks to advances in software, things are getting better. For example, the latest Messenger Pro, which will be supplied with the Forte, uh, includes technology to uh, speed up uh, disk IO on the uh, slower disk access systems. So it should overall make the experience on Forte to be uh, as good as it can possibly be. We've tried to develop a well-rounded solution um, with Forte uh, that covers not only the hardware, but also the software. So from a hardware perspective, you've got the Pi uh, technology you know, with gigabit ethernet and high performance. We've added additional USB ports. So the Pi, uh, so, so the Forte offers um, six USB ports on the unit. Um, it also has full size HDMI connection. If I look at the rear CAD, you can see that it has the USB ports Ethernet on the rear, as well as full HDMI uh, and a pop out panel for the second HDMI should RiscOS gain that capability. You'll also notice pop out panels on the side for future expansion as well. And there will be a model available with built in Wi Fi. This presentation is actually running on a Forte. So the Iris demonstration you saw earlier was running on that platform. You can see that it is already a mature and stable platform. Uh, and it will come with a range of Arcomp software uh, products that will be at least equal to the £250 uh, uh, sticker price in, should you, were, were you to buy the software separately. Indeed, you could say that you get the computer for free if you buy the software. Although perhaps that's not the uh, the tagline to go with. Um, I will now switch back from this view to show you the real life product. Uh, so if I stop sharing and disconnect the unit, you can see the unit here. It's 
a touch heavier than you might expect. It's made with um, tough, sturdy plastic uh, that is biodegradable, uh, although not during the lifetime of the product, I should stress. Uh, that makes it environmentally friendly as well as uh, being an excellent uh, housing for the computer. There's plenty of uh, vent for airflow uh, because the pie does get, uh, get toasty. Um, the stickers are optional. Um, but we do intend to include them for those who wish to uh, brand their computers. Um, and the intention is to include everything that you need in the box to get going. So you'll have your power supply and everything else uh, ready to go. Um, the Zoom thing is really not doing a particular justice to this, but if I slowly rotate the system, you can see uh, this unit in a full 360 degrees. Of course, some people will say, but Andrew, it's just a pie in a box. And that is a fair comment. Um, the Forte is ultimately a pie in a box, but we'd suggest that uh, it is probably one of the better pie in a boxes. I would say um, almost on a par with the pie in a boxes that you would get from Melton Mowbray at Christmas with uh, pot pies inside. Um, the way we want to distinguish the Forte from the crowd, as it were, is through the software, through the thought that's gone into the hardware design with the extra USB ports, off controls, internal expansion, dual disk approach for recovery, um, expansion via internal hats. There's enough height in there to fit additional modules inside, additional SSD, etc. Um, and um, on the software front, you've got a large amount of software. Um, you've got uh, a curated approach to the delivery of that software. Anybody who's familiar with our existing machines will understand what I'm talking about. Um, and regular operating system upgrades and firmware upgrades. Indeed, the Risk OS Direct for Raspberry Pi 4 will also include an automatic way of updating the firmware on the Raspberry Pi 4s to be ensure that they are up to date and compatible with Risk OS. Um, and risk OS Direct. Um, so all of that will be part and parcel of the product that we're doing. And we will also be using uh, sort of social media with the partners at Wi-Fi Sheet to promote the product to new users as well as existing risk OS users uh, to try and boost the interest outside of the risk OS community with this product. I'm now going to move on from this uh, to uh, another new machine that we're announcing today and demonstrating. And um, if I get rid of my virtual background at this point, turn on the lighting effects that I have here. You will see in the corner uh, a somewhat exposed box, which is the prototype unit of our TIX or TIX system. Uh, also, uh, to, to follow the musical theme of Forte and Minim, we also call it the du duet. And we're open to suggestions from people as to whether they'd prefer the TIX name or the duet name. On the website, uh, we're calling it the TIX duet uh, until we come up with a, a final choice of name. Uh, the name represents the fact that you actually have two systems here rather than one. You have both um, an AMD Intel system and a high performance ARM system based on titanium technology. Uh, these run with one power supply in one case, but internally uh, provide separate subsystems um, that link together to perform something that is, is better than some of the parts we hope. By using separate subsystems, we ensure that there is no compromise in the performance. So whilst the concept of a PC and uh, a risk of machine in the same box may be reminiscent of Acorn with their uh, RISC PC, that was hamstrung by running over the RISC PC bus, which was like trying to squeeze three lanes of motorway into one lane of country road. With this, you have two systems that are independent yet linked, which ensures that both systems have maximum throughput. And that means that you can have a PC that's 
as simple as a web browsing word processing system, right up to something that is a full state-of-the-art water-cooled 16-core gaming monster with big graphics card. If you look in the case, I don't, you probably can't see too much, but there are actually two motherboards, one at the top, one at the bottom. Uh, the ARM board at the bottom, the PC board at the top, which is my uh, work machine rehoused. Um, I do have a water cooler to go in there, but I didn't have time to fit it before the show. The purpose of the system is to give people the best of all worlds in one system. And um, I will give a brief demonstration of that now. So if I start uh, screen sharing the Risk OS desktop on the machine, um, There we go. You can see the desktop here. Um, we have features like UniPrint, uh, which allow printing from one side to the other. We have shared storage and the file swap, which allows transfer between the two platforms. And uh, you can either use uh, things like KVM to, to have independent graphics outputs, or you can use features like VNC or RDP to combine the graphics outputs together. Um, some monitors uh, will actually allow you to have the graphics outputs from both computers combined onto the screen side by side. Um, many of the big super wides, for example, allow two full-size desktops side by side, or you can use picture in picture uh, type facilities to have maybe a quarter of the screen for one and, and, and the rest for the other. Um, if I, for this purposes of this, because we're using a lot of, of VNC to achieve the uh, shared desktops, I will start by showing you that. In the, uh, the PC board has both LAN and Wi-Fi. I will use Wi-Fi because uh, that's a neat way of doing it, less cables. Um, uh, you can see here that we have the full desktop of my work PC. Uh, and um, we can operate that within the confines of the VNC window. This gives access to a full range of Windows software within our RISC-OS desktop. Um, obviously, the web browser demonstration will be less relevant once Iris hits the streets, but uh, I can't type, so that's not going to take me to where I wanted to go. Uh, it, Sorry, slow response with everything going over the network. But you can see how we can use that to achieve um, both systems within the one desktop. And similarly, if we were looking at the PC side as our main side, um, we can see the Wisco OS desktop in exactly the same way. The two can also be linked together. So uh, again, using the UniPrint technology that's supplied with the system, uh, we can bring up UniControl. Uh, I can demonstrate how we can do things like the URL launching. You can see one side of the machine can pass things through to the other side of the machine. Um, for those unfamiliar with this technology, uh, if you look at something like Messenger Pro, that has baked in uh, use of UniPrint URL launching. So you can actually right-click right on a link in Messenger Pro and pass it straight through to the other platform. So you can do your email on RiskOS and then just right-click a link and go open uh, on the other machine. And it will pop up just like the Archon website has popped up there on the system. Similarly, I can pass files to and fro. If I just get rid of that for one second and put a file into the file swap, if we go into show demo, we can um, go to examples and put this graphics file across. Uh, and then if I look at the file swap on the other machine, you can see there's the graphic file from 
the RISC-COS desktop. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, I can do all of that with two computers anyway. And that's absolutely true. Um, there's very little here that you can't do uh, with the necessary tools and parts using two separate computers. The key here is that this is one computer box with one power supply. I'm using one keyboard and mouse. I'm using one monitor. Uh, and I'm integrating all of that into one system um, to create something that, uh, for me at least, um, is better than the sum of its parts. And indeed, this very machine will be my work machine going forward because it will allow me to have a full RISC-OS 5 system, a full Windows system, and even a virtual icon system, all in the confines of one box. Um, my virtual icon desktop is extremely large because it's usually connected to a, a super wide monitor, but you get the idea. I will now close that out um, and I will continue to use the TI portion for the rest of the talk. You'll see in the top corner there, I've got a watermark, uh, Bling Store 20% discount code, London 2020. If you buy any Rcomp or Rcomp Interactive software this weekend or until the end of the month on Pling Store, you can put that into the special instructions box and we will discount the software uh, by 20% uh, when it goes off your card. Um, the Pling Store will still think you've paid full price, uh, but we can promise you that if you've used that code, you will get the 20% discount when it comes off your card. Um, as I say, valid until the end of the month uh, on Rcomp and Rcomp Interactive software. With about 15 minutes left, I have an awful lot still to cover. So I will go very quickly through as much as the stuff you've seen before as possible. ARM book, I've talked about it at previous shows, you've seen it. They're getting quite scarce because of production, uh, but we have found one or two down the back of the sofa. Uh, so we do still have a small number still available uh, of the ARM book computers. Um, if you're not familiar, then I suggest you watch some of my previous talks. Uh, it's complete RISC-OS portable system. Um, with up to 14 hours of battery life, and um, it's great. I don't know, it's difficult to sort of sum it up in, in many, much more than that. Several people who bought them have commented that it's completely renewed their interest in Risk OS because they're able to program and do Risk OS and things um, from wherever they are in the house. Uh, I'll just power it up and uh, you know, actually see a Risk OS desktop. Um, but um, Obviously, the ARM book has been uh, a key product for us this year uh, and has been, uh, been very well received, uh, both in the UK and abroad. Um, it offers uh, the high resolution screen um, and also um, easier to see probably on camera is big mode, which makes everything larger and clearer to see. Uh, my camera is probably not doing justice to this. Anyway, so that's ARM book. There will be operating system upgrades coming out very shortly and uh, to accommodate 5.28. Uh, and that applies to all of our computers um, where possible. Uh, we will be bringing out 5.28 releases um, as soon as RISCOS Open uh, give us the head nod to do so. Another new computer that we're launching at the show is a new generation of RISC Cube Mini. For those who aren't familiar with our RISC Cubes, uh, they basically have uh, Intel processors in them. In theory, it could be AMD, but for the most part, it's Intel, uh, and run uh, Windows and virtual RISC OS. Um, although that's not for many people, it's a lot less exciting than the pure ARM systems. The reality is that uh, these type of systems still accounts for the probably a good 50 to 60 percent of the systems that we sell. So it's still very relevant to what people are actually using in the real world. 
Um, the Risk Cube Mini uh, is an exciting new model. You can see it's very small, but it can still pack in up to an eight core processor, would you believe? Um, if we look at the rear, you'll see that it's got a lot of expansion there. You've got multiple USB ports, including the latest USB 3.1, um, 10 gigabit variety, um, HDMI display port, um, multiple gigabit ethernet ports. Uh, there are Wi-Fi expansions available. On the front, you've got the various USB ports again with more uh, high-speed USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports um, and a, a card reader. Um, so really, you know, you can pack an awful lot of good stuff into the machine. Um, you can have a solid state disk and a backup hard drive in there as well. Um, and it supports both um, SATA and uh, NVMe uh, next gen SSD storage for the highest possible performance. Um, so Risky Mini packs an awful lot of punch into a very small space. We've also just taken delivery of uh, a new range of risk books, uh, which can come with our operating system. So if you don't want to pay the Microsoft tax, we can offer Linux laptops without Microsoft tax associated with them. Although in all honesty, given the high price of laptops, that isn't actually a large saving because Microsoft tend to peddle their operating so cheaply to the large vendors. But nevertheless, uh, for, uh, for moral reasons, some people liked the idea of a laptop that has no Microsoft anywhere near it. Switching back to uh, the shared desktop, the Arm X6 uh, is available in a new case design that's sort of like a small tower. Um, we've knocked 100 pounds off the price. Um, Arm X6 at this point is a stalwart risk cost machine, uh, but remains uh, many people's sort of first choice for a sort of mid-range, more affordable risk OS machine uh, that still has solid state disk uh, via SATA, um, gigabit ethernet and, and the likes. Uh, it's also the sort of target baseline performance for Iris. So it remains an excellent choice, uh, even though other machines are now available. Um, when it was designed, the Armex 6 was designed as a machine with no obvious Achilles heels. And that remains the case, um, although um, the raw CPU performance is naturally surpassed by uh, the likes of the Titanium and indeed the new Forte. Software-wise, uh, our big new release is um, version 2.3 of Fireworks Professional. And I will give a very brief demonstration of that. We go to show demo. The headline feature is the ability to create documents that are embeddable in other applications. So if we go to our comp and load, oh, Fireworks is already loaded, so I'm going to load an example table. Because we can embed these documents into other applications, the idea of a table editor uh, type role for Fireworks has come to the fore. And we've created some templates with that in mind in a new version. You can see here, uh, we've made a little table of some temperatures in the house, uh, and this will allow us to demonstrate some of the fun new functionality. At the most simple, uh, if we were to also load TechWriter, um, or this also works with Impression and should do with Ovation Pro, although I'm just talking to David Pilling to add the file type to his understood list of file types. Uh, we load TechWriter. And we save this document into TechWriter. You can see that that uh, table is now part of our TechWriter document. Now you could already do that as a draw file, but the key point about this is that whilst the file is now in the TechWriter document, we can edit that from within the TechWriter document and it remains fully editable. So we could change that Thursday's temperature actually dropped down to 12 degrees. And then when we save that, and finish working, you can see that that has now dropped to 12 degrees in the TechWriter document. And we can take this further by creating a chart from that. If we highlight some data and we create a simple chart from that, put that on the page. And this then gives us a dynamic chart that we can incorporate into another document. So if we were to save this now, 
you can see that the chart has now appeared. I'll take this one stage forward into your course once I've just demonstrated a couple of other features um, to show how you can have charts in other programs that are then data backed and dynamic. If I move this to the side, uh, you can see that we've got an average column at the bottom here. If I highlight this block and click the sum button, which would traditionally have just added them all up, we now get a menu of mathematical functions that are useful uh, in this context. I'm going to pick average, and you can see that I now have an average temperature of 17.5. Um, degrees Celsius. We've also improved the adding and removing of rows, so uh, we can now uh, go to uh, edit and rows, and you can see insert before and add after. So if we add after one row, you can see that because I was within the table when I added it, it has now gone onto a new line um, and given carried forward the table box outlines. If we'd added before with this one, the average line, you can see we get a blank line because we were on a blank line when we added it before. Uh, that's obviously very helpful when working with tables, but working with all types of uh, spreadsheet. I commented that I would show more about the dynamic table. If I put this onto the second page, I can save, when I bring up the save box, I can choose the page that I want to save. So instead of saving, doing everything on the first page, I can just choose to do the second page. And now we just have the chart, but because it's actually embedded the whole of the original file in the, uh, in, in, into that box, the chart remains fully dynamic. So um, if I were to change some of the numbers on this, so for example, uh, on the Tuesday, it may have gone up to 30 degrees and I save that. You can see that the chart dynamically changes within Fireworks, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, within TechWriter. Uh, so the key here is that that, uh, that table remains a full spreadsheet um, and the graphs and charts derived from it remain fully dynamic so that you can create documents um, that have tables and charts that are completely data driven and are not just static raw files, which I think is a very important feature in terms of creating uh, and manipulating data. Uh, it all stemmed from a document that uh, somebody in Holland wanted to create, which was a invoice in impression. And he said, well, he wants his invoice to include a spreadsheet of the work he's done uh, as a table um, that he, he can edit and, and, and change. And by keeping the, uh, the data uh, for the uh, spreadsheet invoice uh, dynamic like this, we can uh, allow him to produce invoices in Fireworks that he then puts out with his own letterheads and, and stylistic elements in impression. I'm sorry, Andrew, I'm afraid your time has come to an end. What would be the best way for people to contact you to discuss things with you? Um, via email and um, I think uh, if I make myself available at 6.30 after the talks, then if anybody has any questions, they can ask questions about Archon products uh, in, the, in, the, in the chat. That is, that is very sensible. Right. Oh, thank you for cutting me off because I did need that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I, please, I, enjoy, I, please enjoy whatever follows. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah. Okay. I, I will. Okay, so coming up next in all oh, 30 seconds, um, we have David from the University of Cantabria. I hope he's there. Hello. Hello there, David. Uh, Hi, thanks. Right. Are you are you all set for your to do your talk? Yes. Right. So those of you who were at the show last year may remember that the University of Cantabria visited to talk about their UC debug. 
So there's been some updates since then. So David's going to give us some news on what's been what's happened since. Away you go, David. Thank you. Uh, so we're seeing the presentation right now. Yeah, that looks fine. Okay, perfect. Hey. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Herreros, a computer science uh, student at the University of Cantabria in the north of Spain. Uh, uh, during the last year, I've been working in this project for my degree thesis at the Booger for RISCOS uh, with faculty and purposes. This project was exhibited last year uh, by my colleague Paulo Fuentes, uh, who is today here. Uh, so in this talk, I want to refresh uh, some of the information uh, he talked last year. Uh, and I will enter in some more detail and so the new functionalities I have done. Uh, this presentation is divided in three parts. Uh, an introduction of the context of this project, analysis of the functionality of the debugger, and a close to the presentation with a performance evaluation and a short conclusion. Uh, now we'll start with the continuation. Uh, in the University of Cantabria, uh, there are technological degrees as computer science or electronic engineering. Uh, these degrees have computer structure and organization courses but it is explained how a computer works at a low level. Uh, these courses have a reference hardware architecture, which is currently ARM. Uh, the laboratory environment of these courses is component by a Raspberry Pi Model 1B Plus uh, running RISCOS. Uh, here you can see the model. Uh, this environment lets the student works uh, with ARM assembly code directly and allows uh, to manage peripheral devices at a low level. Uh, this environment has other benefits as it's low cost and it gives the possibility of work and assignments to the laboratory that uh, nowadays with the status we have is more, much more important. And finally, for this environment, we need a, a, a ARM assembly debugging tool uh, yeah, which has a set of requirements. It must have a graphical interface, a good usability, uh, low cost, and should be able to debug the codes uh, used during the laboratories. Uh, for this, uh, the assembly book uh, was created. Uh, this is an assembly arm assembly debugger oriented to educational purposes. Uh, this tool can debug drivers uh, that use peripheral devices, uh, has an easy to learn uh, curve, and has a graphical interface uh, pretty much similar to what we could expect from a code debugger, as you can see in the image on the right. Uh, this is an open source project and it's available for free in a GitHub repository we have around here. But now we, I'm going to talk about, a little about uh, the graphic interface we have here. Uh, the is composed of a set of windows. Uh, the first one is a, command, is a command window. We can use commands like to uh, start the program, uh, load it, uh, stop it. And it also gives us information about uh, the status of the execution. Uh, then we have a uh, code window that uh, shows us the instructions of the code, uh, its codification, and its, uh, its address. Uh, we see that there is uh, one ref instruction and one that is in green. Uh, the red one is a user breakpoint that is set through the graphical interface. That is the, the only mode that we encourage to use. And the green one is the next instruction that is going to be executed this is the one pointed by the program counter. Uh, this is the uh, code, the data window. Uh, here we can see the, the state of the data, uh, its address, and how uh, we will code in ASCII. Uh, this is the register. This is the window. We can see the register status of the current uh, of the current mode. And also some of the flags uh, here. Uh, we have the three pointer unit uh, window. We can see the double or single uh, or simple point uh, registers. Uh, this is not shown by default. You have to open it uh, by using the icon of the button right. Uh, and for last, the input output uh, window, uh, where you do all the input output operations to the user code. And uh, now we're going, I'm going to explain about the UC debug implementation. Uh, currently, it has uh, five execution modes. Uh, the go mode that executes the user code until it ends. 
the trace mode that executes one user instruction at a time, the go direct mode that works like the go mode, but it doesn't stop uh, on the user breakpoints, uh, the mode go to that executes the user code until it ends, or if it reaches an address that is passed as a parameter, and the go fast mode that I will explain later uh, because part of my development. Uh, this the uh, foremost I explained have something in common. Uh, they must return to the debugger score uh, after each instruction to, to this a breakpoint instruction uh, is inserted after each uh, user instruction, as you can see here. Uh, for this, the board has a set of uh, handlers that replace the one from the system during the user code. Uh, this enables the debugger to avoid uh, to avoid set problems and it let us, for example, when an exception is generated by the uh, breakpoint instructions, to not show uh, to not show the to the user and continue with the execution. It also let us handle some of the errors because uh, if an error was uh, or a setting was hap uh, happens in the user code, uh, what will happen no normally is that it uh, shows this error window and uh, it will close the debugger. But we want to avoid that. We want only to stop the, the user's code execution. Uh, as we can see, uh, the error message that we get by default, it gives us a lot of information, but for a student uh, point of view, it isn't clear what it is saying to us, and you don't have a, an easy way to tell what is the error that has happened. For this, uh, this handles also let us to create uh, custom messages, as we see in the image. Uh, we can see it says it's uh, pretty much short, and it says all the information uh, our student needs. What is the setting that happened, and in which address uh, it occurred. Uh, for the last, uh, the, uh, some of the switches that were implemented in the system uh, can be executed uh, as we will do normally uh, in the debugger. Uh, uh, so uh, the debugger must capture all these switches, analyzing the code, and uh, use its own implementation. Uh, some switches like that are the input output of the switch that has we see early, earlier. Uh, they have in its own window, so uh, when we use a, one of the switches, it has to manage it. Or, for example, the exit OS suite that uh, normally will close not only the debugger code, the user code, uh, but also the debugger. But we only want it to stop the, the user's code executing. Now, starting with the part I developed, uh, we have uh, a little motivation. Uh, as a form of case in the stream motivation during the laboratories, uh, it was seek to introduce the use of peripheral devices uh, in the laboratories of the assignments. Uh, those peripherals uh, were the very clear plate, that is, uh, which has uh, six LEDs, two buttons, and a buzzer, which can reproduce some uh, melodies, uh, an ultrasonic proximity sensor, an LCD display of 16 characters per row, and a an humidity and temperature sensor. We think uh, in total will give us uh, the opportunity of do uh, a lot of uh, assignments for laboratories uh, that are very different one of others. Uh, some of these devices uh, didn't work in the debugger current state due to the strict time constraints, as is the case of, uh, with the humidity and temperature sensor we see here. Uh, this happens because the old modes that were implemented uh, the debugger were robust and secure, but they also were very slow. For this, a new execution mode was created, the GoFast mode, uh, which aims was to be able to execute uh, codes that use these kinds of peripherals. Uh, this new mode, uh, main strategy was to be able to execute multiple user instructions without having to return to the board score uh, as we have done in the other modes. Uh, for this, a new, a new handler for the software uh, for the software truth was implemented. Uh, the minimizing the number of times the board must return to the core, which minimizes also the overhead introduced because uh, we also uh, remove the characteristic of introducing a breakpoint instruction after each user instruction, uh, making that we don't have that overhead after executing one single instruction of the user. Uh, furthermore, uh, a new periodic interrupt system uh, was added to to, this, uh, to improve the usability of this new mode. Uh, 
eh, no estoy muy de software interior handler eh, this is handler uh, is called only when I use when a swing instruction is, is executed in the user code. Uh, this handler must identify uh, the suite of product instruction and determine if it's uh, one that must be captured or not. Is if, if it's a capture suite, uh, uh, we must execute it inside the suite handler. Uh, this, The main change is that now all the logic about detecting which instruction is a is a three and if it's a or not is removed from the debugger score and it's moved here, uh, removing all this overhead that we have in each single instruction. And uh, the, now, which is the more the most significant change that when a three is not, not captured by the debugger, so we must execute uh, with the system implementation. So when we do it, we return to the bugger score when well, the execution is mostly similar to what we have in the native uh, execution of ARM code and executed there. Uh, now, uh, when we were developing this mode, we get a problem that is that when we are executing here, uh, the uh, user code, you, uh, the user cannot interact with the debugger. This, uh, this is a really uh, a problem in most cases because you just have to wait until the problem stops or it requires an input output operation. But uh, in a, if there is a case that there is an error that causes the problem to loop indefinitely, what will probably happen if it's in an student code because this is uh, we have to remember that this is for uh, is thinked. If, uh, I a user, a student that is starting to learn uh, assembly language, uh, so it would probably happen there. Uh, and so the, the only uh, solution that he will have uh, will be to uh, restart the system, losing all the information about the execution. To solve this problem, uh, a periodic internal system was implemented that forces the debugger to return to the interface periodically, allowing the user to execute comments while executing this mode. Uh, the system uses one of the interruption sources of the system timer and has a period of 65 milliseconds. This period uh, may seem a bit, uh, it seems to be, uh, but was select trying to find a balance between usability and functionality. We want the user to be able to stop the execution, but it's only for stopping, so it has to be that fluent that it affects the functionality of the new mode. That we have to remember, we want uh, to be able to execute these peripherals with uh, street time constraints. And now for the last one, we're going to see some of the performance evaluation uh, we have done. Uh, for this, uh, I, I use a test code that executes a big number of simple instructions to be able to measure properly the execution time. Uh, the first, in the first row, we can see the native times. Uh, that is 1.62 nanoseconds. Uh, this is our aim to achieve with the new execution mode. And as we can see in the next row, the go mode is far uh, very, uh, from these times. It's around 20,000 uh, times bigger uh, than the native average time, which uh, explains why we couldn't execute uh, codes that using this kind of devices. But now, as we can see, the go fast uh, go mode uh, has a time of 1.49 nanoseconds, that it's much uh, near the, with the native time. And it's even a little better. Uh, this is due uh, because the debugger has a greater resolution for the system, are, are some operations that he doesn't check or, or interrupt sources. Uh, now, uh, Uh, seeing that the times of time are good enough, even better than expected, and that we can use, uh, and that the periodic system doesn't affect the performance uh, in a meaningful way, uh, we only need to check that the system can use uh, this kind of peripherals. Uh, the first one we're going to try, well, the first we tried was the humidity and the pressure sensor we talked earlier. Uh, I have a video uh, showing this execution. Uh, here we can see 
uh, a program using this in in native. And yes, in Spanish, but it's, it's pretty simple to translate it. Uh, the first thing is the humidity, that is 76%, and the next one is the temperature, that is 26 degrees, which is a uh, we will expect to have in summer when this was recorded. Uh, and now we're going to try uh, how to use this same program in the in the debugger. And uh, here we can um, we are trying to the debugger here well. Uh, we are loading here the program, and now we are shifting in the go mode, one of the old four modes. As we can see, uh, it's just it's running, and it will never end the execution because uh, when the program is trying to communicate with the device, it is giving him a timeout, so it will never uh, receive the answers it's looking for. So we have no other option that uh, use the command stop to stop the execution. Now we're going to load the program, the same program again, but now executed in the go fast mode. As we can see, uh, we receive a result of 77% humidity to the six degrees, which is more less than the native. So we can con uh, we can see that this uh, that the, that this mode is able to execute the kind of programs without any problem. Uh, finally, uh, as conclusions. Uh, this new execution mode was implemented uh, in a debugger to the book cost to use these kind of peripherals with the strict uh, time constraints. Uh, this, go, this new mode has some mechanisms like the software interrupt handler and the, uh, inter, and the periodic interrupt system. Uh, and in, we saw in the performance evaluation that the times of time were the one we wanted to be able to execute this kind of peripherals. So we are, uh, so the peripherals that devices that we can use with the debugger uh, has been increased. Uh, uh, finally, I want to remember uh, that this is an open source project, so anyone can use it or, or even help in its development. Uh, as we can see here, there is a test suite that I also implemented during this year to check that the functionality of the debugger after doing any changes is what we would expect. So it should be easier to try to develop it or modify anything so that you do any, any kind of test. Uh, if, uh, for that, I want to say that uh, this code is in GitHub and it's also the content information for the main developers. And uh, feel, I want to say that feel free to contact us if you're interested in the project. Um, we will try to help you uh, in any way, we, any matter we can, uh, solve any doubts, uh, or even talk about future developments, because this is not the final state of the tool. It's, con it's continuously in development, and we seek to, to influence, uh, try to have this impact in other universities or anyone that can have a, some kind of use for this tool. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And if there is any question, I will be glad to answer them. And here you have also my mail. So if anyone wants to contact me, there you go. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, David. That's really impressive. I wish, I wish everyone could speed software up 20,000 times. <laughs> thank you. That'd be very helpful. <laughs> So yeah, if any of the more, particularly the more technical programmers want, got any questions, want to throw in now? Or do you want to stop your screen sharing? Or, or it's okay. uh, so, uh, is there a mind where if the uh, first processor, or, or the one that you're running the debugger on, uh, sorry, the other way around, if the program crashes, is it possible to run the debugger on a second Pi so that you could still keep debugging it? Uh, if the program, sorry, I didn't hear you pretty well. Ah, sorry. So if you're, uh, if, if the program that you're debugging crashes, hmm. does the does your uh, system keep running, or, or or could you have a second Raspberry Pi that you use as your debugger? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe the main development that is here can answer this question better. Because it's, uh, I, I, I'm just like a kind of safe developer. 
mean, I know I don't know all the tricks of the system. Yeah, yeah it's, it's the, the sort of thing because you're debugging on the same system that you are running the program on. What happens? Well, when I when I do it like that, if the um, program crashes, it also takes the debugger with it, and so you lose your state. So when I'm debugging things, I usually end up using two systems, so one of them can keep running even if I crash the first one. Um, if if I may, uh, Robert, that's a great question, and uh, well, as uh, I think that the main the main point is that. We were trying to limit the number of devices that we are using at, uh, at the same time, because uh, well, as as David, as David uh, has stated, this is mainly targeted to to students and not well, students, yeah, yeah um, it uh, theoretically, yeah, I don't see why it wouldn't be possible to uh, use it on a separate device, but it would need a lot of work to to reestablish the way uh, things are done. To, to perform, as you say, uh, to, to use a second device, which is acting as a, as a physical debugger, as to say. Uh, right now, I don't think there's any way to, to use it so. Uh, it would need uh, significant changes. I think it would be possible, but um, it's not maybe in a, in a timely fashion to, to achieve. That's funny. I, I thought I would ask us last. My, my debugging method is usually uh, I will use a, a Windows computer with a JTAG, you know, a hardware JTAG emulator, and then that will debug the risk OS system. So when I crash the risk OS system, I can still use the Windows computer to see what went wrong. So I, I thought you might be able to do a, a similar thing with two Raspberry Pis. No, no, it's it's uh, in, in, honestly, it's a, it's a really good proposition. And we have also encountered some, some of our work has been really uh, targeted to making it stable because, uh, well, as you say, one of the problems is that sometimes when uh, when a program crashes down, uh, it takes down the whole system. Um, and our our work has been targeted towards making the uh, the debugger as uh, um, as able to cope with those situations uh, as with with failures in a program as possible. So as to not make it um, unstable, if if the program crashes, still have the debugger, still have the system working. Uh, yeah, there can be still situations in which that's not feasible. Also, I think um, what you are asking is more targeted for when you are using um, more complex programs with with their own graphical interface and so on which is something that currently is not supported. I mean, uh, you can only execute ELF uh, executables without a uh, graphical interface inside the debugger. That's fine. That would, uh, I can entirely understand the, the approach that you've taken, given what you're trying to use it for. <laughs> I, try, I push you to see how, see how whether you have any further plans in, in other directions. Thanks. Thank you for the question. I noticed um, Bernard in the chat mentioned that he did a write-up about UC Debug in the last archive, which um, even for those who aren't subscribers, that's the issue that you can download for free off the website. So. If you want to read some more details, go and look at that. Do we have any more questions? We've got five minutes before the next talk. Uh, just a simple question. Uh, I, I understand that the debugger right now is more targeted to um, single pass code and, and specifically uh, um, code. But there are plans in the future to start um, implementing uh, source code debug for languages like C that could be useful for controlling this kind of stuff. Uh, we have, uh, in the first moment, we don't have this in the plans. We are we want to do is a is a tool for the boy in our ARM code. Uh, I'm not pretty. I'm not sure about, uh, completely of this, but I have. But for what I have heard, the main reason of this is to use this tool in universities for this kind of uh, 
endocardial use. So uh, for it's like for C or, or other kind of languages in university where we use mostly are Windows or Linux systems that they have already their own tools. So I, I don't think it's going to be one of the development courses it will take for the tool. But I think it was a good question. Okay, thank you. All right, in that case, no more questions. Well, thank you again, David and Pablo for dropping in as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming, it's excellent. All right, we've got a few minutes until Viscos bits come along. Um, just wanted to mention, I don't know if people who didn't see earlier, I'll just paste it in the chat. Um, CJ Micros have put up a blog post, it's kind of related to the show and their news. And Chris Evans has said he'll be around at the end of the end, near the, near the end of the show, around 6.30, if people have got questions about CJ stuff, if they want to drop in then. Okay, Matthew in the chat, which link do you want? <laughs> oh. Sorry about that, I had posted a link again, but unfortunately I posted it in a private discussion instead of in the group one. <laughs> All right, Viscos Bits, are you there? Uh, I'm here, Brian. Oh, good. Phew, you have you worried there for a second? Yeah, I, I couldn't understand why you weren't answering, but then I realised I was on mute. That'll be why then. All right, so yeah, a couple of minutes time we got. So if you want to grab drinks or visit the loo before we start, that's a, now is the time. Why have we got a brief pause? Yeah, it's not like a normal show, is it, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> not for me, because normally I thought, yeah. I'm wandering about. This time I'm kind of stuck here. I'm the one person who can't move. Yes. I think I will take this brief moment to wander away. So I'll be back in a second. Chat amongst yourselves. I'm not missing the travelling to London. I'll tell you that. They still can't recreate the atmosphere of a real show, though, can they? <laughs> but they're doing a, a grand job. But actually, thinking about that, it's probably bringing people more more um, to it because they don't have to travel to London. So people that live in different parts of the country, you, have you got have you got more extra people this time that you don't normally see? Mm. There's certainly no way I would have uh, uh, gone for a live show in London, uh, even without the uh, infection. Uh, it's uh, just too too hard work for me now with that amount of travelling. I think there's a there's a position to have with a virtual show, um, but it's nice to get in and talk and socialize which is probably a thing that a lot of us haven't been able to do recently yeah. but, but i think like anything else uh, the team are doing a fantastic job and um, and all the presenters have as well and i was really taken um you know david on the last call was that was fantastic Thank you. 
bit of a candle use uh, but uh, short. Um, I wonder if it could be persuaded to produce something to, to go onto YouTube for us uh, to see what he would have uh, told us about. Okay, right, Andy, I, I'm back and it's now 3.30, so are you ready to go? And I am ready to go. Right, in that case, I'll hand over to Andy from Riscos Bits to tell us about what new exciting named products he's come up with this time. Um, sadly, Brian, they're not as exciting a name as they would normally be and, and definitely not as uh, innuendo laden. So I'm going to share a, a few slides with you and talk you through them as we go in without it being some sort of death from my PowerPoint. Can you all see that? Yes. Good, that's great. So what I'm going to do is a bit of a, a whistle stop tour of some of the things that we've been up to since February. Um, we've got a few completely new things. We've taken some old things and messed about with those and made them a bit better and generally um, brought them a bit more up to date and then we've got some right at the end so you'll have to stick with it for the full duration uh, some special offers for people who are attending the show and those who subscribe to archive magazine so so the newish things we've got we've got um a, a delta pi which is a, a a nice compact case for your raspberry pi that comes with um, special adapters to bring all the ports to the front. You'll know if you've spoken to me before that I hate having ports coming out in different directions. So a lot of the things that I do are about bringing everything out um, in, in one direction, uh, not the band. Um, I've also got some cheap and cheerful things we'll talk about with the Thorin family. For those of you that follow the JRR Tolkien stuff, you might be able to work out where that's going. Um, a, a, a Slim Jim case um, and some disc and ghostly cases. And then we've got some old things that we've we've re-looked out, which is the Pi Hard 4. Um, the uh, pronounce this as you want, Pi Lock Ace. Um, the Pi Pod, which we've upgraded to take a, a, a Pi 4 and some starter kits. And then when we get to the end, we'll talk about the special offers but I'm not going to tell you that much about that now because I do kind of want you to stick around right till the end if that's possible. Okay, so the first thing we've got is the, the Delta Pi, which is about 12 centimeters by 10 centimeters. Um, it, it can fit any model of the Raspberry Pi from the B plus right up to the port Pi 4, and it, it, and it has a, a couple of um, custom adapters to bring the HDMI and the power points to the front. It's kind of a soft D shape and the acrylic that you can see there is, is a kind of glass effect with two uh, gloss black effect end panels held together with um, decorative bolts and the layers are quite useful in terms of cooling the pie inside because there's plenty of airflow through there. Um, it does work out a little bit more expensive for the Pi 4 because the adapter obviously has uh, two HDMI ports, so it costs a little bit more to do that. But they're around the £19 range for the bare case, and then the adapters come in at, at around £15 or thereabouts each. But it's a, a, a real, I would say this, but it's a really nice case that doesn't look out of place on your desk. A bit of passive cooling in there, and you can kind of thrash your pie quite a bit without really suffering any uh, issues with that. The next one is the Thorin, which is a, a, an oaken shield for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and again, there are three versions. There's, there's a, a, a nut logo, a, a berry logo, and a cog logo. And the cutouts are positioned as best they could be over the uh, warmest parts of the pie. And there are two different versions. There's one for the Pi 4 where the uh, USB ports and the network ports have swapped over. And there's one for the B plus 
through to the 3B plus. Um, and they are made from oak veneered um, MDF. Even the spaces between the two layers are made from oak veneer MDF. And it, it's quite an, uh, an easy and cheap case. And we will be selling those for roughly around a fiver plus postage. So if you've got a bit of spare change down the back of your settee and you're looking for something a bit more interesting, then you could do a lot worse than that. It, it fairly simple design works fairly well uh, I've been using one with the Pi 4 for quite a while doesn't particularly get very warm again there's enough airflow through there a couple of passive heat sinks and it's all pretty good really um, we've also developed some add-on bits for that so there's an SSD sort of tray that fits underneath you remove the bottom of the um, original foreign and screw it down onto a tray that contains a hard drive, usually an SSD. Um, again, fairly easy to fit, fairly simple to put together. Makes things a bit tidier. I, I, I have sort of weakened my stance on all ports coming out on, on the same side there because, well, I don't know, what do you want for a fiber? Um, but it, it just protects it when it's on your desk. It keeps it nice and safe. And it's quite cool. The one at the top that you can see on there is um, a, a Max kit, which is a separate kit altogether, which has two full size HDMI ports built in, uh, audio out, and uh, a USB C port all brought to the front, and a spare USB port at the back with the hard drive sitting underneath um, the Pi and the uh, custom adapter board. So again, that's around 30 quid for that um, with the adapter thrown in. Um, you provide the pie, you provide everything else. It's a really cheap way to, to make your pie uh, considerably more functional. And that is only available for uh, the Pi 4. There, there is no adapter board for that, for the, for the Pi B plus through to the 3B, um, because in, in my head, there, there seemed to be no point. And that one's also available in, in a nice glass effect acrylic as well. If you want to see the bits underneath, then you can do. That'll be uh, fairly straightforward to do that. Uh, the Slim Jim was named in honour of, of Jim Nagel. I had a couple of other ideas for names, but uh, a few people in the community said, why don't you call it this? So, OK, I, I will call it that. And it's more of a, a, a wireless media center type case for the, uh, the Pi, either the earlier versions or the Pi 4. And, and you can get an SSD in there, um, a four port hub and an LSR Wi-Fi hat if you want. Uh, as you can obviously see there, there's a model for the um, iJet version 5 as well. Uh, and you can get that without um, the extra four port hub for the rear. Um, there's, there's perhaps enough ports on the iJet 5 to make that fairly straightforward. It mainly comes in clear, but there are options to get that in, in various different colours, really, depending on what you want. Um, but the, the ones that we, we run off as a matter of routine generally come in clear. Um, we are going to redevelop this a little bit for the Pi 4 so that we can use the adapter that I showed you on the previous page. Uh, and get all that inside by side and still fit in um, uh, an SSD, but then there'd be no need for the hub at the rear. So I'm kind of going back to the all ports coming out on one side option. Um, but yeah, other colours are available as you want. Okay, and, and I was kind of a little bit bored earlier on during the uh, early days of the lockdown. Um, so I came up with something um, I don't know, silly, um, which were these, but they've, they've really taken off um, to some degree um, in other places. So it, and they're, they've got cutouts for all Pi models. Uh, and it, uh, the intention was to, to kind of move away from the square box type approach to everything. Um, and the, the ghostly ones that you can see there do come in what those colours are pretty luminous 
um, for want of a better word, if, if you, it doesn't really show up on the picture, but if you see them in real life, the edges really glow on those. Um, it is quite sort of sick inducing, really. But again, th those can be made in, in different colours or, or whatever you want. Part of the thing with, with this, again, was to move um, some of the, the stuff that I do, um, not necessarily away from the risk cost market, but to other markets. So we opened up a little Etsy shop and things like this and the things I'll show you on the next slide have gone really well on there. Um, whereas um, we, we kind of struggled a bit with the other colour for this one, because normally if you remember the game, from the early 1980s, there would have been four of these. But getting luminous pink acrylic seems to be really tricky. Getting very bright pink acrylic isn't too difficult, but getting luminous pink acrylic is a bit tricky, so I didn't want to pollute it. And then the disc models were just simple round Raspberry Pi cases. Again, they're layered for ventilation. They'll fit anything from the B plus right up to the um, 4B. Where these seem to have taken off is people have said, I really like that, but could you do it in this colour? Could you do this engraving? Could you turn, in one case, the raspberry round so that it's the other way? <clears throat> so I, I don't know whether it's um, a, a risk cost type thing that we're a little bit conservative about what we do, but people outside of the usual risk cost market seem to be um, quite liking these and quite liking that, that option to customise it and do something that's not quite as traditional um, as we'd normally expect, really. So the, the ghost ones um, are currently available at about 22 quid, whereas as the disc ones are around £19. Uh, that includes all the bits that you need. Um, you just put it together, really, and it's, again, not particularly difficult, as long as you peel the plastic off first. Some people have struggled with that ended up sticking things together and wondering why they can't get the white sheet off. Okay, so the next one is the, the if you've seen the Twitter stuff, it's the Beast on a Budget, which is a, a Raspberry Pi 4 um, inside um, a, a custom version of the Delta case that I showed you earlier. So it's just um, grown up a little bit. Again, it uses that, that custom adapter to um, bring all the ports to the front. Uh, and, and it has got the twin full-size HDMI ports rather than relying on people trying to go off and source micro HDMI leads or adapters. It has an integrated two and a half inch SSD. Um, so that's built in. And obviously, um, it, the Pi 4 hasn't got yet any kind of native um, drive support other than the SD card. So it is powered over a USB, but the adapter gives quite good benchmarks on that. It's not ever going to be sort of native SATA speeds, but it's not either native SATA prices. And that, that will be available in the um, two, four or eight gigabyte models. As you can see there, it's based around the glass look acrylic slices again, and it's got um, a nice um, wooden edge plate that all fits in with that. Um, based on sort of a uh, walnut veneer, really. There's room inside for hats, such as the Wi Fi hats. There's room inside for another Pi, which creates some issues in powering it, but it is possible to get two Pis within the same case. And there's a separate shelf in there as well for the SSD to be mounted on. And in RISC PC um, tradition, you can kind of mount that either horizontally on your desk and lay it down, or you can stand it up. It, it's kind of up to you. We are going to do other cases from our range to fit that in some way, such as I mentioned the Slim Jim, but the older Juice cases and things like that. And we're going to uh, build a plate so that it can be fitted into a standard ITX case so that if you want that, that traditional conservative desktop look for your Raspberry Pi, then that's also OK. So there are a few benchmarks there. You can see that it, it's kind of doing quite well in terms of the processor and the memory speed. 
it's we're around sort of the upper mark for what we expect from risk cost machines and that's that's currently when it's just running at 1.5 gig it's relatively easy with a bit of uh, cooling to up that to 2.1 and then things really do seem to fly at that point obviously with the disk speed that's going to be slow because it's over usb and the closest thing i could think to comparing it to that was available widely was the uh, pi desktop from um, one of the bigger electronics companies and uh, as you can see from the benchmarks that i took there it's um, significantly better than what they can achieve with theirs so it, it does feel like a very fast machine but there are some issues with disk access but unless you're doing something particularly disk intensive you kind of don't really notice that it, it seems to do much better um than the the disk benchmarks let you believe now the crunch for this the reason we've called it the beast on a budget is because it's 199 quid or it starts from 199 quid and for that you get the pi 4 the case 120 gig ssd everything you need to get going really if you want to up the ssd to 240 gig that's okay if you want a bigger micro sd card you could if you wanted that's okay if you want wi-fi built in there'll be a charge but that's okay all those things to make it your standard budget conscious desktop machine is all available on the um the website form so that you can work out what it is what you want and we'll give you a quote for that machine and if you if you don't do that now though it might be useful because there's a bit of an offer at the end on this it might make it a bit easier for you okay so the next one is one of the first things we did was the um however you pronounce it the pylock ace which we've kind of redesigned for the pi 3 and pi 4. we've put in some extra ventilation in there um, to keep it cool and as we know the pi 4 runs a bit hot uh, but again passive heat sinks and the way the case has been designed with honeycomb ventilation seems to keep the temperature down quite a bit if you if you want an active fan then we can do that we've got lids with the middle of the cog is a hole and we can mount a fan in there or we can put fans inside that you can't necessarily see that still keep the uh, the pie cool generally it comes in black if you want different colors well we're happy to do that and again we're using the custom adapters that you can see on the delta case to bring all the ports to one side so it's fairly straightforward in terms of how we do that with the pi 3 with the pi 4 we're using a custom pcb to do that and you might be able to see from that picture there that, that there's the two micro hdmi ports and the usb c port we couldn't up those two hdmi full hdmi couldn't kind of fit it in the uh, the case as it stood and then the first thing we ever did, the Pi Pod, which originally came out with, I believe, a Pi 2. Um, we've now adjusted that to the Pi 4, and you can see the adapter board there a little bit better with the two micro HDMIs and the USB C. It'll fit into any module slot on your RISC PC or an Archimedes. Somebody did put it inside uh, an A3000, but I think they struggled a bit with that. Um, later machines. Uh, perhaps not the um, A3010s or A3020s, it's, it's relatively straightforward. You just need the screws out of the blanking plate and you're away. Um, with the Pi 4, you can obviously have the two gigabyte, four gigabyte or eight gigabyte options. And it can be powered internally from the GPIO or externally using the uh, USB-C port, but do not do both at the same time. That won't end well for anybody. It does, though, and that give you the option to either run it concurrently with your RISC PC or run it separately without it using your RISC PC as a huge oversized Raspberry Pi 4 case. Um, but if that's what people want to do, that's OK. And, and for those people who are, who are perhaps using uh, RISC PCs and aren't really sure about dabbling with risc 5 or something newer, it's an easy way of integrating both. And the software that we supply allows you to see 
either the risk pc in a window on the raspberry pi which makes more sense or see the raspberry pi in a window on the risk pc a bit like uh, andrew's um dual motherboard machine from earlier kind of using the same software doing it that way um and being able to share resources between the two in a in a very similar way and the last one is is we do the um custom uh, cheap starter kits for people who want to get into risk os um and we've moved those along to the pi 4 and decided to use the um Thorin cases for those. And we, we can do those just as a, a core model, which is just a Raspberry Pi, a case, a micro SD. Or we can do it as a, a plus model where you supply your own um, SSD and we'll supply the adapter and the case to fit. Or we do a max model where you get the uh, bigger Thorin case with the adapter where the SSD slip slots underneath. We also do those with the key, a wireless keyboard and mouse, a power supply, and the necessary cables to make your own uh, risk or starter kit. Where if you're not really sure, you haven't tried it before, put it all together, and away you go. So it, it's a, a an all-in-one solution, if you like. But now it's moved on to the Pi Four, and we won't be doing Pi Three versions of those anymore. Okay. So our, our special offers then. Um, we've got a couple of lightly used pine box with uh, pine books with RISCOS software, and we do um, carbon fiber effect protective skins for the uh, pine book, and we're bundling those together for the price that we would normally charge for the pine book itself. We've got a couple of uh, quadro, uh, which are one board quads inside an oak juice case. Um, a couple of pie top twos running RISCOS. And we've got three of the uh, Delta cased Pi hards that I showed you earlier. There's a special offer in archive this month when it comes out. If you quote me that code, you'll get a little bit of a discount on those. And then we've got three Pyro starter kits with a 10% discount. So if you're interested in any of those, we're going to deal with those on a first come, first serve basis and um, get in touch via the website and we'll see what we can do. Oh. Okay. Anybody got any questions? Brilliant, then I've done my job and I'll see you later. Andy, um, yes. you had on sale once Whiskey with the um, built in Wi Fi. Yep. So are you moving away from that sort of wispy to a more hat type Wi-Fi? Not particularly. Um, for, for those people that, that have got Raspberry Pis, then the hat is sometimes the tidier option, I guess, especially if it's it's boxed inside a case. We've still got the, the, the wispy Vs, as we did have before, for those people that with arm books, for example, or things where there is no option to put it inside a case in an easy way. So we're, we're not moving away from those, where we're just giving people the option, really. So again, I, I guess I'm back to the, I really like it tidy. So for those people that want things that are tidy, and the hat is obviously an option there. Do you kind of make all these cases yourself? Do you, do you have a, a you know, cutting machine out the back or something? Are you? I, I have a cutting machine down the road that, that's operated by two very nice people for me um so and they're, they're very good at being very responsive when i turn up with a load of sheets or acrylic and go can you do me 15 of these <laughs> so yeah how much but, yeah i am making all those cases cases myself yeah i wonder how much acrylic you end up using every time you kind of come up with a new idea with 15 different prototypes before it actually works yeah i, I do worry that i've killed several dolphins at this point if i'm honest <laughs> Uh, Andy, is that one of your um, is that one of your new uh, ghost machines behind your shoulder? I can see. It, it is, yeah. In fact, I've got one here that'll show you just how garish it really is. <laughs> it, it actually it does glow, and that's the 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 sort of the lightest one of the two. If I'm honest, that that's the one that's the the least luminous. Yeah. Um, on, on that, Andy, 
it'd yeah. be a good idea to have a little leg light shining out to give it an even better effect, wouldn't it? Well, one of the things we thought about was using one of the um, you know, the LED fans that, that people are using, um, but it kind of overwhelms it a bit, and the, the, the brightness of the fan. But yeah, LEDs in there would be, oh, what's that word I'm looking for? Absolutely hideous, I think. But if people wanted to do that, who am I to stop them? And for those of you that are interested in the um, the beast on a budget, the pie hard, I've got one here, which is pre-built, so you can kind of see the size, the the D shape, um, the adapters inside there, kind of makes it fairly straightforward what you can what you get and how. Even if I do say so myself, how how good it looks and how sophisticated it looks as some sort of 1920s Art Deco piece stood on the side of your desk. Those curved sides are very Art Deco, aren't they? Very... They are, yeah. <laughs> right, if no one's got any more questions, thank you very much, Andy. And uh, maybe post a link to your website in the chat or something. So that I shall do that, yep. Jump there and go and have a look at what's on offer. Okay, okay. I've just updated it so people can do that whenever they're ready. Excellent. And look out for the special offers in archive, of course. Yep. That's the one. Excellent. Right, now we've got a couple of minutes, or oh, only a couple of minutes until this got open. Now, where is it? Mark wanted to mention something about the icon bar. Where are you, Mark? I'm here. So okay. <laughs> thanks for a great show, Brian, by the way. I think you deserve a lot of credit for it. Just about okay. working, isn't it? It's hanging together. So my name's Mark Stevens, and I'm the guy who writes articles on Icon Bar. And something we've been doing in the last lockdown, lock up, lockdown, whatever, whatever you call it, and we'd like to do in the next one, is we've been posting articles, pictures of people's setups on computers. So we've had Justin Fletcher, we've had Sprow, we've had um, Andy posting up uh, how they use their computer, what software they use, and a picture of what they've been doing. I'm posting that into the um, chat window now. So if you're interested in sending me a picture, sending me a write-up, I'd love to run your article on Icon Bar. Um, share what you've been up to with the rest of the community, and it'd be really interesting to see. So thanks for my plug, Brian, and don't let Vince get in with anything. <laughs> I was just about to try sharing my desktop, but... Yet again, Zoom is refusing to share my VNC connection to my desktop, so I can't. <laughs> so uh, I won't do that. Right, Steve, Steve Revel, are you there? I am indeed. Hello. Hey. Oh, we've got half a banner in the background. Yep. Your banner I've, uh, dis the, the, the banners have been geographically distributed. <laughs> well, I've got just a couple of minutes to go. We'll wait till. We might as well let's try and stay on time. It's a novel thing to do. Half uh, Steve. There we go. There's the other half. I'm sitting the wrong round. You need to sit on the other side. That's true. I should do that, shouldn't I? Now, I've, I've put it there strategically to block the lights, otherwise they dazzle the camera. Good move. Vince trying to come up with more silly names for products in the chat, yeah. <laughs> right, there we are. Bang on time, it's just ticked over to four o'clock. So I'll now hand over to Steve Revel to tell us what risk or open have been up to. Take it away. Hello. Steve. Hi. So pleased to be here. Uh, 
what a crazy year it's been. Uh, I want to say a huge thank you first to the uh, London show organisers for making this all possible. Um, and thanks to everyone who's watching for your interest. Uh, I'm Steve Reville from Risk OS Open. Uh, we're also known as Rule to the community. Uh, I'm virtually joined by Rob Sproson, wearing his Rule hat this afternoon. Uh, you'll have seen him earlier today as LSR. Um, and for those of you who are new to the scene, Riscos Open's mission is to be the hub of the Riscos community and to guide the evolution of the platform, both to embrace change and to preserve the things that we believe make RiscOS special. And today, I want to give you a flavour of what's been achieved this year, despite circumstances. Okay, so I'll share a screen first, and we can go into PowerPoint, which everyone loves. So I want to talk first about bounties, what the bounty scheme is, and how things are looking there. And then I'll talk a little bit about RISC-OS 528, which is the new stable release of the operating system. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the development environment and look to the future. What, what do we see coming? What are we working on behind the scenes? And then open the floor if you have any questions. So bounties are RISCOS Open's way. We're a not-for-profit organization and they're our way of helping to fund developments that otherwise we feel would be difficult to see progress in. And since we started doing bounties in 2011, the community has very generously donated over 68,000 pounds. And this money basically stays in pots until the development that we see or the events that we would like to sponsor uh, have the opportunity to happen. And then we can give that money to the people who make it happen. So rule doesn't keep that money. We just look after it until it's given to a, a proper home. And we try and make sure that everyone is clear uh, about what the bounties are for, how we believe, what we believe good looks like, and roughly what we think it would take in terms of donations into a pot to make a particular bounty happen. And to date, we've seen seven major bounties completed. There are currently three still in flight, um, and there are six that are collecting money. And hopefully when they reach a tipping point where someone feels like they're ready to claim it, those will also move into the in-progress state. And a lot of what's happened this year the quality of life improvements that we see in the operating system are directly a result of the bounty work that we've been sponsoring. And for example, we've got uh, improvements in paint still undergoing progress, although I'll show you some of the things that have already hit Risk OS. And we've got improvements in its underlying filing system and the support for image formats that are common in the real world and have yet to really have native support within the operating system widespread. Um, so ping images, we're looking to move those into the paint application and the change FSI applications. So you can see here, one of the key things that we would like to see happen in paint in the near future is an undo redo future feature, which I think we've been waiting for for probably well over 25 years. It will be fantastic to see that finally happen, um, an improved brush and text tool features, um, which anyone who's used the brush tool will know it's a little bit limited in its current implementation. So this is adding a lot of polish to that. The filing system is kind of a low level thing, but it's fundamental to interacting with an operating system is where do you put your files? What formats can it support? Uh, how big can your storage be? How big can the files be? Uh, this stuff increases every year. So RISC-OS needs to change to keep up with the state of play. And there's a series of improvements that we have un underway and planned for the filing system. And it's great to see that actually making progress. We are collecting for these. I'm not going to go into great detail if you're interested in understanding what these are all about. They are documented on our website at riscosopen.org. So by all means, go and have a look at these things. 
Uh, some of it is foundational. Some of it is about evolving the operating system to support newer standards. Uh, and some of it is about helping the people who are developing RiskIS, so the people who are adding the new features, giving them some of the features that they need to continue doing what they do. Uh, I note there are some things in the chat. I'm afraid I'm not able to read it right now, but I will circle back in the questions. Here's where things look in terms of totals. So if these are the ones that are still collecting and we make a guess, we call it a target. This is our guess about how big does a bounty need to get in terms of how much money has been donated into it before we feel that it's reached a level where the amount of work that it would take to deliver that bounty could be achieved at somewhere around minimum wages. Um, so there's no guarantee that when we hit the target, the bounty will be claimed. It's just an indication of where we think a reasonable level of compensation for someone's work sits. So these bounties here, we can see that we're making progress towards them. And uh, uh, if you come and look at our bounty site, you will be able to donate towards these bounties uh, whenever you see the opportunity. And you don't have to, but whenever you do, that is very much appreciated. And I would like to say another thank you to everyone who has supported us in running this scheme since 2011. I think it has been a great success. RISC-S 528, this is the new release, a stable release of the operating system. So we run a cycle where the odd numbered releases are in a constant state of development and evolution. And when it hits an even number, we basically freeze the developments there and create a release of the operating system that has been tested on a wide range of platforms and is, we, we believe, is of the right quality level to be uh, described as a stable release. And this version was slightly delayed from where we were hoping to achieve it. We wanted to get this out sometime earlier this year, but many events have come along to uh, make life a bit more challenging. Uh, one of the main things was me, of course. I said to the team that what I would like to do is hold off making this release until we know it's stable on the Raspberry Pi 4. And there was quite a lot of work required because it's quite a significantly different platform to the earlier Raspberry Pis. So that was one of the main reasons that took us a little bit longer to get this into where we believe is a stable state than would normally be. So typically they are about 18 months apart, these stable releases. And we did allow extra time to all of the various different ports of RISC-OS, all of the different platforms, because we don't maintain them all. We ask their maintainers to help um, round off any rough edges for their particular port. Um, we allowed a bit of extra time for that to happen. And we've got most of the well-known ports are now in the stable release category. Uh, there are a few that didn't quite make the cut and they don't join the 528 release. So overall, there are over well over 300 improvements. There's a whole load of bugs that we fixed and we've got six of the eight main platforms have achieved what we set as the stable release criteria. And it takes almost 100 hours behind the scenes at Riscos Open to pull this all together. And the people who, from the community, who are doing the bulk of the work of adding these features, fixing the bugs, testing it all for us, uh, even helping with some of the documentation, there's many, many hundreds of hours of voluntary work happening there, in addition to the bounties, bounties that we sponsored. All of that is pulled together into what forms this stable release. And the main bounties that contributed here were the work on paint, uh, bringing the network security into this century, um, clipboard support, and compiler work for developers. And of course, there is the Raspberry Pi 4 support. So most of you all know about the Pi 4 Model B, and it is, as I said, quite different to preceding Raspberry Pis, it's certainly their most powerful computer 
and it has a giganet, gigabit Ethernet chip, which required the writing of a new Ethernet driver. And all of the way that the USB system works was entirely different. So that needed significant rewriting as well. So I'll just switch over to a demo. Hopefully you guys will be able to see this. Before I start the demo, what I would like to say is this was captured. So the plumbing between my Raspberry Pi and you guys is such that if you see any teary movement uh, graphics updates when I'm moving windows, if you see any juddery scrolling, that is entirely plumbing. Everyone who's used to RiskOS will know, hopefully, that it's normally uh, lightning fast at screen updates. So don't take that as what RiskOS looks like, please. What I'd like to start here with is uh, showing you that, well, this is our website, but I'd like to show you the task manager window first of all. So what I want to show you is on the Raspberry Pi 4, we have oodles of memory by RISC-OS standards. There's, don't know what you'd do with all of that for RISC-OS. It's typically very lean with its memory usage, as you can see from those applications. And the window here, you can scroll up and down with a mouse wheel which is one of those quality of life improvements that we take for granted on other operating systems. We also added a new ethernet driver to RiskOS 528 for the Raspberry Pi 4. And there's not much to show you here other than here it is running. Here's, it's an ethernet driver. It connects you to the internet, but it's a gigabit ethernet. So it's much higher performance than previous RiskOS versions. Paint has had a number of improvements here. So what we can do here is we can create a new sprite in paint and I'm gonna use the new copy and paste facility, the clipboard in writable icons. And we're gonna create a very simple graphic. Um, please excuse my artistic or lack of artistic skills. I just want to show you a few of the new features in paint here. If you look in the bottom right of the bottom left of this window, we've got some little uh, indicators of what the current foreground and background colors are. And as I draw this really terrible rendition of a house, you'll be able to see those colors changing to reflect what I am drawing on the into the sprite. I can shift click into the sprite like this, uh, which ev effectively acts a bit like a pipette tool, which you'll be familiar with from other graphics packages. And it allows me to pick foreground and background uh, colors out of the image just by shift left or shift, shift right clicking in the image. There is also a new feature for the move tool, which allows you to wrap the image. So here I can move the image around and you'll see it wraps at the edges, which is saves it all just cropping and introducing empty space into where it's moved. Now draw has also been improved. And one of the things I'd like to show you here is how we can copy and paste between applications. So part of the clipboard improvements are that we can just move graphics and documents and text between different programs natively in the operating system. Um, we've had this feature in edit for quite some time now, and we've shown the love to the other applications and built in features of the operating system to support this as well. So I'm using a lot of copy and paste here. And if I open an edit window, hang on a minute. Let me just show you this choices. I do want to show you choices. None of these built-in applications used to have a mechanism for saving their setup. Whereas now we've added choices to both paint and draw and edit. So you can see here, set it up the way you want it. And every time you run, it'll be set up that way. Now copy and paste still extends to edit, but I can also do it from writable icons. So here I'll just take the name of this sprite, drag it, drop it into edit, and you can see I've just moved it into the document. I can do the same thing here. I can control C, I can copy, control V, paste it, and there it is in draw. And as I said, with the other applications, we've got the ability to save choices. So every setting that you set up in edit, you can save those choices. And one of the other applications that has seen a little bit of love 
is Maestro. And this is our tool for creating and playing back musical compositions. Uh, hang on a sec, let's just get rid of this. Here we go. And this has been brought streaming into the late 90s, early noughties with a style guide compliant user interface. If, if you'll allow me, I'll say the, uh, the old interface used to look pretty ugly and now it's been completely updated so that it looks in keeping with the rest of the operating system. Okay. So that is what RISC-OS looks like nowadays, RISC-OS 5.2.8. I'll move on by talking about the user guide. So we have a range of published materials and the user guide was created as a community effort where many people from across the community contributed into writing this in the first place and updating it. And every stable release, we release a new edit of the user guide. And this is no different. I have it on my bookshelf behind me. It's a large volume. Uh, it's printed. Um, it's printed using. Oh, hang on. Just getting an interruption there. Yeah, it's printed at cost price effectively, and we sell it through our website or through Amazon. So feel free to pick up a copy of this if you don't already have it. The DDE is our development environment. So everyone who writes code for RISC-OS and who wants to contribute into the source code of RISC-OS uh, build their own distributions. They require the DDE and it is sold on our website for a significantly reduced price from its historical price. For licensing reasons, we can't give this away for free, but we do maintain it. And we do actively work on this and add new features. So the DDE has a new version of the basic compiler, which has been brought up to date with the latest basic language features. And the manual has been brought up to date as well. And we've included um, this in the cut down basic DDE. So this is sponsored by Riscos.fura, France. So thank you very much to those guys. The C compiler has also been significantly updated. There's too many changes for me to list here, uh, but they are fully documented in the manual that you can get for this. And this is important to us. It's very important to us because we believe part of the future of RISC-OS is to move it away from being written purely in machine code assembly language and modernizing the OS and bringing it to new platforms and new hardware Increasingly, it becomes important to write the key features in C and because C is far more portable. So adding new language features to C helps people, helps developers to do the, the work that they need to do when they're writing new code or whether they're uh, updating our existing assembly language code to be re-implemented in C. And we want to make things run faster. So by using the features of the chips that come in modern processors like the Raspberry Pi 4 by allowing our compiler to output those new features, those new instruction sets, we can uh, allow the code to make the best use of the system that it's running on. So this is one of the side effects of the work that we've been doing is potentially on different platforms, it will allow your programs to run faster. So what are we thinking about next? Well, we're looking at multi-core support. Most modern processors have more than one core and RISC OS, broadly speaking, is a single core operating system. Uh, on the Raspberry Pi 4, the cores that are not being used are just sat there largely asleep um, for the whole time that you're using the system. So it's you can see that if we could find a way to make RISC OS run across multiple cores, it would pr provide significant performance improvements. And it's wide ranging changes, it's hard work, there's significant plumbing effort to allow that to happen, uh, but that's definitely something we're focusing on. Multiple monitor support is something else that we would like to see supported natively in the operating system. There are already several hardware platforms that have multiple um, video outputs, 
but Risk OS at the moment cannot natively drive those. It only supports one at the moment. So that is another significant improvement we would like to see happen. Basic, the language that has been with Risk OS since the start, built into the operating system, um, is probably due a bit more love from us. And we've been thinking quite hard with uh, a couple of other people about how we can bring that language forward. What, what can we do to modernize it and to improve it? And one of the things we're particularly focused on is to add structured types and to add support for dynamic memory allocation and deallocation. And we're aware of different dialects of BASIC and the way they implement some of these features. And we're looking to do something which is in keeping with the ethos of what we believe BBC BASIC is all about. So we're working on a roadmap of language improvements there. And we're also, as I said earlier, we're looking at the problem of architectural uh, processor architectures changing over time. So we're looking at how if with Raspberry Pi 4, Raspberry Pi 5 down the road, Raspberry Pi 6, there's bound to be more. There'll be other platforms that we look at with the OMAP platforms. We're interested in seeing the direction of travel for the ARM architecture is typically starting to move away from being 32 bits, which is what RISC-OS assumes. So all of that code sat under the hood in RISC-OS that's written in assembly language is very much written targeting 32-bit processors. So as we move increasingly to a world of 64-bit processors, we'll find that there will be start to be processors that we cannot possibly run RISC-OS on without doing significant amounts of work. So what we're always interested in is how do we stay ahead of the curve there? What things can we do to lay the foundations of allowing RISC-OS to migrate to a 64-bit future? We want to make that as seamless as we can, uh, and it will be big and difficult uh, challenge, but that's something we're very much focused on. Okay, that's it from me. Uh, any questions? One, when DD30 is going to be available to purchase ICT? <laughs> Within the next couple of days on our website, hopefully. Thanks. I've got a question. Hi, ah, yes. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, on the website, under the latest news, you've got the item charting our way 24th of May. Now, that won't look good for people, you know, outsiders coming to the rural platform if it's, you know, five months ago. I mean, why isn't that being updated? I mean, there must be news since then. The coronavirus hasn't knocked out all, all our news. Yeah, it's worth noting we're not a news site, we're a community hub. Most of the life in RISC-OS Open is on the forums, which I think you'll find uh, get updated all the time. Every hour of every day, there are new things happening there. The RISC-OS Open news sites is basically what we within the rule team uh, are wanting to let you know is significant about what we have achieved at RISC-OS Open with the help of the community. So for example, key releases like new DDE releases, new operating system releases, um, anything like that, new new products and new um, books. So th really that's very much about what Risk OS Open is doing, not what Risk OS is doing. Now I agree that, that there is a lot that's happening in the community in the Risk OS scene, and there are new sites, and we do link to them on the front page, that are better served with giving you regular updates of what's happening in the uh, risk OS scene. So when 4.28 comes out, will you put that in latest news? Uh, 528 is in the five, five, latest news eight. right now. If yeah. you refresh your page, it's right there. Oh, is it? Fantastic. On latest news? Yes. Ah. We're fractionally ahead of the curve there. <laughs> ah. But yeah, I mean, if anyone feels uh, like they have ideas of things that they know that we've been involved in or that are happening that are significant and worth us mentioning, please do get in touch with us. And we'll certainly consider whether we should put that in our newsfeed as well. Because you're right, you don't want it to look stale. Um, but again, we're not trying to be the RISCOS news site. I have a question about the multi-core support. 
Uh, are you uh, talking there about the module that uh, Jeffrey Lee is working on, or you are working on your own? Another no, I'm the, the former. I am talking about Jeffrey Lee's module. Okay. So yes, we're we're watching that with great interest, and uh, wherever possible, we do co collaborate, and we do try to um, provide our advice or be there if any questions need to be asked. Um, we're, we're trying to mostly steer the development of RISCOS. We, we, most of the people involved in RISCOS Open do not have the time to be the ones that actually make the changes to RISCOS. That's why we're so dependent on this community and so keen to do what we can to support it. And Jeffrey Lee, as you know, has been transformational for the operating system. Um, we certainly encourage and support that. Uh Quick question about the future, uh, Steve. So, yes. and I ask it also to uh, RISCOS development, et cetera. For developers like me that don't have a lot of time to code on RISCOS, for those who have a job, <laughs> um, yep. where do you suggest us to focus the most for the future? ELF format, AIF, and if AIF, are we going to have a DLL and shared library for AIF as well? And will they be supported natively? So where should we put our energies to have max profit, you know, for the community and, and for ourselves? Yeah. So, so is, is your question specifically about is it ELF versus AIF? Right. Okay. Good question. Uh, I suggest you get in touch with us and we could probably have that conversation and say what, what we think is best, uh, you know, from, from a perspective of not only of where risk OS come from, but in the perspective of where does it need to go in the future and why. And I'm sure you've got some kind of strong feelings or you may have some beliefs about one it has more benefits over the other. And we will be very open to discussing those and understanding your views. But I mean, adding these features to the DDE is probably a logical thing as well, making sure we fully support them. Um, so, and as the main maintainers of the DDE, I think we would want to be and need to be involved in that decision and that conversation. Uh, and we would certainly be very interested in talking to you about it. Thank you very much. Uh, Last <coughs> question. Steve. Oh, sorry, Paolo, one more question before we sw swap over. Oh, yeah. I've got a question. I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, David. I'll just let Paolo okay. finish. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, as you probably noticed, I'm, I'm heavily involved in AI and I'm putting a lot of libraries now to risk cost because I strongly believe that the cooperative multitasking offers uh, better uh, latency for some of these applications. Not all we will test with Jeffrey library will be available and will support uh, yep. button point. And this is the, uh, the, the, the specific of this question and I apologize, it, it's very specific, it's very software development oriented, but when are we gonna have support for C at least C programming language uh, for the uh, VFP and how good this is going to be because I really depend on that. Yeah, Rob, do we still have Rob Sproson here? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think I heard VFP. Did I? Yes, when's, when's the C compiler gonna support VFP? Uh, so I did talk to uh, um, Ben about that um, probably a couple of years ago um, and in principle there's nothing stopping the compiler being modified um, because it was always intended to be agnostic of which processor it targets. You know, that was the guys at Norcroft designed it that way. Um, but when you dig into it a bit further, it's all the supporting uh, framework around that. It's, it's nothing particularly related to the compiler. So without going and finding the notes, uh, the two that I can remember are um, that there's one of the VFPs require you to have uh, all of your instructions on, sorry, all of your uh, data on eight byte boundaries, which isn't currently enforced by any of the other parts of risk So if you were halfway through a module, suddenly you, you needed to do a floating point operation, you would find that your stack pointer was not a multiple of eight and it would all fall over. Um, so that there are some uh, changes in that regard uh, to risk us in order to support it, support it natively. And also um, a lot of the uh, FPA stuff at the moment relies on uh, the transcendental functions. I'm trying to remember what the word was. Uh, so like sine and cosine and, and tan are all transcendental functions. 
and there isn't a direct equivalent of those in BFP. So you would need to have a software floating point library that re-implemented those. So those are the two things that spring to my mind off the top of my head. I don't think you know, the compiler spitting out the opcodes isn't the hard part of the equation. Uh, it's it's a small it's, it's it's a part of the equation, but it's not the biggest part. I, I personally, I think that this is another really good conversation that we could have. Um, so yeah, I would again encourage you to get in touch, and we can talk you through what we understand of this, and we could well, see if there's a, a path that we can map. Or at the very least, dig out Ben's notes and send them back. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chris. And so, Paolo, if you're looking for the thing to focus on, it might be that we find something there that is the thing to focus on first. So let's have a have sure. a chat. Thank oh. you. David. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, NVIDIA are proposing to take over ARM by lock, stock and barrel. Herman Hauser is running a campaign to frustrate that and hopes to get the support of the government. Um, will if NVIDIA succeed in taking over ARM, will that have any bad effects for RISCOS or you know, having to run always on an ARM processor? This, uh, this is where my crystal ball gets rather cloudy. Um, I, I would imagine that NVIDIA wouldn't do anything too radical too quickly because you know, there are billions of ARM cores across the world used by some rather large name customers and a lot of very small niche people such as ourselves. Um, and I think NVIDIA would need to tread quite carefully not to turn the world on its head. <laughs> so I would hope that we would see them plotting a fairly transparent future for the ARM architecture that people can still continue to take advantage of even if you might see them also adding architectural features that are quite specific and bespoke to them and perhaps proprietary, and maybe we wouldn't be able to leverage those quite so well. But the, the core architecture, I would hope for many years yet, whether or not it goes to NVIDIA, would still be something that we will find in other processes, non-NVIDIA processes. I would imagine that they will still be able to license the architecture from NVIDIA. So I personally, if I had to pick a camp, I would say it would be great to keep that as a piece of British engineering, British intellectual property. Uh, but that's, we're into global geopolitics and I'm afraid I'm unlikely to influence the outcome, but my, I remain optimistic that RiskOS has many years ahead, whichever way it goes. If I can add a little, uh... It's actually just out of the ARM View Summit, and NVIDIA officially confirmed that they are not going to do anything to the uh, ARM architecture publicly to all of us. So uh, it's official. They, they, they're going to leave it as it is. There's going to be some changes, but they're going to be mostly on the GPU side. And those, frankly, are welcome because obviously NVIDIA has very powerful GPU unit. We benefit a lot because if we will manage Maybe work there in terms of gaming, in terms of uh, graphic applications and all the stuff, video uh, playing. So right now, except from the 64-bit issue, the, the future looks very bright. So. There, there have been a lot of questions in the chat. I'm afraid I haven't had time to skim through and see what people have said. Has anyone got any uh, highlights from there that you'd really like me to chip in on? Trivial one, Steve. I've been trying to type in replies as they go. So if there okay. are any that I've, there might have been some I missed because I'm not that fast at reading. So if there, if there were some missed, ask Steve now. Thank you, Rob. Any, any other questions from the uh, floor? Yes. Um, <laughs> Hi, Chris. Steve, um, your toolbox software, oh. uh, your toolbox software has event handlers for the GUI uh, and for um, the uh, keyboard, but it has no um, event handlers for GPIO or any of the other ports on a Pi, for example. Would it be possible to add uh, event handlers for all the other things on a Pi that people might want to write software for? 
Uh, I don't see any reason why not, uh, aside from finding some developer to work on it. But yes, yeah. that, that sounds perfectly reasonable suggestion. I mean, it would be helpful for people to um, want to build small things to actually have an easy way of integrating the GPIO into their software. Yes. And at the moment, I think people who've tried to use GPIO have found it very awkward, very difficult to use. Yes, I think there, documentation there, being part of it. there are third party modules that help a little bit with some abstraction. But yes, there's there's no reason at all why it couldn't be uh, operated in a in a, a toolbox veneer over the top of those types of interfaces. Yes, good, good suggestion. I would say post something on the forum if you've not already and try and drum up some support. If it gets enough interest from people, then you may find we've en opened a bounty for it. <laughs> uh, Steve, I've got a general question about security. If yes. we are, as globally uh, suggesting, trying to become more mainstream, are we going to be looking at developing uh, better OS security? since we are only secure by obscurity. Uh, so some work has already happened in security with the uh, the recent changes in the SSL TLS uh, support. Um, in the core operating system, security is a, a wide topic. Whether well, it's- Some aspects, Steve, uh, if I'm, I thought you were about to say the same thing I was gonna say. Um, yep. Some aspects, for example, like changing the, the way that the memory map is arranged. So that all of the memory, all of the kernel's vulnerable workspace down at the low address is now moved up uh, to the top address. So there's definitely work ongoing to laying the foundations for a more secure operating system. There's, I can't think of another operating system that I use on a daily basis where I can arbitrarily overwrite the kernel's workspace from basic, <laughs> for example. Indeed. <laughs> Or you can very easily look into some other processes, memory, and copy it for yourself. Uh, the, a lot of this is almost, we've taken it for granted that this is what Risk OS is. It doesn't put high barriers to anything. And that's part of its attraction in that it's a very thin veneer on top of the hardware that's quite elegant but it comes at a price and security is one of those prices. And yes, it may well be that with the direction of travel that Cloverleaf want to take things for their fork or for their purposes, they might want to start adding the features such as memory protection and um, randomization, memory map randomization, all of the other good things that you see in modern operating systems where you have a more secure environment, which is secure from the perspective of user data security, information security. Um, we don't have any of that on our roadmap because it's not really core to the risk OS experience when you think um, of what happens most of the time on risk OS machines. They're, as they get more mature browse, web browsers and more feature rich web browsers, then people like Riscos Developments and Cloverleaf might start to feel that it's not adequate and they do want to start adding features in. You know, if people are going to be doing their home banking through their RiscOS browser, they may become less trusting. If RiscOS had multi-user capability and you could log in as you, I could log in as me onto the same machine, you want to start making sure there's some protection and I cannot access your stuff and vice versa. Um, none of that is core on our roadmap at the moment, but I, I think it's probably featuring somewhere on Cloverleaf and Riscos Developments roadmaps. And because it's an open source operating system, then there's no reason why we can't fold in that good work when it happens. Fair enough. Um, as a side question, um, the, as you know, Riscos Direct is being pushed towards or trying to help get new users to join the market, if you like, want to a better term. Um, is there any possibility we could have a separate form in the uh, form for direct questions so that people can funnel in ideas for development for helping? Could obviously rules involved with the basic OS that 
use this part of direct it would be useful if there was a sort of like a central place for people to raise issues or suggestions for improvement for helping get new users to the market yeah i think maybe uh, a section about various different risk loss platform specific conversations um that's certainly not a bad idea we've we've got something approaching that with porting but that's not really the same i think you're right there are, we've talked about the different platforms that RiskOS runs on nowadays. And for a stable release, we've got, what was it, six out of nine. Um, it would be good possibly to have an area of the forum to discuss platform specific conversations. I would say that the guys from RiskOS Direct, the guys from Arcomp, from uh, Cloverleaf, I'm sure they are active participants in our forum anyway. So should conversations be happening there that are to do with their particular fork of the operating system they will no doubt be contributing to those conversations already but maybe yes maybe we could create a section for the kind of platform specific conversations i'm not sure i'd want to create sections in the forum bespoke to a given platform we'll end up with quite a cluttered forum then on a related note in the i think it was on the there's a chat going on the show chat going on in chat cube i think it was in there that Someone said there ought to be a kind of a newbies section for, specifically for people come to ask the supposed, you know, so-called silly questions, you know, the, the things that we all know, but of course we only all know because we've been doing it for 30 years. Yeah, yeah with, with a pinned post showing that with a frequently asked questions and we can keep, you know, yeah. evolving that. Yes, that's not a bad idea at all. I'll, I'm Cause making notes. Because the forum is quite, a lot of it is quite techy and quite, you know, and it's obviously mostly frequented by people who know risk us very well but anyone who comes along new and newly downloads it sticks it on their pie is then going to be yeah indeed like yes what they ask and where that's well, that's a very good starting, idea almost starting with you what is risk os what can i do with it yeah yeah i mean we do have some of that stuff in our wiki but it's it'd be good in the forum to uh point people there um to build upon that and to allow the conversations to happen between people who are just entering the community and those who have a lot more experience who can help. Um, Steve, coming back to security, um, the RISCOS limited version of, of uh, RISCOS had a simple firewall application and configuration tool. Um, would that be introduced perhaps into the rule version? Uh, I don't see why we couldn't have something like that in the rule version. Again, it's another thing that should a developer feel so inclined, they could very much add that feature. We've got a bounties underway to do with improving the network stack. And you would imagine that that would only make things easier for that sort of feature to be added onto RISC-OS in future. Supporting modern network stack and modern standards putting a, a firewall application on top of it would be uh, fairly straightforward, I would have thought. It sounds sensible thing to do, doesn't it, at the time, yeah? Yes, some users, again, find that stuff confusing and unnecessary, but increasingly as you kind of, as RiskOS reaches a wider audience and the use cases grow, and it's not just people tinkering with GPIO lines in BBC Basic, it's more people actually wanting to use RiskOS for more complicated and specific purposes, then these things all gain importance. But again, um, there are people uh, like Cloverleaf and RiskOS developments who are very much focused on those um, more real world use cases that are outside of our traditional uh, RiskOS uh, experience. And they, again, they're trying to attract the funding to allow them to do some fairly fundamental work. And so it may be that you see them adding a firewall before it becomes a, a, a central risk us open thing. Any other questions? Well, I've got one more. Sure. So, yeah. Um, sorry, I've mentioned this before, but it's about donations be, uh, being done by bank transfer. Now, I know one can, uh, one, uh, yeah, one can have the bank details and one can do a transfer, 
but mm-hmm. one doesn't hear whether the money's got there unless you know somebody at Raw uh, uh, gets around to sending an email, which doesn't always happen. I mean, can it be done through the website? Um, can you incorporate that option and other that you know uh, aside from PayPal? so that um, it goes into the like the account on the website and we can see that it's got there, the donation. Uh, I, can, uh, I, I think uh, you asked me this question at the show last year, uh, David, if I remember rightly. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, um, I'm, I think my answer was uh, then, or I'm trying to remember what my answer was then, is that the donations that come in through the bank account are totalized at the end of the quarter when the accounts are added up so that there's definitely a, so if you do it by paypal it's instantaneous or the next day and um, if you do it by the bank account you need to wait till the end of the quarter and then the numbers will jump yeah but how do i know that my my donation has actually got there I, I might see the total go up at the end of the quarter but i don't know that it's gone up because of my donation yeah good so good question i the easiest way for if you did it via a bank transfer, the easiest way is to just simply ping us an email and ask us, have we received it? Can you confirm when it's arrived? And we certainly we have that with some people that historically were using uh, bank transfers and similar. Um, if you use PayPal, it's really easy because you'll see in your PayPal balance when a transaction has gone through. Steve, is there? There's a lot going on, um, but it's all a bit fragmented. Is there a case for further consolidation? Should should Riscos developers and rural merge and try and employ some full-time staff with some crowdfunding? Well, the, there is a lot going on, and I think this is a natural consequence of a true open source initiative. It's, it was always likely that when Riscos went open source, um, the, it felt like we've removed a huge barrier that had been there since we went to the shared source model in, when was that? 2006. We agreed that with Castle and it was never true open source. And it always felt to me like we hadn't quite made it. <laughs> um, now we've gone to this uh, Apache license for the source tree. It allows, it's permissive enough to allow people to do what they see fit. So, on the one hand, yes, potentially that opens the door to fragmentation. On the other hand, uh, these people might be able to attract funding for a spef- specific purpose. And of course, there's every chance that this that what they achieve will be able to be fed back into the core. And one of our responsibilities and their responsibilities, I think, if we want to keep things coherent, is to keep talking. And you know, we spoke to our uh, we spoke to the guys from Risk Cost Developments uh, about a week ago. And we, we've set up a schedule to speak with them on a monthly basis. We're very much interested in having these conversations and, and ensuring that there is coordination. Because, Brilliant. thanks, Andrew. Yes, so is Andrew we spoke to. And we would like to make sure that we are collaborating and we're not working against each other. Um, but we're not also going to try and tre- tread on each other's toes. We want to make sure that when someone has something that they want to achieve, we'll we will try and support and encourage that and make sure from our position position philosophically as risk OS open, we want to try and make sure that there is a goal to eventually see that come back to the core of risk OS so that the whole community can benefit and that it's still somehow in keeping with the ethos of what is risk OS. We, we don't want to just turn risk OS into a, a clone of Linux because then why would you bother? You might as well just use Linux. So it needs to be what is good of Risk OS, but it cannot be anchored to the past. So one of the big things for me about Risk OS is backwards and forwards compatibility. So if you're gonna make changes to the best possible way, you, you'll try and avoid breaking the stuff that was written in the past, but you'll try to not paint yourself into a corner for the things that might happen in the future. And other operating systems don't take quite the same level of rigor over that. And certain you know, language frameworks and all of that, they, they typically like to just throw the baby out with the bathwater every few years and cause everyone to have to rewrite everything. And they don't care because they're driving forwards. 
and we don't think that's what risk os is um and it's it's got its heart around arm uh, it that is what risk os is as well we're so close to the arm architecture that it allows us to be very fast and very efficient and very lightweight and these are assets and we should preserve those assets so we want <laughs> i'm kind of going on a rant almost but i i believe that a lot of initiatives are happening uh, there are new entrants in the scene who have great ambition and we will work with them and support them to see that it all comes back together in a way that still is risk os hopefully that answers the question <laughs> maybe it was a devil's advocate maybe but i mean one of it's good to see hardware it's development it's good to see the basic operating system development but what what um the platform really lacks now is is application software and that's still lagging behind is is there a case for a sort of um developers forum which meet, meets twice a year and tries to encourage people to develop more application software possibly it depends if if we've got enough developers to justify it at the moment um it i think the application software is something that cloverleaf and risk cost developments are very much interested in and focusing on amongst others you know i believe application development is um it's seeing a new wave of investment and time and energy it's got developers working on it quite hard you know some of the key things like web browsers proper you know standards compliant web browsers we got that happening now so i i, I don't have quite such a, a, a negative view about application software but i agree we want to see new user facing stuff arriving new applications and we don't want to see all of the work just being on the core operating system because that it's harder to see how that's a tangible benefit to all of the users in the community and, and you know, attaching to this, um, I, I think uh, we always talk about, you know, the user having easier tools for the user to learn how to use it. But I strongly think we should work also to have new developer. In, in other words, teaching people how to code on these calls. Um, I'm trying to do this in my very little time. I have started from the debugging also because as a developer, we all know that Testing software is the most important part of developing software, right? So I think from there and, and moving on. But I think there should be a much more uh, cooperative approach to that. Um, and obviously, as, as I always say, I welcome everybody to correct the stuff that I'm publishing to make sure that it's as correct as possible um, and useful as, as much as possible. And if it is still too complicated, please let me know and I'll will add more details about the theories and, and all the things being, you know, being a software engineer for more than 30 years. It's not a big deal. But we definitely have to do something to create new developers. That's what I, I think we should focus on. Yeah, I agree. And is I've said in previous years, it's a virtuous circle. You get good developers in, they create good software. It makes it a better place for the users. The users typically and puts more money into the community, which then funds more developers. And if you can encourage and foster that virtuous circle, it's a good thing. So I'll take I will I'll take that point on board that finding a way to help and unite the developers across the community is probably a topic well worth considering within Riscos Open, given our position in the community. Before I get a hook uh, from off, off stage, I just wanted to ask another another questions. Any more questions? Hi, uh, I have just, a question. Oh, John, yeah. was it John? Just a thought on on, on that uh, that you've been saying. We really need to take advantage of what's been happening during lockdown. In the past, uh, I do a lot of uh, 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 presentation uh, of various things. Uh, at U3A, that's pension is get it, keep, keeping the minds going. Uh, and I've been put off uh, doing uh, presentations, uh, hands-on presentations, uh, when we've been meeting face-to-face, -face 
because uh, it's difficult to get the machine, all the machines there that you need. Uh, I've been pushing uh, ARM and uh, RISCOS like mad over the years, one way or another, uh, and tend to turn up to the uh, computer groups always with a, uh, a Raspberry Pi in my top pocket sort of thing. Uh, but it's been impossible. But now that we're getting used to working online, a whole lot that was impossible starts becoming possible uh, because people can be using their own uh, uh, monitors and what and mice and whatever you're at home, uh, and you can work with that. So we need to make use of the extra possibilities that we're getting now. We're learning about now with online, with, with teaching people and showing them. It's a very good point, and I think this one of the barriers to having a RISCOS developer meet in the past was it always felt like it would be hard to make it worthwhile in terms of the time and the expense of organizing it of booking venues of getting everyone to come along and bring all the stuff and have the conversations now we're in a different world and you can see from this very forum now that we're starting to all get familiar with this way of interacting and we're seeing you know it has its limitations but it also opens great new possibilities so it makes it lowers the barrier to entry for creating a meet for bespoke purposes like getting all the developers together in risk os so i'm i'm particularly interested in this as an idea um, of a kind of a zoom risk os developer meet i think that could work quite well actually that would be um, pretty cool yeah i think there was one other question that i uh, i heard someone asking just before uh, i switched to yes, john Dave, just, just meant to ask you a quick question um have we have you considered one of the things that other platforms has is certain standard applications, if you like, or standard little features, add-on, a part of the OS. Now, yes, one traditional RISCOS has had lots of little apps to do as you want, but obviously, again, towards new users, some of them would expect some of these things to be there as standard, like uh, things equivalent like dish night or something to check your dish or something like that or better uh, a better better syslog to check for errors and what have you um have you considered that perhaps we should be looking at adding some of these into the basic os to enhance it uh yeah we've been thinking that since the very beginning of ah. what what stuff that exists that's written by third parties can we uh, kind of hoover up into a central distro? And the hard disk four image has grown a few bits and pieces. Um, if you get the RISC OS Pi distribution, it's got a few more bits and pieces in it. Um, the Nut Pi, or sorry, the RISC OS Epic collection has loads of third party software on it. Um, it was actually really hard work and time consuming to just pull that one together because the conversations you have to have with the various different software authors take time. And these are commercial applications quite often. And it's hard to come up with agreement um, where you can distribute them. Um, so you end up having to sell the distribution, which of course makes it less available to people. So the more we can find open source applications of the sort that you're describing, like if Disk Knight, I don't know if Disk Knight is commercial still or if it's free. If we can come up with agreements with the authors of these to in, in, include them in our default disk image, then that's fantastic. But it would, even that kind of conversation takes time and energy. So the more that authors can help us by just bringing their software to us, integrating it themselves into the build environment saying, here we've done, We've done something, it looks like this, what do you think? Would you like to make that your, part of your distro? That We're all always happy to hear when people have those sorts of um, offerings. Rob? There was, yeah, there are some trivial yeah. examples. Um, so Connector uh, by Andreas, I've forgotten his surname, I'm afraid. So Connector, the serial terminal. SparkFS, David Pilling's given a read-only version. Uh, Hopper, 
my personal uh, personal <laughs> champion of this high score high score of uh, nine thousand to beat. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's definitely possible. Right, on that note, I think we're going to have to come to an end. Yep. Thank um, you, Brian. Uh, just before um, I go, I, could I make one plug? Um, I heard Paolo mention about the, the interest in bringing AI to Risk OS. Um, I'm very interested in that myself. I just want to plug, if you've not seen it, there's a YouTube channel called uh, Four Minute Papers, and that is well worth watching. If you want to see the state of the art of what computers can do today, you can't go further wrong than watching that. <laughs> it's mind bending. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Brian, and thanks to the show organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yes, we've just, just hit five. So um, I did see Matthew Phillips was on here somewhere. Want to unmute yourself, Matthew? Yes, uh, yeah, I'm here. I'm, uh, I'm just sitting in front of my uh, stand at the uh, at the, show, yeah. at, the, at the show, I don't know where the rest of you are, but <laughs> there we go. Um, right. right. Uh, yeah, I think we're all ready to go. So, great. You, let's get the uh, silly nominee you've been up to. Let's get the slides up and um, off we go. Hope you'll be able to see that. Um, so, yes, uh, Synonym Nominee Software, we uh, write some of the uh, interesting application software you can run on your machines. Um, and uh, we've got a number of different things which I won't be uh, demonstrating today. Um, can't, can't really cover them all. Um, Impact and MP mail, which there are database and mail merging tools, um, including the ability to integrate with databases and spreadsheets for producing mass email. Um, we've got a number of diversions, uh, mathematical puzzles with Superdoku and Wrangler and card games. Uh, just a few examples of the sorts of puzzles you can um, solve. These, uh, this, these uh, applications will uh, generate puzzles for you. They'll help you solve puzzles. They'll give you a hint. Um, and you can type in uh, puzzles from uh, the newspaper and get it to solve the bits that you've got stuck on, if you want. Uh, it can do frightfully big puzzles like that. Um, this is Wrangler, a whole variety of different puzzle types, I think eight different puzzle types in Wrangler. And then we've got House of Cards uh, for all sorts of patience games. Anyway, the main application that we're known for really um, is Risk OSM, which is an OpenStreetMap renderer for Risk OS. And uh, OpenStreetMap is uh, pretty much the Wikipedia of maps. It's uh, contributed to by volunteers worldwide. Uh, but it also has quite a commercial um, following. A lot of companies are making a living by uh, supporting geospatial data using OpenStreetMap um, and producing maps and all sorts of other interesting products. So, um, Without further ado, we will uh, move on to the um, move on to the demo. I can get PowerPoint out of the way. Right here we go. Share the screen again. Right. I hope you'll be able to see this okay and. Uh, like Steve, I'll, I'll have to apologise if there are any um, weird issues um, because uh, this isn't directly connected to uh, the laptop. It, uh, the demo will be coming across a VNC connection from a Raspberry Pi 3 uh, and then across ADSL to you. So um, just wanted to show a few uh, new developments um, already released in risk OSM or about to be released. Um, we'll just go for, we'll bring up a little map. Hope you can see this okay. 
So um, we've had for quite a long time now a nice uh, tracing tool which allows you to um, click on the map and then uh, draw lines which follow along um, roads um, and there are different modes for this um, cyclist, motorist, etc. Recent enhancements has been as it now pays attention to one way streets. So you'll see there's a little bit of a one way bit here, the left filter. I can now no longer push my way across that and go around the corner in the wrong direction. It will let me go that way. And then I can, I can double back like that, which I think you'd be very hard pushed to do in the space available. Um, you can override uh, any of these settings by holding the shift key down and then it will let you um, uh, go around corners that you shouldn't do and uh, along streets in the wrong direction. So let's just do another example. We've also got improvements to um, how pedestrians are allowed to walk across um, pedestrian areas. So I'm just following along here and there's a big uh, open pedestrian area here, which um, uh, in the university in Durham, uh, and it used to um, have real trouble. Uh, well, it, it sort of really hugged the edge of the um, of of the space, uh, but now it goes much more naturally across uh, a, a fairly straight route, um, which is much more sensible. So, um, moving on, uh, we'll just uh, go to a new location. Um, having the internet connection working, uh, I can demonstrate um, some of the online services that we integrate into RISC-SM. So, as well as the big um, gazetteer of all of the uh, places in the British Isles, um, you you can also use uh, Nominatim, which is an online lookup, um, and you can type in the address like like that. So uh, this is a pub uh, well known in Oxford um, as being um, one which was frequented by uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. So we'll move in here. There is the Eagle and Child on St. Giles uh, in Oxford. And uh, I just wanted to show you some new features regarding um, fetching photographs. So we'll just fetch the photographs from the internet. This is something that the system has done for quite a while. Um, you'll see now that a, a very recent feature. If you have a lot of um, if you have a lot of pins all in one location, it will spread them out in a fan now so that you can read the numbers on them. So that's, uh, that's one improvement. Um, and there is also, within the pins and tracks window, um, a facility for filtering or searching uh, the find via F4. So I'm just going to um, look for Eagle because uh, what that image search just returned to me was any photos nearby from the geograph service. Um, and that's going to now limit it down uh, to ones which mention um, the word eagle. And from that selection, I can then actually say that I want to um, hide any other photos. I could hide the selection, but there's now also in the next release going to be an option to hide uh, the other uh, pictures. So that means we're now left just with um, the photographs of the eagle and child, uh, which you'll see down here, and you get the information about um, about each one that's been entered on that website. Um, right now, um, one of the things, another nice little feature is that Recce, which is the helper application for pulling um, images and other data from the internet, is automatically loaded by risk uh, when you are opening uh, that pins and tracks window. I'm going to zoom out um, a couple of times and um, 
show you a couple of other data sources which we've added um, since Recky was first released uh, back in uh, 2019. Um, so we now have, um, oh, I'm using the wrong version. Never mind. Uh, this is the very latest version which hasn't been released yet. Um, but uh, we've got the uh, Cycle Streets uh, photo map. Uh, this, um, this will return you photographs from a number of, um, uh, from, from the Cycle Streets uh, system, which is uh, one used by, is, was created by cycle campaigners in uh, Cambridge. So this is just to illustrate that there are other sources that we can integrate into Recce. And if anyone has um, other sources of photographs or geodata, which have an open API available over the internet, um, We'd be very interested to hear from you um, if there are other sources that you'd like to integrate. Um, so that's uh, just one example there. Um, we're going to move on now to a different location, I think. Um, yes, we'll, 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 we'll have a look at the um, St. Giles Hotel. Uh, In Felton. Down there, why not? Taking a little while to load the data. Um, often the London data has a lot more in it, which makes it a bit slower to render. Um, but we'll be it'll be coming along soon. I think. Oh dear. I think there may be something else going on in the background, actually, on this machine. I'm I think it may to... still be fetching the photo thumbnails that you asked. For. Right. OK, they well, we'll just we'll right. just get that. I did fetch an awful lot of pictures by mistake there. Um, right. Let's have another go. I'm going to actually show you a different search example. We can actually say hotels in Felton um, or near and, and things like that. And uh, you'll see here we've got the St Giles Hotel. It brings up a number of results. So um, here comes the map. Yes, that's a lot faster. Um, now on this uh, map, I'm just going to show you um, the collisions data. So this is a data set available um, which the police compile called STATS19. Um, and this will show you where all of the road collisions which have been reported to the police have uh, taken place in the vicinity of St Giles Hotel. So study this uh, map carefully and you'll be able to avoid any uh, dodgy points when we we go back there, hopefully next year. Uh, they're color coded according to what type of vehicles are involved and how severe the um, uh, accidents were. And the numbers indicate the number of uh, parties involved. Actually, I think the number of uh, um, victims, probably. Um, you, can, uh, you can control click to open the information um, about the, about the about the accident, casualties, the number of casualties, that's right. So uh, a two vehicle collision, etc. All sorts of interesting stuff out there. So as I say, if people have other data sets which they'd like to see integrated, let us know and we'll see whether that's possible. Um, the next one is, um, oh yes, I was going to show, demonstrate with that. Uh, if we go to the pins and tracks window, um, we can select the whole of this um, uh, folder full of um, data and export it as CSV. Um, so uh, this actually allows us to um, pull information out and um, put it into another 
system. Um, just find suitable. So I'm going to save this CSV file out. I'm actually going to drop it onto RISC-OSM itself because RISC-OSM has a very nice importer tool for CSV files, and that's quite a quick way of showing you the kind of information you get. So you'd be able to put this into a spreadsheet or a database and do some analysis as to uh, what's been going on um, in an area, um, narrow it down to see what collisions have happened recently um, and what time of day it might be that it's most dangerous. So um, RISC-OSM can provide all sorts of interesting data for you to analyze in other situations. Then we've got, um, I think we're going to get back to Durham next. Zoom in a bit. So another uh, data source which we integrated um, a few months ago is um, called Planet. Um, Wrong, wrong window. Where are we? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Planet um, allows you to find information about planning applications. If you're interested in what's going on in your area, you can see um, planning applications over the last few years. Now we're wanting to improve this a bit so you can place some filters on it because at the moment you probably would be more interested in seeing what's coming up uh, for planning applications lately. Uh, but you can again control click on any of these to see uh, what's what's happening. Um, this one's a felling of a purple plum tree um, and it looks like uh, I've missed the final consultation date for objecting to that one. But never mind. I'm sure they've got good reasons. Um, so those are things which have already been released in, in Recce, but we are also um, developing a, a couple of new integrations, which I just want to show you. Uh, one of these is um, weather. So you'll see we've got um, two different sources of weather forecasts. Met Office and Open Weather Map. I'll just um, ask the Met Office what the weather is like at the moment. So this um, is displayed in a little window. We've got a 48 hour forecast and seven day forecast. I'll just turn the 48 hour off because the uh, it does make the window very wide because it gives you hourly information. And uh, we can skip down to uh, the coming days and see whether we're going to have a nice half term uh, holiday or whether it's going to be a bit wet and cold. And you can export this um, as a CSV file or a draw file. So again, the CSV, um, just to show you what the kind of thing you get. Um, so I'll just try those again. I think the uh, dragging didn't work. So you can see you get uh, the time and the temperature, wind speed, uh, bearing and so on, and probability of rain, all sorts of detail. And also onto the map. I should have said, you get a little graphic to show you what the forecast is. I think we will probably get um, more than one of these once we've got it working properly. So you can see the weather across the, the district. Um, but uh, no promises there because I can't remember how easy that was going to be. Um, finally, I'm just going to demonstrate one more new feature. We'll just hide these ones, get them out of the way. Um, just make that one disappear and uh, we'll uh, zoom in again. Uh, we've had 
uh, support for Google Street View uh, for some uh, since uh, Recce was first released in January 2019. Uh, but we're now looking also at uh, supporting another new um, source of data, uh, which is Mapillary. Uh, Mapillary was recently brought up by Facebook. Um, so I don't know how long uh, the images will remain free, but at the moment they're a fairly liberal license, so you can do a lot more with them than the, uh, than, than the speak to uh, pictures. So I'm just going to uh, take the picture uh, from Mapillary. Again, it's um, street level uh, pictures from around the country. And you can move uh, forwards and backwards along the route. You often get much more closely spaced pictures than with uh, Street View. Um, sometimes the quality is a bit poor, but these ones that I've hit on seem to be OK. And uh, at the moment, uh, in the debugging mode that we've got, um, it's showing you we, we get a lot more information back from the pillory than you do from Google Street View. So these red lines on the map are an indication of all of the areas that intersect with the, the rectangle around where I was searching. Um, and there's a whole range of, uh, of photos along all these routes. And because a lot of these are taken by volunteers with uh, quite uh, straightforward equipment, you get um, pictures that go along footpaths and so on like this, which are not normally open to uh, car travel. So the coverage can be quite good. Uh, and more full than street view in some cases. Um, as well as the straightforward um, flat pictures like that, there are also uh, panoramic uh, pictures. Um, and uh, so we are working on getting those um, converted. I'll just show you a panoramic picture uh, in, in, uh, in um, before it's been processed. Uh, so this is a sort of 360 degree view. Um, and if you look at those flowers at the left hand side, as I scroll over to the right, you'll find that they uh, they reappear. Uh, a whole thing wraps around. Um, so we've done a little bit of work in converting these mathematically. And I'm just going to drop this uh, animation onto um, NetServe so that you can see what's possible. It's a bit grainy at the moment because the uh, the downsampling, it's been downsampled to a GIF to make an animated GIF to make it uh, more interesting. And you can see we're going past the edge of the picture there and circling around over the join uh, where, those, where that hanging basket was. So I think uh, that's all I wanted to show you. Um, the mapillary um, and the weather uh, stuff is not yet released, but we've been working on it slowly during lockdown. Um, and uh, now it's uh, time for questions. Hi, I have a quick question. It's not a question, it's uh, an advice for you. Uh, anybody interested in it seems like a must buy to me. Uh, if you go to the website, your download demo or uh, register uh, come to a 404 error. Oh, so well, we'll get that sorted out. Check it. I think our ISP periodically deletes large files. Um, that we'll have to look into that. There, there are sometimes problems with that. Um, yeah, the is, no one ever tells us. We don't know. <laughs> We ought, to, we ought to have something in there that checks, really. Um, yeah, we'll get that sorted out. Thank you. Um, would it be possible to create your own map, for example, if you wanted to, say, have a, a CSV list of customers and their postcodes and then show that as pins on a map? Yes. Um, so when I was dragging uh, the CSV files onto Risco and Sam's icon to sh just to show you the contents of them. Yes, you can you can take a CSV file that you've produced elsewhere. Um, for the UK, 
uh, it can uh, be based on uh, postcodes, if you wish, uh, as it can in uh, Canada and the Netherlands. Um, and uh, for the UK and Ireland, it will support um, grid references. Um, otherwise, you'll need uh, latitude and longitude. Um, so as long as you've got any of those location fields in, in columns, um, then you can drop the CSV file onto uh, RISC OSM. It will try to identify which of those columns might be things like grid references and so on. Um, and um, you can then uh, load the data in. Uh, you can choose which uh, field might be used for the label, uh, for the pin on the map, and what might get loaded into the title or the description uh, for the pins. Um, I should point out if anybody's worried that Northern Ireland postcodes are not included in our data because the Royal Mail don't include them. Uh, well, it's it's more that our postcode data comes from the Ordnance Survey, which is the Ordnance Survey of Great Britain. Um, That's uh, uh, Royal Mail do not uh, let anyone have their postcode data free of charge, but the Ordnance Survey has a downgraded version which just gives you a point on the map rather than a, a, a sort of outlined area for each postcode. So that's what we offer. Yeah, that seems very useful anyway, to be able to put pins on. Hmm. Matthew, uh, you've mentioned a number of um, updates there. Um, so will, would that be a chargeable update? I don't think any of these well, um, we haven't decided yet with, with Recce, but uh, the improvements to risk OSM lately, um, we don't regard them as being sufficiently dramatic to uh, be a chargeable update. So that those will be going up free of charge uh, soon. Uh, we've not really thought about Recce yet. Um, it's not at a point that's nearing release um, very soon, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have a think about that. It's not gonna be very much. I should say, actually, all the uh, all the proceeds from Recce have been going towards the um, RISCOS Open uh, TCPIP stack bounty because uh, uh, we benefited hugely from their introduction of the um, uh, support for secure socket layer. Uh, so we've been feeding some more money into that. Great, happy to hear it. <laughs> And maybe that is a nice place to end on a nice, yeah. mm -hmm. generous note. Good. Thank you very much, Matthew and Hillary for chiming in as well. <laughs> right. Our Ooh. first double act of the day. <laughs> right, I've got just a, two minutes until Steve Fry takes over for our next one. Yeah, just to say what a brilliant program risk cost mapping is. I use it so much. <laughs> Thank you. sitting there. So Steve, are you there? Well, I am, yes. Oh good. Um, the list on my screen keeps changing its order and I thought I saw, saw you and then you disappeared. I thought, oh no. <laughs> I'm, I'm staying at the moment. <laughs> I'll be here for the next half hour. So we're good to go with the 
we nearly know, it's just ticked over to 5.30 according to my laptop, so yeah, if you're ready. Okay, I'll... Uh... Over to, to you to see if, tell us what you've been up to lately. Okay, so uh, just trying to work out how this, what I'm clicking on at the moment. So there we go. Um, apologies to anyone who's come here on the back of the, or stopped to listen to this on the back of the listing on the um, show program, which said I was talking about cash book, locate, and print PDF, because I think they're probably the applications I won't be talking about at all um, for the next half hour. Um, what I'm going to have a look at instead is Launcher, which uh, was slated for release at Wakefield in April and hasn't really been spoken about at the show since then. Um, I might talk a bit about clipboards. Um, I may have a look at some tools for developers, possibly talk about software distribution, and maybe finish off with source code, which hopefully will all remain interesting for everybody and not just developers. Um, or it could probably be subtitled to what I did during lockdown, which might be a slightly fairer description of um, then following sort of jumbled sort of bits and pieces. So Launcher, for those who haven't come across it, is yet another desktop application launcher. I think everybody who's anybody has pretty much written their own over the over the years. Um, I wrote Launcher back in about 2002 because none of the ones that were available at the time did what I wanted. Um, it was, it even predates Cashbook in terms of my history of writing C software for Cisco OS. It was pretty terrible, but it did what I wanted and carried on doing it for about sort of 16 or 17 years until a concerted campaign by a couple of individuals who used to come talk to me at shows um, where it was always available, always visible on the side of my desktop and never actually something I was talking about, um, persuaded me that perhaps there might be a bit more public interest in it. So Launcher 0.5 was released at Wakefield 2019, um, which was a year and a half ago. Um, it was still very much designed to suit my preferences. Um, so there's a lot of things it didn't do unless you wanted it to do what I wanted it to do. It wouldn't probably suit your way of working. Um, and immediately I got people saying, well, it'd be nice if it would do this or could it do that or we'd like to do something different. And so about a year later down at the Southwest show in February, I was actually demoing a new release of Launcher, which I was confidently stating was coming to, going to be released at Wakefield 2020 back in, in April. Um, and it wasn't. Um, I'd like to stick to the story that that was because Wait for 2020 didn't happen. Um, it was also because it would have missed the deadline anyway because it wasn't ready. But uh, there we go. Um, so what is Launcher for those who haven't come across it? It's an application launcher and the, let's say the Tenor Penny on Risk OS. Launcher is a little bit different perhaps, or in some ways it suited what I wanted. Far down the left hand side of the screen, if you click on it, it pops out. You can click on applications to load them. If you want to load two applications in the same go, you can just click and it does what you'd expect. And that's pretty much it. Well, that was what was released last year. And the first question I got was, well, we don't like it on the left-hand side of the screen. Could we have it on the right? And the answer was no, because I didn't want it on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, so the new version, if anybody wants it on the right-hand side of the screen, it'll move across and all the buttons just mirror across so that the ones that were closest to the desk, the inside of the desktop before are still closest to the inside of the desktop now, um, just to make things a little bit symmetrical and easy to work with. Um, a few people said, well, we don't like it on the left or right. How about having it at the top of the screen? Well, yep, we can do that as well. Um, and now everything flips around a bit more. And again, the icons are still in the same positions relative to the desktop. In the case of anybody who really wants it at the bottom of the screen, um, just because it wasn't a lot of extra code to add in, you can have it down, down the bottom by the icon bar, but I could see that getting really annoying down there. So I don't, you know, I don't expect many people will want to do that. Um, I'm gonna put that back on the left-hand side before I get really confused as to what's going on. The next request was, well, one bar's not enough, could we have two? So yes, we can now. Um, we can add a new panel in, and we need to give panels names just so that um, Launcher can keep track of which ones they are. And if we stick it on the right-hand side of the screen, we can gain another bar that operates independently. Um, if I want to add, add a button to that, an application, um, I've not got any text editors there, so let's add strong edge to that. 
Um, and just for you know balance, I'm going to add Zap as well. Um, I'm going to move the window out of the way because Zoom's dropped a uh, thumbnail directly across where that um, <laughs> where that's trying to display. So I'll put my other icons down here just so I can see them underneath. Um, we can add NetSurf as well. Um, it gives you various options when you're adding applications to the to the, um, the panels. Um, obviously, you can give the buttons a name, put their positions. You can set up Sprite, which by default is the application Sprite, but you can change that if you wish to do so. And you can set up what it does at startup. So does it boot the applications, which is the same as look at if you if you go into configure, um, or you can have it just pick up the application sprites, but not boot the application, which may be useful if, for example, Strong Aid was your favorite text editor, Zap, you wanted to have available, you could have Zap set to sprites only so that it wasn't booted at startup, or you can do nothing at all, and it's up to you to sort out how to make sure the application works ready, works when the machine starts. Um, so we can add things to it, and that bar operates in exactly the same way the other one does, just independently. Um, but you can also have more than one bar now on the side of the screen as well if we want to add another panel. So I can add another one, stick that on the right as well. Uh, and on that's editing panels, isn't it? I want to do a new panel. And I'll put that on the right hand side as well. And we've now got a second panel, the two of them just split the space on the screen um, equally between themselves. If I didn't want that, I could edit the top one, say, to give it a weight of 200. And then they split themselves roughly a third to two thirds of the screen up and down. So that was uh, that was Launcher. Well, that was what was due for release at Wakefield. It came out in around about May, I think, in the end, when I finally got it finished. And true to form, I immediately got another query coming come in from somebody that said, well, that's all very nice, but it'd be nice if it did what Mac OS does when you um, have an application launcher. And if you just if you just kind of wave the mouse over it, it it'll, it'll open up rather than having to actually click on it. I thought that sounds like a terrible idea, um, but I, I'll have a look anyway and see if I can do it. So. I probably didn't want to do that. If I go to choices, open on mouse over, and you can set a time delay, half a second, um, 50 centiseconds. So if I now wave the mouse in that general direction without clicking anything, which is very hard to see in this, it'll just open up and then it'll close. Um, it'll close when the mouse moves away. Um, and having decided it was a really terrible idea and I would just put it in because you know I've been asked for it, it's now my default setting in, in Launcher because it is actually a lot nicer than clicking on the panels. So thank you to I can't remember who it was who suggested it, but thank you very much for that idea because it was definitely worth worth adding in. And that became Launcher 1.1, which came out, I think, in June. Um, so that was what should have been released earlier in the year and wasn't. Um, so what else have I been up to? Well, as a sort of side effect of the work done on Launcher, I found myself actually having to make updates to all the other applications that are built around the same set of libraries as, as Launcher uses, which is Cashbook, Locate, Print, PDF, and PS2 Paper. So there you go. I have actually fulfilled my contractual obligation to mention them in this talk. Um, they also got rebuilt, and I decided just to release new updates to all of them. There's nothing particularly exciting in those um, from an end user's point of view, apart from the fact that they all finally, after 20 years maybe in some cases, um, properly do internationalization. So if anybody wanted to translate them to other languages, they actually follow what seems to be the de facto standard on RiskOS, and they use res ResConf style um, language selection rather than doing it the broken way that Acon recommended in the PRMs. Um, so there's new versions out for all those, those applications that were released sometime in June, I think, um, possibly July, which um, adds that feature in. Um, Moving on to look at the clipboard very quickly. Um, many years ago, when around about, around about 2003, four, I think it must have been, um, I sort of inherited the iPhone clipboard module, which Thomas Leonard wrote back in the 90s sometime to implement um, the global clipboard in all writable icons on the desktop. Um, so what that means is it, oper it provides the control C, control X, control V for cut, for copy, cut and paste in all icons. Um, it obviously became a little bit irrelevant when Risk Cost Limited 
introduced all that in select. Um, then the Ionics came out, MISCO S5 didn't have the support and I 32 bitted it, which is, um, and got Tom, asked Thomas if I could release it publicly, which he said, yep, no problem, and released it into the public domain. And so that's how I ended up sort of maintaining it for the past um, 15 years or so. Um, and with all the improvements that um, Steve Revel was demonstrating earlier on today in the rule talk, um, surely it's no longer relevant on RISCO S5. Um, so presumably I'd just be removing, removing it from my website or marking it down as a legacy bit of software, except it didn't quite go like that. Um, is there was quite a lot of discussion on the rule forums and I think also on our comps mailing list um, as the clipboard support started coming out from people saying, well, I've lost access to the various bits and pieces that Ivan Clipboard did. Um, how can I carry on using those alongside alongside the new support in the uh, that come natively with the, with the operating system? Um, and for those who perhaps aren't familiar with Ivan Clipboard, um, it offers a few other key presses as well as as well as just cut, copy, and paste. There's the slightly dubious Control Z, um, which deletes and pastes, and I think in fact internally it is basically a Control U. Control U key press to clear the icon and then just Control V to paste. Um, it's got a couple of key presses, Control D and Control E, I think, we did in the space for on the slide that can mess, mess about with DOS file name extensions in save dialog boxes. Then there's Control S, which can swap the case of characters within your article icons, and Control T, which can insert today's date, which is where the T comes from. Um, so maybe if we could actually just sort of reassign these keys to move them around so they didn't clash with things like Control Z, which is now clear selection in icons, that would be quite useful. Um, and the answer was, well, yes, it could, because people have been asking me for that for years, and it always looked surprisingly difficult to actually implement. Um, and in fact, when I took Icon Clipboard over, one of the first things I did was make all the key presses configurable so you could turn off Control S and Control T for swap case and um, insert date because it clashed with something in Profit, I think. And I had a few people say, well, if we if we have Icon Clipboard running, Profit can't use its keyboard shortcuts. Um, and so once it became the case that all the other shortcuts, all the kind of core ones in Icon Clipboard, and it might need to be reconfigured as well, I decided to go back and have a look at this and see if it was as difficult as I as I first thought, which resulted in a new version of Icon Clipboard coming out. Again, I think in July sometime, it might have been August. Um, and this has the ability now, and so hopefully that text isn't too small for people to read on screen, um, to actually tell it what keys to use for all its functions, rather than just having them all hardwired so that Control C is always copy, Control Z is always, always overwrite from clipboard. You can actually tell it, use this Control sh um, key shortcut for this action, and or turn this one off, turn this one on. Um, Rather than sitting and typing it all in by hand, it's all documented in the manual. If there's any of you difficult difficulties, drop me an email. But set up a very simple example here that will do roughly what was talked about, I think, on the Arcom mailing list. So we can turn off cut, copy, and paste because Risco S5 now supports those. We can move the Control Z function, that is, clear the icon and paste the text in, paste the clipboard contents in onto Control Y. Um, it's a keyboard shortcut that's not used, and for some reason in my head it always still works because Zap uses it for something rather similar. And let's re-enable Control S, Control T as well. So if I run those, and then look at what iPhone Clipboard thinks it's doing, you can see it should. Have, you should be able to see it's taken. It's taken those changes on board. Um, it's very hard to demonstrate clipboard shortcuts on the keyboard over over Zoom. But I will just quickly show you Control S and Control T because they're the ones that a lot of people don't actually seem to know about, partly because they're, they're actually disabled by default. So if I do Control T for insert, insert today's date, it's actually inserted the date there in that right of icon for me. Um, the format's configurable. Again, it's documented in the manual. Um, you can have anything that Risco S can generate as a date. And if I take the carrot back to the beginning and press Control S a few times, you can see it's swapping the case of the alphabetic characters in there, which is the same as things like Impression and Easy Writer and Evasion and so on do with similar key presses in their own in their own applications. Um, so that was Icon Clipboard. And looking at Icon Clipboard kind of led me on down another rabbit hole um, towards its sister application or its sort of sibling, um, which 
I acquired with, I can click board as part of the code that I got off Thomas. Um, and it was called, well, it was called Clipboard and it gave easy access to the global clipboard contents via a little window on the desktop. And so it was known as Clipboard. Um, I decided as part of this work that it might be a good idea to find out if Thomas had ever actually allocated the names like Clipboard and Clipboard with Rule, especially since Risk OS 5 now uses the name Clipboard for something internally as part of its Clipboard support. And it turned out he hadn't. Fortunately, I got Icon Clipboard, that was no problem, but uh, Clipboard itself, the application became Clipper, which is actually a probably a neater and more distinctive name. Um, so what does it do? Uh, let's have a quick look. It basically opens up a little window onto the clipboard, which is all it does. And I have a strong suspicion, or all it initially did, and I have a strong suspicion that Thomas actually wrote it as a means of testing icon clipboard to provide a kind of fully functional set of um, um, clipboard implementation. But it can do a few useful little things, um, which can be quite handy if you're actually working with the clipboard a lot. So if I type some text into uh, strong ed and select that, and then do block clipboard, copy to clipboard. It's using shift control C, so that will take it onto the global clipboard. Clip has picked that up and it now recognizes a strong ed owns a clipboard, um, which is, I guess, useful in and of itself. But we can actually save that out to disk. So if I wanted a copy of the clipboard contents, so I can actually save it out as a file. Um, if I load that up, we'll see it's what I copied to the clipboard. Um, and it will work the other way as well. So I've got another file here which contains some different text. And if I drop that onto Clipper's icon uh, window, Clipper will pick it up, take ownership of the clipboard. And then if I come back into, into Strong Ed and do block clipboard paste to, paste to text, which is Shift Control V, it'll paste it in. So you can actually save the clipboard contents out and also um, drop files onto the clipboard, which will then be pasteable into applications. And this works for text. You can, if you're using Risk OS 5, where um, Paint and Draw both talk to the clipboard, you could drop draw files on, you can save draw files out, you can drop sprites on, save sprites out, that sort of thing. And it should all work as expected. Um, the other thing that came out, which is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly difficult to demonstrate here, there was shortly after I did all this work and um, had released this update to Clipper, um, Chris Evans asked on the news groups about whether there was an application that would allow you to type clipboard contents at the carrot. Um, which is most useful for things. I think he was talking about the old Firefox web browser, which I mean, might, if it wasn't, it was one of the other old web browsers that had implemented its own user interface and didn't recognize the clipboard or anything else very much regarding the kind of Risk OS interface. And he could type into the into the fields, but he couldn't do anything else. And it'd be quite handy if there was a way of typing the clipboard contents in, so you could effectively paste in web addresses and that kind of thing. Um, and it seemed like the kind of obvious thing that Clipper could do. So with the release of version 0.3, I think we're on now. We are, yes. And a just click on Clipper's icon will type the text at the carrot. Um, as I say, you have to have a word for it that did that rather than just pasting it in, but that did actually type it. So that's the latest addition to, to Clipper. Um, so that got us wrapped to about August. Um, and I was still, obviously, we were all still locked down. I, I was sat at home being paid by the Chancellor to do not very much um, for several months. And it seemed like a reasonably useful time to actually start picking up some of the projects on my risk OS to-do list, which had um, probably been best described as things that I really wanted to do, but couldn't be bothered to do because they seemed quite boring and there were other more interesting things to do if I only had half an hour here or there to actually, um, actually look into them. And, So a couple of things for developers um, fell out of this. Um, the first one was a few updates to MessageMon, which um, is really not very useful to anyone unless you actually need it, in which case it becomes incredibly handy, which works with um, Reporter, which is the debugging, debugging tool from Chris Morrison and Martin Averson. Um, and it will let you snoop on WIMP mes um, user messages that are passing around on the system. So all the stuff we were doing with the clipboard just then, and I was showing you basting text out strong ed and into Clipper and across to elsewhere. Um, all the while that was going on, all the applications were talking to each other behind the scenes and message model will let you snoop on those messages and see what they're actually saying to each other and see what the packets are and, and debug it. And I think I originally wrote it um, when I was actually implementing the global clipboard and cashbook many years ago to actually work out what on earth was going on. Um, 
So that's all a few little updates this, this summer, um, mainly because I had a couple of bugs reported to me which were which were fixed. Um, and the other thing that I picked up, which had been on my to-do list for a long time, was to have a look at WinEd. Um, so those WinEd's a template editor, which um, is for those who don't know, allows you to um, allows developers to edit window templates. Um, so got some templates here. These are actually alarms uh, window definitions um, and it's very much a kind of everybody has their own favorite template editor there's about three or four out there um, WinEd was mine and it turns out to be quite a few other people's favorites and it's been becoming increasingly unstable as, as systems updated and it turns out it was doing some very dubious stuff in zero page with which it shouldn't have been doing and modern versions of risk os5 were catching that and going well no you don't want to do that and it was causing it to crash so Back over the summer, I finally decided that you know now was as good a time as any to actually try and download the source code and get it to build. Um, and with a lot of help from help very um, very useful and knowledgeable folk on CSA Programmer and the GCC SDK mailing list, I finally got it building. Um, tracked down a load of problems and massive thank you to the, all the people on the Rule Forum who spent by the look of it a significant amount of time trying to break Winner for me after I'd released bug fixes. Um, We've probably got one of the most stable versions out there. It's been out there for about 15 years now, I suspect, because it's fixed a few other interesting things. And version 3.26 is now is now available to download. Um, and also say thank you to Adam Richardson, who was very helpful and answered a number of stupid questions I sent him in emails about the event, you know, where stuff was and where source code might have been and how how things all worked. Um, so that's potentially of interest. To, to anyone who writes software for the platform. Um, I'm conscious that time is running on, so we'll move on to uh, kind of wrap up the last few things, really. Um, something else that fits into the category of stuff that I kind of really thought I ought to look at, but had never really found the time to do, was actually how my software is distributed. Um, it's always been available via my website, and for a number of years, you can get a lot of my titles off Clingstall because that was fairly easy to um, to sort out. Um, about eight years ago, I had a look at trying to package stuff up and distribute it through Pac-Man and failed miserably because I couldn't automate it enough at my end to make it actually um, something that I, I could be bothered to do every time I release new new updates. And so having, while I was still sat at home twiddling my thumbs and being paid by the Chancellor, I um, Finally got that sorted. So now quite a lot of my software is available via, via the rule repository um, on Pac-Man if you wish to download it, download it via that route. Um, and there's something else that um, I had been bothering me for a while, or it had been something that had been sort of niggling a little bit. And it's a subject that's actually come up a few times today in the talks that I've been, I've been dipping in and out of them about software continuity and continuity of support and source code going missing and applications you know, no longer being supported but not being maintainable or available. Um, all of my stuff's been open source since 2012 or thereabouts. Um, and prior to that, the source code was available. But I think it's always been quite difficult to actually take the stuff, take the source code from my website and actually build it and turn it into applications. Um, I say I think it has, I know it has, because when I, another thing, when I looked at actually setting up a build environment myself this this summer from what I publicly released, I found I couldn't actually do it. It wasn't actually possible, which was slightly embarrassing. Um, so I've now been through everything and release, I'm starting to release all of my source code for all my build tools and all the software and so on um, on GitHub. So it's actually available somewhere away from my website. So it's not, there's no single source of failure. There's no, if my website ever disappears, you know, it hasn't all gone for good. Um, I think about three quarters of the stuff is there. You can build all the applications, the modules, the little things like um, I, I can clipboard, um, PC keys, that kind of thing, are still to sort out. There's a few little issues to tie up with those. Um, but everything that is up there, you can download it. You can build it. If you've got access to a Linux machine, you can build it all yourself. Um, and as far as I can see, it works fine. And if anybody would like to play with that and let me know the outcome, I'd be really interested. Um, and I've also updated my website to make it a bit clearer now where you can actually download stuff from and where it's available. And the final thing, I think, um, which kind of ties in again, as part of that, I've actually updated the information on my website with much clearer guidance on how to use the source code and how to use the information that's out there. Um, because I was kind of conscious that 
even I found the Build Tools page on our website quite confusing. So, you know, pity anybody who came to it without any background knowledge of what it was all about. Um, I also managed to spend some of the lockdown updating my programming tutorials on my site. Um, and for those who've not seen it, um, if NetSurf will let me do it. Yep, okay. Um, there's actually a C, a C section here. Um, which takes you through to a currently 28 chapter tutorial on writing C using the desktop development environment. That's the, those are the rule packet. That's the rule package natively on Risk OS. There's none of the Linux stuff that I evangelize about at other times. It's all native stuff. Um, and guiding sort of maybe bringing you from a sort of basic hello world written in basic all the way through to doing the same thing in C and starting to add in other features. Um, and Hopefully I've managed to make that a little bit clearer on the website, wh where it is, how it's available, and also perhaps plug some of the other Risk OS native development tools that I've made available over the years and separate them out from all the Linux -y stuff to make it a bit more a bit more approachable for people. So that is basically what I've been doing in lockdown. Um, hopefully it's of, of interest to somebody. Um, if anybody's got any questions, let us know. You can contact me via the website after this. Um, drop me an email via the contact details in any of my software, and I'll happily try and answer questions. Um, so, thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, is it, are there any questions? I guess I'd like to thank Steve for the C tutorials. I was I was actually going to ask for more of those, and then I saw that you've already done more, so that's fantastic. Um, thank the Chancellor for those. I, I often if there's a bit of nitty gritty that I forget. Um, sometimes the rule PRM things are a little bit too dry and your tutorials can be uh, incredibly helpful in crystallizing exactly how things uh, go together. So big thank you for that. Okay. Yeah, thanks Andrew. It's probably worth actually mentioning just in light of that, that when I wrote them, um, I did actually make a lot of effort to go through the old PRMs, the, the new PRMs from, well, the, the risk loss, uh, hang on, the risk loss limited PRMs from 2000 and Mumble, whenever they came out, all the rule documentation as well, and try and bring everything together. So it may well be one of the sort of more up to date versions of information for anyone who's work, working in basic as well, because there's a lot of document background documentation there, which you may not find elsewhere. Well, all I can say is it's been very helpful uh, and it just brings things together in a way that P PRMs don't necessarily do so on their own. Well, thanks, yeah. Are you in lockdown much longer, Steve? Um, Sadly not. I got went back to work in August, so yeah, it's been. Uh, I was just going to say that the new DD, the new C compiler, has C eighteen, so there'll be even more tutorials needed. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. If there's any info around about stuff, I'm happy to try and update what I've done, but it's it's taken th about five years to get to that stage, so uh, I can't promise. But again, if if anybody else would like to contribute to them, I can. I'm happy to try and get the source for those out in GitHub as well, so other people can stick make changes to them. Um, that's of any use for anybody drop us an email and let us know that's great yeah, i was going to echo what andrew just said a moment ago that that, that tutorial series I, yeah i feel like uh, that's a rare moment where someone has had a clarity of thought and done things in the order that you actually do them uh, yeah I was, I was going to applaud that as well andrew's andrew's beating you too <laughs> great minds think alike <laughs> See, it's so easy to write something that if you already knew how to do it, that it, the instructions make sense to that person. But writing something if you knew nothing is a lot harder. It's, the, the interesting thing about doing it actually is that I know it's a bit of a cliche, but writing stuff down actually helps you understand problems. The amount of bugs I fixed in my own libraries, having written that and realised that I'd done oh. stuff wrong, and then gone back and sorted it. So it's, it's yeah, it's an interesting process. <laughs> One question in the chat, which um, David Fugay asking whether the launcher could be made just a pixel wide, so it's just a pixel at the edge of the screen. Uh, <laughs> possibly yes, actually. Um, I'll have a look at that because it's it can't be to answer to sort of answer the question that wasn't asked. It can't be made invisible because that's a massive change of the way RiskOS works to actually spot the mouse going to the edge of the screen with no window is incredibly difficult, or not incredibly difficult, but it's a totally different way of working. But one pixel wide may be doable. So I will have a look at that and see what I can do. You might have one extra happier user. 
Well, thank you very much for that, Steve. We've perfectly timed that as well. Look. Just before six. So now I can see Vince lurking up there in the corner of my screen. Are you ready, Vince? You're on mute still, Vince. Yeah, and I was trying to use the um, uh, touchpad on the computer. I'm forgetting I could quite connect it up to keyboard and mouse. Okay, I'm, um, I'm going to turn my video off and switch to the other screen. So, uh, right, okay. So if I share my screen first. While well, Vince sorts that out, I think after this we will have this is working a nice visit from Chris Evans of CJE, I think. So, it's a little extra special guest at the end. Share screen. That's it, I can see that. Okay, it's got out of the way. And I'm going to turn my video off as well if I can. Ah, the interface is gone. <laughs> yeah, for some reason we've got half, we've got one, your slide window and half another window or something. It like. worked perfectly the other night when we tried this. Yeah. Just bear one second. That's it. That'll do. Okay, okay. that'll have to. Oh, poo. Come back. Well, I've got some notes on this screen as well to remind me of the, I had them on there previously, but... Um, <laughs> Right, okay. I can't turn my off either then, apparently. Okay. Never right, um, so I'm going to be switching. Be... <laughs> okay, if you want to introduce me, carry on. Okay, well, here is um, Vince Hudd to, to uh, tell us all about Softrock software and maybe Riscossetry, who knows. Away you go, Vince. Right, okay. So I've not got anything to push or sell at the moment. So what I'm going to do instead is just give you a brief history of Softrock software. And then I'll just open up to the questions so you can ask me, steer the conversation anyway, ask me about anything, my products, new or old, my websites or anything. So here we go. And that didn't work. Right, okay, so I've been trading a Softrock software since 1989 um, with the original aim to write and sell budget games for 8-bit computers. Um, when I started the business, I'd already written a couple of text adventures uh, the first was actually written at school on the BBC Micro in BBC Basic. But when I got my first computer, an Acorn Electron, I wrote it again using Adventure Creator. Um, and as soon as I'd done that, I, I wrote another one, a slightly more ambitious one. Um, before that, I'd also written um, a Pac-Man style game. I might say written, I mean literally written. It was written on a stack of A4 paper in 6502 assembly language. Um, but that got put to one side when I got the Electron and I worked on those adventure games. When I got a BBC, I bought a graphic adventure creator and added graphics to those games. And I started working on an arcade adventure game called Parry's Run. Didn't get that finished, but we reached uh, 1989. And look, later in 1989, I bought an A3000 um, before I had anything good enough to release. My first commercial release was about a year later. Now, bearing in mind, I set up the business to sell budget games, and I'd written a couple of adventure games for the BBC. There was that handwritten, incomplete Pac-Man style game, and I was working on that Powers Run game. Obviously, the first thing I released was a cash book program. Um, it was actually a program I'd written for my own use on the BBC, which I ported over to the A3000 and improved a bit. Uh, ultimately, though, it was just a BBC program made bigger. There were a couple of other programs in the set, a stock control program and a nominal ledger program, which also got the same treatment. But the, the, the nominal ledger in particular was really, really weak. Um, and in the end, I just gave up and I think I released them to the PD libraries with the option to register, so i.e. like shareware. But a couple of months after releasing that, I did actually release my first game, and that was Escape from Xeria. Now, the main programming on this was done before I ported the cash book, 
the whole program was pretty much written over a weekend. It was the level designs that held it up. They, they took a bit longer. Now, although it was written in BBC Basic, the game is actually based on that handwritten 6502 game. Uh, it's, it was a result of a conversation I had with someone who, who told me that B, BBC Basic wasn't suitable for writing a game, and I took that as a challenge. And what I did was I took that 6502 game, that handwritten one, went through it, looked at my comments and how the code worked, and recreated it in BBC Basic on the A3000. And the storyline that you're escaping from the prison mines of Exeria actually came from that work in progress, Paris Run. Um, when I finished it, I found there was plenty of space on a disc. So I proceeded to make an attempt at writing something along the lines of Paris Run in BBC Basic uh, for RiskOS. And I think I trans transferred some of the level designs across from the BBC as well. That became Return to Exeria, which I included on the disc with Escape from Exeria. And if you get to play it, you'll see that it was very rushed. It's very, very, very poor. Um, there was still space on the disc, so I included those two BBC adventure games um, for use under 6.5 host. Now, after Escape from Azuria, oh no, yeah, I was going to go on to the, the other games, but I see the slide is actually about the BBC version. So I went back to that 6.502 code and decided to actually type it into the BBC um, and get it working. Um, in its written form, it wasn't finished, so there was a little bit more work to do. And obviously, bug fixes and tweaks were needed to what I'd written, as well as some basic glue. The menu screen, I think, title screen, and the loader. Uh, but in 91, I started selling it, um, or at least trying to. I don't think it ever reached double figures. It probably didn't even reach the, figures of, the fingers of both hands. Um, an interesting factoid, though, is that the 6502 version initially was too slow and needed to be made faster. The BBC Basic version on the A3000 was actually too fast and had to be slowed down. And also, there was some disc. There was enough space on the disc for the BBC version to include those two adventures on that as well. And I don't know if those were the versions with graphics or not, unfortunately, because I no longer have copies of it. So after Escape from Exeria, there were four more budget games. Guardians of the Labyrinth, which also has some elements of Paris run in it. Drop Rock, which is a Repton style game. Switch, which is a puzzle game uh, played against the clock on a grid that looks a bit like a Connect Four type grid. And lastly, Floopy, which was my first program in C beyond anything other like Hello World. And this is also another much better attempt at creating that Paris run idea. Now, I'm not sure when this was actually released. Um, I'm going to say 1993, but it might have been slightly earlier. Um, that's when I released Trellis, a fairly simple program for writing your own text adventures. It borrows some aspects from Adventure Creator, uh, which used a, you defined the rooms, the words file, the commands that you could be typed in, and the objects, and you had different sets of conditions it would be executed at different points. So I, I kept the idea of the rooms, words, and objects, put those in separate files, and then replaced the conditions with a program script. Um, and naturally, the first thing I did then was rewrote those two BBC adventures using Trellis to include with it as demo games. And you'll notice here as well, at the bottom of the advert, that by this point, I'd ha I had a free post address because I was actually doing quite well selling the software. And then in 94, I bought a RISC PC. Um, and after a little while of marveling at how much more powerful it was than the A3000, I decided it was about time to have a look at those games again because they didn't work properly on the RISC PC. I completely rewrote Escape from Exeria and Drop Rock. And in the case of Escape from Exeria, um, I improved the gameplay quite a bit, um, which means I made it harder. Um, Drop Rock, I think, is pretty faithful to the original version. Um, I released those two rewrites as separate versions for the Archimedes and for the RISC-PC. Um, 
And I didn't get around to working on the rest of the games because in 1995, I got online and programming all but stopped. I spent all my free time pretty much online beating Usenet and messing around IRC. And yeah, the size of my phone bills, they, they, they bring that in cold sweats now just thinking about them. So there was some programming done because my, my ISP was Argonet. Um, and they supplied a piece of software called Voyager. And I, th there were problems with Voyager. There were, there were various faults. So a lot of what I was doing was just little hacks and unofficial fixes and things like that. Um, and it was necessary to do that because some of, some of their programs were a little bit unstable. And a good example is the email client, Posty, which amongst users had the nickname Toasty because it often burnt the email files. And thinking about it now, I suspect it was me that came up with that nickname. Um, but along came Voyager 2, um, which embraced pests like me by making it easier to add stuff to it with a system called, I think, VIX, which stood for Voyager Internet Extension. Might have been VIX, I'm actually thinking about it now. Um, and Web Change was born as a VIX, or a VIXEN. It was a simple, single-tasking BBC Basic program that I clicked a button in Voyager to run whenever I updated my website. And all it did was go through the files and add a last updated date to web pages based on their timestamps. Um, when I bought Wimp Basic from Claire's, because I'd never learned Wimp programming, I wrote a better version of WebChange and gave it a few more features um, and released it as a product. It was very, very slow though, on, especially on pages large sites with lots of pages. Um, there was one user who had such a large site that he used to set it going overnight and leave it when he went to bed so that it'd be finished by the time he got up the next morning. And I used to use advertise it in the magazines with badly drawn adverts featuring two dodgy spies with even dodgier names discussing it. And the, the main jokes in those were the, the greeting between them and their names, which you can see there are um, their main names are Agent Does the Spot on Your Chinovich, and it is Agent Just Until I Pick It Off. And here's another, ex here's another example of one. Um, this is later the same year from that advert, in fact, um, just after the Wakefield show. Um, and you can see by this point, I was using a bit more color and that was a quarter page ad, whereas the other one was a much smaller one. Web change became my core product. Um, I was using it a lot myself, which for some of my websites, that helped steer its development based on what I needed. Um, and it evolved in how it was written. It went from a purely Wimp Basic program through to having a Wimp Basic front end and a C back end to the current version, which is entirely written in C, although it's still got a separate front and back end. Um, it makes it a lot faster. Um, and that, obviously that means I, I finally did learn to program the WIMP. And it's also now free to download. There's no manual for it though, um, but who reads manuals anyway? Okay, so that brings us up to the current, the current date. Um, obviously I run riscosatory.com. Uh, my, when I first registered Riscosatory, my original plan was for it to be a repository of RiscOS software, hence the name being a play on that, Riscos, Repository, Repository, not as some people like to tease, Suppository. Um, the idea was that if someone left the platform, I could ask them for permission to throw their various titles there so they just didn't vanish, which kind of harks back to what Phil was talking about earlier about the preservation. Um, but then Drove went, Drove went into archive mode so I made the hasty decision to turn it into a new site. And I think I can safely say that it's now the most frequently updated RiskOS news site. Um, other stuff I run, uh, you've got riscosatory.co.uk, which is where I host um, RiskOS mailing lists. The, it's, it's hosted separately from riscosatory.com. Uh, because Mailman comes as part of the package, which is what I use for the mailing lists. Um, 
and the advantage with having a mailing list there is it means because the email address will be something at riscosity.co.uk, you've got Riscos in the name. Um, I registered riscosusers.org.uk some time ago, but I don't actually use it for very much at the moment, um, other than having the Bristol subdomain, which currently redirects to the Bristol Riscos users mailing list. And another domain I've got, which I've had a few years, which I don't think I've ever mentioned to anyone before, is rogoto.net. I don't use it, it at, at all yet. The intention is to use it as a URL shortcut for internal, internal use on Riscosity. So it's a sort of RiscOS go-to. Um, it'll be easier for me to remember the addresses of websites and to change them if and when necessary, because the current system, it's a bit of a pain if I need to change a website address. And why is that not responding? And lastly, the RiscOS Awards website. Um, we've had an annual awards poll going back all the way to before we had the internet run by the magazines. Um, in the internet era, Drobe ran them for a while, then Iconbar did, and a couple of others after that, but it eventually stopped and we went for a year or two with no poll. And I thought that was a shame. An awards poll is a nice public nod to developers, etc. So I decided to bring it back and give it a home of its own. And what I'd like to do at some point is go back over all those old awards polls, both the online ones and in the magazines, and archive the results on the site. The problem with that, though, is finding the time. And that's that. So ask me anything. If I can work out how to stop sharing, there it is. Go. No. Ask you anything. So, when's the manual going to be finished then? <laughs> <laughs> Who needs manuals? <laughs> I will start it once I've sorted out my missing uh, copy of Ovation Pro. Missing copy? What? Yeah, I've got the. Yeah. I've got it on Windows, and I've installed it on Linux as well because I'm on the Wine. But I really need the RiskOS version. Once I've got that, I can work on whichever platform I'm on at any given time. Oh, that's a question in the chat. What about the software software collection being on Pling Store? Um, yeah, I suppose I could do, but I've, I, the idea was that for download, the software will eventually be for free from the website. Um, so the CD is just a way of giving me some money at shows. It's not really a product I push as such. I'm just getting a chat out myself. Thank you, Ray, there a foray into um, 3D printed Raspberry Pi cases. Say that again, sorry, Bob. Uh, you made a foray into 3D printed Raspberry Pi cases. Which you yes. think, I don't think you mentioned uh, in that no, in this exercise. Um, so, did you design those uh, on a PC or on RiskOS? How, how did no, that come it was, about? It was done on a PC in, in using a program called TurboCAD. Okay. I don't think there's anything suitable on RiskOS that would have been able to do it and produce the output file for the format that was needed for the printing company I used. Oh, okay, I was about to say, is it your own 3D printer? Or, or no, no, no. It was, it was printed by a company in Belgium, I think they're based. Okay. Um, called Materialize. And the, the type of the, the printing process that it was using is selective laser sintering. Um, right, SLS rather than SLA. Sorry? SLS rather than SLA. Yes. Um, and yeah, it, it, this is an industrial process, really, is for prototyping and whatnot. Okay, thank you. more questions <laughs> um can you tell me more about the um process of um creating the games um it's so long since i've written them <laughs> um yeah i mean they were all written in bbc basic apart from floopy um and like i said the first one i literally looked at the 6502 code i'd written and and recreated what I'd written in, in basic. Um, 
What I didn't do was the sensible thing, which was to create a library as I did it to make each subsequent one easier. Um, I literally wrote each one from scratch. And they, you, none, of, none of them are perfect because I, I sort of cut corners here and there. But there, there's no, there was no standard process for writing them. It, it was just working as I was with the people and working out what I needed to do. Do you remember anything about the um, uh, the um, voice generators you use for um, games like Drop Rock or Escape from Xeria? Right, okay. Um, the first version of Escape from Xeria, I used sound sample. Um, I used Armadeus. Okay. Uh, I think I didn't actually create my own sound samples, but I might use some of the ones which came with it. Hmm. Um, but from drop uh, from Guardians of the Labyrinth onwards, I'd started using Coconizer to write tracker music, and mm -hmm. I used I think I used tracker music for pretty much all of them after that point. Mm -hmm. um, which that was part of the problem, part of the reason they didn't work on the Risk PC, um, because I don't think the version of Coconizer that I was using at that point worked on it also i think if i remember rightly actually when when risk west 3.1 came out there's a problem with that as well i remember if you, if you as you were pressing the keys to play the game the tracker music sped up which was um fun <laughs> but yeah it was, it was it, i used music for most of the game mm -hmm. all right well, thanks very much Vince. Good to have you do a talk for change rather than <laughs> rather you running around recording everyone else's talks. Yeah. Right. So now we've got a spare spare ten minutes. Chris Evans, are you there? <laughs> I know Chris I did post in the chat earlier, Chris has written a blog about things he's been up to this year. And he can just pop up and tell us a bit about it. Can you hear me now? Yeah, hello Chris. Oh. Oh, although you're cutting in and out weirdly. Nope, you've gone mute again now. It's not actually muted, but we've lost his sound. Yeah, he's lost it for some reason. Uh, I'll try, try using my uh, mobile phone. Oh, that's in, working. We can hear you. A, yeah. a different user. So Chris Evans via mobile. Yeah. Sure. You're on my, my phone, phone with my, deck, my laptop. laptop. Yeah, it's getting a slightly odd echo, but it's yeah. working. Right. right. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm... Does that mean now? You can hear me okay now? Yes. Okay, well, thanks very much thanks for very me much jump for in here. here. Oh. Even though, Even though it's ironic, ironic that, uh, I uh, suggested a virtual show, I know, nearly two years ago. I was uh, about the, the least organised of everyone. It's great to see uh, all the other talks and that. Uh, as an exhibitor, you don't normally get to see it. It's, certainly found out some interesting information about various things there um the briefly got a couple of things that uh, i can talk about um just look at my notes on my trusty risk pc um yeah we've been uh if people can go to my home page and uh, the, on, the, on the website in the blog section talks about how um uh you know the last year and what cj micros and um, 4D have been doing risk costs and personal wise. There's a fair bit of information. We've got various new products like adjustable resolution mice. Um, we managed to source some more power switches for Philips monitors because in the retro market, which is quite a lot of their market that we now sell into, there was um, there's, it's amazing the number of people that want the full retro experience 
of having um, a CRT monitor. So and you couldn't repair them because you couldn't get the power switch is one of the frequently, one of the frequent, frequent components that we used to go on them. Um, but uh, we do that, but uh, no, the, so, yes, sorry, going back to the adjustable resolution mouse, the nice thing is that it's very useful for people doing CAD type work or um, artwork, and it doesn't matter what operating system on it, it just works. Um, the, one of the other things that we have managed to do is we've, um, a lot of people know that we've been doing the um, ZIDE FS um, sort of interfaces. Let's get that round to something a little bit more like that. Um, and, you know, you plug in uh, a 40 foot pin adapter that then allows you to use compact flash or um, an SD card, but it's actually better really that um, people um, use something like an MSATA drive. So we've managed to locate some suitable adapters. So we're now gonna be selling uh, the ZIDFS um, with that. Um, then um, we've uh, got, you know, the Rapido IG, which very grateful to Rule, who've actually done some X or throw in, actually it was, I think who did some tweaks to uh, improve the monitor compatibility there. But uh, the Rapido IG is, uh, um, you know, really nice uh, complete system, you know, full power control of, you know, soft of the power, you know, soft off. Um, and uh, we've got some new cases for it um, that, uh, um, you know, are nice. In actual fact, I'll just pick up one and show that. This is an actual fact, um, this case here, don't know how well you can see that. Um, this one actually has got uh, a Raspberry Pi 4 in it, uh, but uh, we've got the same case just to my sitting to my left, which has a um, the I get V5 in it, um, and um, it's a, it's a nice case that you can have an optical drive inside, um, SSD drive, and uh, you know, it can be used in uh, tower or desktop case, although in desktop node, for some obscure reason, the CD drive is effectively upside down. Yeah. But um, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a rather strange one. Now, when, um, so we've got those on special offer, the Rapido IG, but moving on just to the Raspberry Row 4, which obviously is now flavor of the month, um, we've got, two versions again of that, you know, the standard and the pro version. Um, now we needed to have a decent heat sink, we thought for it. So we've, we, we found these ones, which I think are gonna be well up to the job for that. Um, and uh, we'll do what's required. Um, we did have to modify our Pi control um, board so that uh, we could be use it with it but um, that was fairly easy for Andrew to do and so we've done that. Um, what else? Oh yes with the with the raw with the Pi 4 um, in that case you can have up to 10 USB sockets if you want you know two at the front um, uh, five at the back and the three internal and that does a good job there. Um, and we'll be offering it in both two, four and eight gig, gigabyte versions. Um, again, details on links from the blog post on our website. And the other brief thing I will mention is that, uh, I'm sorry to say that I think Brexit is gonna affect us quite a bit because uh, qu quite a lot of our sales are to the Europe. And uh, in particular, low value sales will be um, a bit of a nightmare for, for people to buy um, uh, in Europe um, because of the, the customs system and handling fees and one thing or another. But um, apart from that, um, that's the brief history of uh, uh, 
situation at CJE and uh, um, please read the blog. Um, and if anyone's got any questions, um, I hopefully can answer anything. Thank you, Chris. Good to pop in and give us a big, quick update. I'll tell you, that's all your nice new storage in the background. It certainly looks neater than the old shop. Oh, yes, it's it's uh, it's it's lovely to have a lot of extra. We, we, we spent about three thousand pounds on racking to uh, put it all, kiss it all out properly. Oh, there's a quick question in the chat. Is there any news on an update to Photodesk? um no to be honest uh, that communications um it can be a little bit difficult because uh the 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 maintainers that uh, she isn't their first language and i'm certainly no good at uh, um uh, at foreign languages but that is something that uh, i do need to invest a bit more time in trying to progress that a bit more I guess it is our only kind of photo editing package, isn't it? So yeah. it kind of needs to be kept going. Well, it's fairly mature. Fairly mature. I know one or two people have thought have come up with a few extra suggestions, but they're they're, they're really nice, certainly certainly to do, but uh, have uh, no any no uh, information at the moment on that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chris. It's so good to see you again. Thank you very much. We will see you next year at a real, the real physical show. We certainly hope so. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for all your efforts. No problem. Right, now half six. Technically, the show's over, but um, I know there were lots of questions people still had for Andrew earlier, because we kind of had to cut off his end of his talk very abruptly. So if anyone is still on who has questions about our comp or risk cost developments they can throw them in now other than that i guess general oh, if anybody wants to know more about the new forte machine um yeah indeed i'm in a good book i've got a general suggestion i'll show it, say that in a bit what, what's what's up david no, no, I've just got a general suggestion. I was thinking about it earlier. If there's another Zoom thing like going forward, I've got a suggestion to make. How, how about um, if, if you have breakout rooms and have a store like a breakout room, so each person that's exhibited, exhibiting has a breakout room, so you can go to that particular breakout room like you would go to the stall, then have another breakout room for talks, and then another breakout room for general chat. So it's more like an actual show rather than everybody having to do everything. And then you can get more sales and actually target your audience like you would at a proper show. We did have a brief play with the breakout rooms, but I think on the basic package for Zoom, you're limited to only, might be only two, possibly four. I can't remember breakout rooms. And it was slightly odd in that you had to, the yeah. administrator had yeah, to manually yeah, allocate people to rooms. It was a bit weird. So we decided it wasn't worth the effort at the moment, but maybe, yeah, if we do this in another year's time, we might have another investigation. Sorry, say, say that again, you're breaking up, sorry. Oh, so I said the breakout rooms didn't work very well because you, when we tried them, you had to manually <laughs> allocate people to them and it was a bit odd. I think London C++ used to use something like that. I'm trying to, it wasn't on Zoom, but it was on another meetup platform. We'll try and find which one it was. It worked very well, actually. I'd be concerned that it would result in a little bit too much fragmentation of a relatively small user base where people, no, no, people no, want no, to listen. No, I mean, the show, so it's, it's, it'll be exactly like it would be on the show. You'd literally go into where, like, if I wanted to talk to Andrew, I'd go to Andrew's Arcom um, breakout room, and Andrew could then talk to me, and then it's more, it's more like a show, isn't it, rather than everybody trying to. Like it is, but then you'd be missing whoever was talking next. Um, like it's very sad to that. Like it has been this year, though, isn't it? I just, I just think of everybody involved, really. I, I just thought it was easier for everybody then. Um, I've got to admit, I've enjoyed hearing other people's talks this year <laughs> for the first time. And Tom Williamson just pointed out that anyone who's following on YouTube would miss, they miss 
use junks because they can't switch. <laughs> But couldn't but but if if it was a real show when 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 the Wi-Fi sheep has been there anyway they've either been in the foyer area or during the show so you could switch couldn't you between the foyer room and then the talk room because the, the Wi-Fi sheep people and the YouTube people don't follow people around anyway do they they just stay in two stay in two rooms don't they well, whatever. I, I, I just thought yeah. it was a, an idea, but um, whatever. It's something to think about. Yeah, I mean, that's the first time we've tried this, so it's all a learning experience, as they say. I have a question for Andrew. Hi, Robert. Hi. Andrew, a uh, couple of things. Is the version of Fireworks Pro that you spoke about yep. available on store at the moment? Yeah, I put, although it's still technically a beta, uh, it is available as an upgrade on store uh, as of last night. And I noticed on your uh, aid memoir, you had a note about uh, ProCAD. Yeah, um, basically, as many of you know, uh, David Snell, who produces ProCAD, has had to step back because of family commitments. Um, and um, his time to actually develop products and do risk of things that is, is sort of down to one day a week of free time that he has to split between, you know, more or less everything that he does. So um, he's basically passed on the source code to ProCrowd to me um, so that the product can be maintained and continued. And my hope is that, uh, although I haven't pushed him on it, my hope is that the rest of his software will follow um certainly we're uh facilitating him selling it through Blinkstar uh at the moment um and having been able to reproduce his build environment i can build his programs so uh as it happens there he actually programs with the same libraries that i do so it's actually quite a, a pleasing fit that i think i only had to make one or two very minor changes to get procad to to suit what I, you know my my exact build environment so um yeah, my intention is to have a new version of that out very shortly. Um, tweet sort of. Um, uh, I, I was have cosmetic to... tweaks, but nothing fun nothing functional at this stage because I don't want to break things for people who are relying on the program. I was hoping you were going to mention an undo redo facility. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd, lo we'd love that in lots of programs. I do wonder. Well, I, I do. I do wish programmers of older programs would, who are revisiting their programs. Now that we have so much RAM, one wonders whether the sort of snapshot of the current state of play could be stored every few minutes. And even if you can't implement undo, could you sort of restore document state to, you know, just, just grab the whole document, stick it in a block of memory and uh, with the idea that it could be restored back to that position as a, at a later date without you know worrying too much about the undo history uh, of, every, of, every, of every operation um, but yeah it's not not the only program that undo is has, has come up as a hot topic no no but it's the most important uh, I, I agree it's <laughs> important anyway listen it's, it's thanks to you and all the other presenters it's been a wonderful day I think I, I said to Brian in the chat, I can't, I can't imagine how it really could have been much better, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I've enjoyed listening to everybody. i say for the first time, I can listen to other people's talks. It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. The yeah. Fireworks Pro um, update is on the web, on the Pling store, because I've just bought it. Well, I await better, confirmation. Better, better hurry down and do some, uh, do some approvals then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Andrew, I also updated um, Unicontrol. It says uh, four ten on the site, but I've updated my risk or size. It just says four ten still, April twenty fourteen. Right. The, the when I my notation for updates is that if it's just a tweak to the to something non critical, uh, I'll put like an A or a B or a C to in indicate that it's changed. So with four ten, four ten A. The main change was actually just some uh, sort of RISCOS 5.28 related uh, bug fixes stroke All right. uh, tweaks to some of the user interface components, like I think it was the, the setup utility and the con and, and uni con 
Do I need to update the Windows file as well? No, there, there was nothing in the window. It was purely just sort of a couple of On things the risk were right. breaking with 5.28. Um, so I needed to make some minor code changes to, uh, to sort them out. So I did. But because the main software in the Windows end and the and the, and the module hadn't changed, I just left the version number at 4.10 and stuck an A on the end to indicate that it was different. Right, thanks. So it's like this, this, the latest Iris is called the uh, Iris Org. Uh, Org 2020C because it's the third third release of basically the same thing but with minor minor tweaks to uh, to fix little little side things. Nobody's come round yet and asked who's eating and what pub we're going to. Can we have a virtual version of that? <laughs> <There you are. laughs> I think we all just order on Deliveroo and all get it arrived together. <laughs> <laughs> Watching each other eat. This wouldn't go to which pub we like. That's true, yeah. Whichever one has got the best beer you can go to. Yeah, that's right. Not in Wales. Nor in central Scotland, I think, either. That's right, yeah. So. So, um, Andrew, um, yeah. safe store three then. Um, okay. So yeah. The current state, obviously, is, is that you're out to people who, who wish to try it out. Um, is that yeah, the basically, case? Basically, Alan's been working on that during lockdown straight this summer. Um, he sort of scaled back a bit of his development time a bit, so I'm trying not to push him too hard on it. Uh, but basically, there are a number of improvements in both to uh, to what it can do, and also uh, reliability of dealing with peculiar situations with with particular hardware setups that could trip things over in the past. So, what we have is a much more robust and better product all round. Um, the limit, sort of relatively limited number of headline new features, but altogether a much better backup program. Um, and if anybody is, I know some people uh, paid for an upgrade last week, you know, the, the last real Wakefield, I think, um, because we hope to get it out very quickly and it kind of slipped. Um, so, you know, if anybody falls into that boat and wants to get access to the latest code, please get in touch. And I will pass on things for people to play with and test. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously, if you have feedback and, and suggestions, then uh, they'll be gratefully taken on board. I'm not wishing to, uh, to to do a leading question, but I caught that you said that the uh, Pine Book was in limited supply. Um, yeah, there's a it's it's it's, it's flipping COVID again. Uh, we we ha we've got um, basically we, we we've got just like literally a, a very small number left. Um, initially we were thought we were sold out, but some of the people who paid deposits uh, decided to change their mind and uh, decided to wait for Wi-Fi uh, in the future. So we've been able to free up a little bit of stock, but um, yeah, the problem has been the, sc is the screens. Um, as you probably know, the, the, the Pine Book uh, or Arm Book has a terrific IPS 1080p screen and uh, it was always a bit, you know, I wondered how on earth they could do that for the price. Um, but with COVID, component costs on laptops have shot up because every man and his dog wants a laptop to work from home. Um, so laptops that you could buy for sort of 250, 300 pounds, now the cheapest laptop of a sensible specification you can get is about 450 to 500. Uh, as a, a, one of the ways this has got turned about is that screen costs have shot up. So basically they can't produce the Pine Book for the cost that uh, they sell it for. Um, and they don't want to put the prices up, which is frustrating for us because we quite happily pay twice the price for the stock. Um, but they don't feel they can do that. And therefore they put a hiatus on manufacturing until the, uh, the screens are available at a sensible price again. Um, we are investigating uh, the Pine tab that they offer, which is the same chipset. Uh, and that, so that may be an interim product um, and then longer term, but I must stress longer term because I think we're just, it's quite a ways away. Uh, we are doing uh, groundwork on Pinebook Pro, um, 
which is a completely different process of the rock chip processor. Um, but I mean, um, problem is if I say, oh yeah, that's coming, then I, I put the kibosh on existing sales. But I'd be lying to you if I didn't say it was being worked on, but the problem is a risk cost port takes a long time and the rock chip port is particularly difficult and particularly complicated. And therefore to tell somebody to wait or not wait, it's a very tricky situation. You're probably going to be waiting quite a long time. Um, but I'm not going to say it's not happening because that would be a lie. Uh, but equally, we don't have a boot, you know, we don't have it running on, on, you know, it's not like I'm sort of wait three months and I'll have it out. It's, you know, there is code we can do things on a rock chip, but we don't have sort of the necessary graphics drivers. The, the uh, for example, the uh, Pinebook Pro uses something called EDP, um, for which is a display port related standard uh, for driving the, uh, the, the panel, um, which is very different to the, uh, the methodology used by the original Pinebook. So, uh, you know, it's a complex job. The other thing is that with the original Pinebook, um, the actual screen was initialized by U-Boot. So what we're able to do with the original Pinebook was actually piggyback off U-Boot to bring Risk OS in on top of that with working screen and everything else. With Pinebook Pro, U-Boot basically doesn't work with a lot of the hardware that's built in. So U-Boot just acts as a, as a trigger layer for the, uh, the, the, the Linux operating system, which then has its own hardware drivers that actually bring up the, the screen and all the other bits and bobs in it. So for Pinebook Pro, we've actually got to write low level drivers for more or less everything. Um, so it, it, it is a, it's a large amount of work um, to do that. So yeah, that's the situation on, on, on our book, Pinebook. As it is, we remain fully committed to the ARM book product and, and I've got new operating system update waiting in the wings. Um, I was holding back because of 528. So, you know, obviously that, that will come out with uh, based on the 5.28 um, and we'll be continue to upgrade the specification capabilities of that product going forwards because it's obviously it's been our big, big seller during 20, 2020. Um, so that's a product that we're very much committed to. Uh, so uh, just a quick question on the um, disk capacity. Um, mm -hmm. Are you selling upgrades for the disk capacity with um, with pre-installed Linux on there so you can swap? Oh, I there? see. Um, I did at one stage have a whole load of 64 gig uh, modules in. Uh, gradually, they got whittled away, so they're out of stock now. But uh, if it, I mean, I can order in a batch from from from, from, from Taiwan if if I, if people are, are keen, um, and then I can pre-flash that with uh, Manjaro or whatever. That people people would like. Uh, I've done that for a number of people when they bought the machines, so it's not a problem. And I have the, uh, the USB flashing tool for flashing the EMC's E and MC modules. Um, so that's a simple task uh, if if people want that. I'm just looking at some of the some of the, the chat. Uh, IDE chat in the. Yeah, I was just trying to see what was, what was going on. Stuff rather than what was the old state standard. When you mentioned five to eight, is that the the latest beta for the ARM X6 DRS was very nearly five to eight, wasn't it? But yes, I mean basically we wanted to roll that out to see if there were any bugs in it, so that if there were, we could feed that back to Rubble, um, so that things could be squashed before uh, the final five point two eight went out. Um, the the, the RMX six beaters were instrumental in getting quite a few things fixed in the WIMP over the summer, so uh, um, that was a very very productive thing. Uh, but I didn't want to do any more until again until there'll be a there'll be a, a well it'll technically for RMX six it'll technically be a five point two nine because it contains elements that aren't in the standard rule five two eight like the um, isochronous USB stuff. So we'll be putting out a five point two nine that is sort of snapshotted from the same time, but with the necessary operating system changes that uh, that, that entails. Uh, probably something similar for the for the armbook, to be perfectly honest. Right. Otherwise, things like time, uh, time machines and things will ship with with rule five point two eight um, from from now on um, until we issue further updates in due course. Similarly, uh, obviously, Riscos Direct 
we held the reason we held back the, uh, the Raspberry Pi edition or Raspberry Pi 4 edition of Direct was that we wanted to be in sync with with Wiscos Open. Uh, we felt it. Uh, there's still such a stigma associated with a perception of trying to fork operating systems that we felt it was uh, much much better to uh, to go with a 5.28 basis for direct as well as for the, the real products so that direct could you know it could be seen as what it is which is an expansion of what rule are doing rather than intending as sort of competition to what rule are doing And then obviously on Forte, I don't know how much of it came across in the talk, but uh, because Forte has been done uh, alongside Tom at Wi-Fi Sheep, who is the face of Riscos Direct, we've taken the Riscos Direct stuff as a basis for the Forte, and then we've built on a whole load of extra software on top of that to sort of create a, a Riscos Direct plus, as it were, with commercial software um, built on top of that uh, to give people a, an even better experience um, with that. You're doing all right, Andrew. I think about six, nine months ago, I was worried and anxious, but now it all seems to be coming together. Everyone is um, working, or seeing off the same thing. So, I, I do have a question to Andrew. Yeah. It, it's about, you were, use, you were showing on your um, show, you did, you're using Avalanche as your... Yes. Yeah. Now, I use it all the time, but... I can't, it's not stable for me. On, on the um, Armex 6, it only lives for about four or five minutes and it drops. It's not a problem because I don't lose any data on the PC I'm looking at, but it takes me 10 seconds to get it back up again. Um, can you comment on that? <laughs> um, do you have alignment exceptions on or off? Um, Would be my first I, I'm not sure. I uh, to, I, I, to be honest with you, I'll be totally straight with you. The first time I looked at Avalanche for a very, very long time was yesterday, uh, when I was actually trying to sort of set up and re everything up for this demo today. Because this is the most preparation I've put into a talk for, I think, ever since I started doing talks, because I actually had to get all the equipment working together in advance and, uh, and on all, all, everything pre scripted. So, yeah, I haven't had any trouble with with Avalanche on the Forte or on the uh, on, on, on the TIX system. Well, yeah, I but but I do have I do have that disabled and I'm also not trying to do anything fancy with sound or anything like that. So I am running quite a ver you know it's a ver fairly virgin avalanche system with 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 nothing fancy and nothing um, and, and with with alignment exceptions disabled because uh, in order to get iris more stable i found that alignment exceptions off were helpful with that which as an aside is a peculiar very peculiar because yeah. iris, is, iris is such a modern application and built using all the latest compiler twiddles for modern processors that i'm very surprised it's it, it, there are alignment things but uh, the program is delving into that literally as we speak to find out why that's the case. But nevertheless, I have the alignments exceptions off for that reason um, on the demo machines. And I wonder, you know, that that's the only thing I can think of that might be slightly different because otherwise most people tend to say that the ARM X6 is a bit more forgiving than most systems. Um, um, well, my experience is that with the Raspberry Pis, that I can run Avalanche for 20 minutes, half an hour before it crashes. But with the Amex 6, it's normally two, three, four, five minutes. And it, when I'm doing shopping at, at uh, Tesco, let's say, or, or Waitrose, I've got to restart it at least 10 times to get my order through, which is a bit, a bit of a nuisance. I'll, I'll go and check, see if I've got the alignment exceptions off. It's in the well, other... That's all, that's all I can suggest. The other, the other option that I didn't actually show in the talk, but which I actually set up yesterday as an alternative, is if you're running Windows uh, 7 or 10 Pro, um, you have a one machine uh, remote access license as part of your operating system, which you can turn on with a tick box. Uh, if you right click my computer and go sort of properties and no. in there, you can turn on remote access. And then you can use RDP client, which is actually slightly faster and probably slightly more robust. Mm. But, uh, no, okay, I'm trying to get to the bottom of this crash. I'll, I'll go and check to see if I've got the alignment exceptions off. Beyond that, I mean, 
I'd have to try it on my Armex 6 and I haven't done, but my other suggestion would be try just sort of, if you make rename your boot sequence to sort of X boot or something, and just copy in a virgin boot sequence from the recovery drive, just just in case there's something on your system that's, that's much more than that. It's been happening for the last two years on any machine. I mean, all machines I use Avalanche on, it, it crashes out. It's some sort of timing issue, and the Arm X6 is the worst. Um, so I've, I've got I've got to the extent that I put Avalanche on my desktop, on my pin board, so that I can start it up again quickly because I can't do without it. Okay. As I say, given that I don't use the program, it's very difficult for me to answer your question. Yeah, and I, as I say, somebody saying that's less stable on that, I mean, that wouldn't fit with my own experiences of Armex 6s, which tend to be a lot more bulletproof than any of my other machines. Other programs, I agree, but particularly with Avalanche, it, it yeah. is, in my case... I mean, it's Cortex, Cortex A9, like, like, like Panda, and, uh, and that's very similar to A8, which is Beagle. Um, when you're talking about the Pi, which generation of Pi are you talking about? Uh, three. See, that's ARM V8, which is yeah. less compatible than the ARM V7. In, in... I don't know. Um, check the alignment exceptions. That's really all I can say. I can imagine that it would suffer from alignment issues given its age. I don't... That, that's why I'm sort of saying that would be my first port of call. But I can't, you know, uh, sorry, <laughs> I can't do any more than that. Anybody else in the meantime? Chris, we've still got 50 people in here. <laughs> I think then in that case, I will just go and grab the cup of tea that Steph has put left at the doorstep. Uh, for me. <laughs> okay, I'm back. And I've got alignment exceptions on. Okay, try it turned off. Try and turn it off. Okay. You may find it's a more stable program with it off. Um, to, to explain, um, you, you probably know about alignment exceptions, but for those that don't, um, basically um, ARM v7 processors don't like half-word operations. Uh, in, um, and some 32-bit code for Ionics era, uh, where that was okay, uh, did that. And therefore, you'll find that they generate errors on ARM v7. Now, often these errors are non-fatal and you can turn the errors off uh, so that they don't actually get sort of displayed and the programs continue. And what we often find is that with uh, alignment exception disabled, programs that would otherwise crash uh, continue to work uh, as normal as it were. Um, it is effectively masking a, pro you know, a fault in the program but on the other hand, my attitude is that if it, if it allows a program to work that would otherwise crash, um, then um, unless it causes any knock-on effects, and it, and it rarely, if ever, ever seems to, to, to do that, uh, I'd rather have my programs continuing to work than crashing because they're not 110% ARMv7 safe. Uh, that, that is a controversial opinion, I know, uh, but I'm of the opinion that we need to preserve all software as much as we can, and therefore, you know, if changing that setting allows a number of legacy applications to continue working, then I would rather have those co applications continue working than have them crash out horribly. It makes sense because I don't use the Avalanche all the time. So it's mostly for shopping and uh, occasionally I do the Zoom on, on the Avalanche because I've got a bigger screen rather than this tiny screen I'm looking at now. So I could just switch off the exceptions when I'm using Avalanche and switch them back on again for normal use. I have a follow-up question to that. It isn't to you, Andy, necessarily. I try to get hold of events by writing to the... I'm on, I'm on the... Um, you mean from Adrian? Right, events, it's a... Yeah, from, from Adrian Leeds. Yeah. I, I, I've written twice and I've had no reply, and so I don't know what's happened to it. I, it was offering a, a beta testers, but didn't reply to my request. I he has changed the email address recently. Ah, so... I think you have to, if you were using the old Yahoo address, it's changed its address to same as his web, website, send it, send it IRI, send it iri .co .uk. Okay. Um, so just check, it's the same for same bit before the at sign, but it's the at send .co .uk rather than at yahoo.com. Um, so do check that. The other thing is that I think Adrian um, has been sort of a bit, 
he's always spasmodic in his communication. Um, and I think during lockdown that was aggravated. Um, so don't be surprised. I mean, put it this, this put it this way. Don't don't take it personally if you don't get immediate replies. He, he'll, he'll often reply after a few weeks or or, or, or longer. Um, so no, I'm quite relaxed about it, but I would like. I thought I'd say because I'm having trouble with with, um, with avalanche. Yeah, I mean, I think it'll be brilliant. I mean, I, I I would have liked it for some of the demonstrations I did today. To be perfectly honest. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I wonder if anyone else on this call is using it. Anyone? I don't think he's released it outside of his own. He's a testing. The only other thing possibly to look at the difference between the Arm X6 and the Pi is whether you've got um, high vector or low vector ROMs on the two machines because I have found that, that can make a difference between program stability and not necessarily the way around you'd expect. So that may be something else to have a look at, because I think our comp stuff usually ships with low vector ROMs, whereas the rule standard stuff is high vector. So it's, it would be a difference to look at. That's interesting, Steve. That's, that's a, that, I, I'm, I've got the standard Andrew um, issue, so it would be low vector, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I would have thought it would have been the other way around, and I would have thought that would have made it more stable on the Arm X6, but I'm but not... I've, I've encountered a couple of occasions recently where it's not the case, so I'm just highlighting it as, as an out there possibility that it might be. Yeah, we do offer both high and low vector ROMs on the download site, so... Uh, yeah. But I do, I do, given that Avalanche is from sort of 2010 era, which is very much around the time of the ARM v7 changeover, yeah. I, I would look at that first. But I mean, Steve, Steve makes also a valid point. Okay. And, like, and like, like Steve, I've seen it both ways, although more so that low vector helps. But, you know, see how you go. Yeah. What, what triggers the, the, it's... the thing that triggers the crash is moving, is scrolling the screen around. If I, I'm looking at, say, a shopping site and I scroll down quickly, then it will just drop out. It's normally that. But sometimes it drops out without any interaction, but scrolling certainly increases the likelihood of it crashing. Yeah. Okay, thanks. That, that's, I don't want to. Um, yeah, we, we, we tend to use on our arm X6, the um, alignment exceptions turned on. Um, and I've never really had any trouble with um, Avalanche. I mean, I don't use it often, uh, but it seems to be pretty reliable on our X6. Uh, there are other options you could look at. Um, in the Avalanche choices, there are things to do with encodings in the choices. And um, some of these things you could try turning off to see if it's just part of uh, you know, there's various aspects to the VNC protocol and the server and the client negotiate. They, you know, the client says, I can cope with these sorts of things. And the server says, well, in that case, I'll, 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 I'll give you the information this way. So um, you, you might be able to make it a bit more stable by turning off certain options uh, within the support. But, and similarly at the server end, um, the opposite end, um, at the PC, uh, you might try altering those, but I have absolutely no idea which of them would be likely to be the culprit. Uh, it, you'd have to be kind of very methodical and trial and error and write down everything to make sure you could work out what, what's actually fixed it. But that, that might be another option. What server are you using, John? Do you know which program to track the server? Um, VNC Real, I think. Is it Real? Real VNC? Okay. Real that's VNC. I think but, that's commercial for the server now, isn't it? Sorry? And I think, I think I'm using the native um, Windows 10 server. I didn't know there was one. <laughs> there, is, there is one. It's turned off normally, I think. Um, right. I mean, I was using in my tests here, and I've got the reason I'm being puzzled at you is that obviously I've only been testing on the Forte and the uh, TIX, but I have not had a single crash in literally hours of running them. That's great. Yeah. I'd love that same experience. Uh, I, so I was using type VNC to 
as the server on the TIX. And on the RISCOS machines, I was using Jeff, the, very, the very latest 2020 build of Jeffrey's uh, RISCOS, Jeffrey Lee's RISCOS mm -hmm. VNC server. I have to say, I mean, big shout out to, to Jeffrey. In the past, I've seen RISCOS VNC and it's been horrifically treacled. You know, I'm going back sort of seven, eight years. But now he's 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 got that he's got that really fluid. I mean, in honest in all honesty, I would say that the VNC experience I've had to the RISCOS machines has actually been better than the VNC experience I've had to the uh, the Windows machine, the Windows Seven system that I was running there. I mean, Windows Ten maybe maybe better. I don't know, but um, certainly my experience. I was expecting to have a much better experience on with going into a Windows machine than into a RISCOS one, and it's it's actually been the opposite. The the RISCOS machine has been really impressive. Unless you try and do really punish it by making it, you know, press F. If you press F12 and make it scroll the entire screen line at a time, then yeah, it crawls to a halt. But just general desktop operation, it's surprisingly good. Uh, I, you know, the Forte was, has been running essentially headlessly uh, the whole time, and so with no keyboard, mouse, with no monitor, and it's been a real pleasure to use. I, I, shocking, really, but uh, you know, it really, you know, it bodes well for the state of Riscos. Uh, in an area that I, I thought it was lagging behind, and it, absolutely not. I've got a quick question for you, Andrew, if I may. Yep. Um, how you know the combo machine? How how much was it? Because you didn't mention the price. With with the uh, the TIX, you mean? With the, with the with the PC and and, and titanium in. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically, the price on that is going to depend exactly what specification of system you have. So, if you go for like a, a, a sort of fairly minimal PC, um, then the price can come down. Right. The truth is, though, you don't okay. want to look. At, I mean, it's one of the, in the nicest way, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. <laughs> it's not quite like that, but I mean, the the, the, okay. the money is sort okay. of, it's a sort of thirteen hundred pound plus system. Depending on the specification, yeah. because if you think about yeah. it, just the you know the titanium well, board, that, that, it's a, a five hundred pound titanium that, board. You've got two machines sort of together, isn't it? So, several hundred pounds of PC. Just the power supply for the system is a couple of hundred pounds for the high quality power supply. So it, it's it's a it's a no nonsense system, and it is a super high quality system. But it is also the pricing is in line with Acorn's risk PC pricing of sort of the, the, where where machines are costing sort of thirteen hundred to to to, to eighteen hundred, um, you know, and and yeah. when you bear in mind that for a high end graphics card you can pay eight hundred pounds for a high end PC graphics card now, uh, so if you want to you know if you want to do a, a sort of you know AMD sixteen core rig with a high end graphics card, you could very easily spend three thousand pounds on the machine. It, yeah. It's a system that scales depending on what you want to spend, but it, it is not a cheap option. Yeah. And it, uh, I, I would regard it as a halo product. I mean, yeah. it, it's a product that I shall be using myself for my main work machine because it hits all the bases that I need. Uh, I, I can have real RISCOS 5, I can have virtual Acorn, I yeah. can have Windows. I'll have it all in one box and it's going to be terrific. But I also know that you know it, it is a it is a specialized product um, that not everybody would be able to justify. And to be honest with you, it probably is cheaper to buy two separate machines. You know, I, if you were to buy a RISC and a and a and a, and a, and a, and a Forte, for example, you would almost certainly pay a lot less money. Um, so it isn't aimed at somebody who is looking for the absolute best value. It's aimed at people who see the idea of having two computers in one box and think, "Wow, that's cool! I want that." Yeah, um, uh, and preferably have the pockets to, to, to pay to, to, to you know justify it. Yeah. I, I wish, to be honest with you, I wish it was cheaper. And, and when I looked at some prices today, yeah. one of the case we actually have several case designs. One has them the boards one above the other. The other case design has them back to back, so you can have one board on one side and one the other one on the other side of the motherboard tray. Yeah. Um, and one of the two chassis they see has, has, has been replaced by the manufacturer of the new model. And the new model is nearly twice the price. So I was I got a nasty shot when I looked at the pricing this morning. Um, but as I say, I mean you can probably you, I think the I think the worked out the cheapest we could do was about twelve hundred to thirteen hundred on that product. Which when you consider that a risk PC with PC card would have probably set you back about seventeen hundred. You know, and that was that's in twenty years ago money. 
then you know it's not horrific but it's still a lot more than people okay, are cool. prepared to pay these days for computers prices have, have, have dropped have seen value of computers has dropped a lot thank you okay, cheers. No, thank you for everybody thank you well, thanks for coming david and others who have you know you've disappeared Oh, I see Tom in a, in a green screen has, has appeared on my bottom yeah. corner of my list. How many, how many people have we got still still with us? Quite a few. Yeah, we can back up back up 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 after yeah. 10 hours, however long it's been. Yeah, yeah. guys, this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Brian. Spot on. Yeah, um, I've absolutely loved it. Uh, yeah, this was spot on, guys. Uh, and I think even when you know post COVID nineteen, you should still still doing it for the people that cannot get to the show. Uh, and internationally, I think that will help a lot. Uh, personal opinion. I agree. From in, I would have liked to see even more international people here. To be honest with you, but um, it was good to see. I saw um, Peter Bell in here and uh, uh, and David and Francis on the chat. So uh, and, and sorry to if I've missed anybody else. Because uh, I've not really been paying attention to, to who exactly is here, but I, it'd be nice to grow that in future for the next for the next uh, next events. Absolutely, be nice to have it uh, perhaps live streamed and then uh, have a little question and answer box that can be read out at the show, maybe. Yeah, it's, uh, I will say that the actual preparation work. <laughs> when I first heard that there wasn't going to be a real London show, I, I was actually rather thrilled because. The amount of stress and work that goes into preparing for uh, for the shows is mm. basically it knocks me out health-wise. Typically, for a month up to up to a month after the show, I'm just basically useless. Um, yeah. So um, I thought, oh, you know, I'll actually get to sort of enjoy November this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, suffice to say that I was writing a risk cost developments newsletter at three thirty in the morning the other day so um and even for me that's extremely late so uh yeah the stress has been just as big because it's been trying to get it's, whereas before we had to get product ready this time if we don't put together a decent presentation then what's the point in doing it so it's it, it's been just as stressful but in a completely different set of ways so if we had to do both of actually doing a live show and having something streamable ready i think I think you might be picking up my, my pieces <laughs> posthumously. Somebody's just messaged that we're 140 on the YouTube channel. So yeah. about 60 here. Okay. Does that take us up to 200 in total? Yeah, we're about no, I'm on, I'm on close. <laughs> Wi-Fi sheep did 51. It's, it's height. I don't know. Tom, I actually also shared uh, in California the link yesterday. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah, we did, we did 51 on the stream. There seems to be uh, a lot of a lot of people, guys, interested uh, in risk us on the. Uh, oh, sorry, Leo. I mean that that's excellent, given that people can't necessarily uh, participate through those routes. Um, yeah, I mean, guys, this was fantastic and gave the opportunity to a lot of uh, people outside of the UK and even in the UK, but far away from London, to, to actually. I worked on the door. At, I've often worked on the door at London, and normally the footfall was in the nineties. So if we we cracked well above that now, yeah, I've got. I mean, there won't be My a problem with the London show. Was always for transport, as I'm I'm up north. So my my haunt was always uh, the Wakefield show. Yeah, it's just I mean, nice to expand the circle a little bit. Personally, for me, any show is complicated because I, I work till very 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 late at night. Mm. So I work in the American time uh, office time. So any show is complicated. <laughs> this was yeah. absolutely perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So the, would you want to ditch the actual physical London show or have this as an add-on? Because people do want to come and talk to people informally and look at things hands-on and so on. You wouldn't want to lose the physical London show, would you? I certainly wouldn't. No, uh, I, think it's not, this it's is only, I think it is important, yeah. but I also think that there is a place for virtual shows. What I was trying to trying to get out was that normally we organise the Southwest show, but obviously that won't be happening because we don't believe COVID will be over by by February. 
um, and they were trying to push the prices up again on us on the uh, on the hotel by several hundred pounds, which was just ludicrous. Um, so I'm wondering if the future of the Southwest. I'm loath to sort of say we won't be doing that anymore because I think the shows do have an important job of getting people in the same room, makes people realise there are other people using Riscos in their area. But on the other hand, if we had to say, well, let's drop one show and make a virtual one instead, then there could be a case for sort of making the Southwest the virtual show and the London and Wakefield ones the, uh, the physical ones. And that would give coverage in the North and the region of the South. Um, but then obviously you've always got the problem in England that Cornwall is a very long way away from absolutely everywhere. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't know what the right thing is, but, you know, with, certainly with, 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 the, with the lack of a Southwest next year in mind, I do wonder whether that might, you know, going virtual for that might, might also be good um, going well, forward. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this, this is the first show I've ever managed to see all of the um, books and join in the conversations. Because I'm running, if you look over there, I've got a big screen telly running the YouTube. Um, I've been, my son has arrived today. I've been in the garden for about three hours, uh, having tea, socially distanced. Then I've still managed to catch up with all of the talks. I'm running them at double speed from places. and still keep the um, Zoom going. So it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's the first time I've caught all the talks. That was good. Mm. It's nice yeah, not interesting to have the between walking with the uh, show floor and the um, the talks. That has been very nice. Interesting. I, I play in a jazz convention in Australia, and they that one of the things they did they went to a different town every year because traveling over there the vast distances, so it was always nearer one lot than the other. I mean, you could. I mean, it might make difficulties for setting up the venue. But you could have a London show one year and a Southwest show the next year and alternate them. It's a, a good idea. Like that. It's a good idea, although I think it might be quite difficult to cancel a hotel for one year and then expect to be able to get. Yeah, in that, that's what I. Because I think that's the stumbling block. Although, having said that, there doesn't seem to be any honour amongst these at all, anyway. I mean, the fact that they were so keen to push, put 200, 250 quid, I think it was on our bill, this time round on the vague promise of, of, of improvements that they might make during the year to the venue. <laughs> um, just shows you really that, that you know, they're out for what they can get, which is understandable, I suppose. But, I think it's been uh, quite lucky with the St Giles and that they do always seem kind of keen to have us back. And the, almost well, these, these claim to be keen to have uh, us back, but they're keen to have us back at a high price. <laughs> Well, it's not well, certainly not limited to computer shows. It's um, it's I'm involved with helping run uh, some sort of fan run like uh, comic convention type things. And we've seen similar issues, not with our venue, but I've heard from other people in that sphere that one had their venue bill nearly double in a year with a similar reason where we're, we're going to refurbish the hotel. Um, and they turned up and none of the lifts were working and oh, their, their answer was um, you can use the fire stairs just for this weekend with 2,000 attendees trying to get from a five floor hotel <laughs> to the ground floor to the panel rooms and it was just utter chaos the whole weekend don't panic Mr Mandarin <laughs> I really do feel sorry for my friends on that event because I was there watching the chaos and just like I wish I could I was, step in and help. Gonna, I can't think of anything I can do here. I was just going to say the hotel wasn't the Norbrook Castle, was it? Uh, that one was one of the Hilton ones. Oh, uh, right. Okay. Birmingham Metropole. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I've been told that Mr. Mannering is 8.30 tonight on BBC One, I think it is. I've been told to get off the telly. Same goes <laughs> my YouTube. And Giles Hotel is booked for the London show next year already. Yeah, but 30th, 30th of October next year, put it in your diary. I think there was a, as, with, with a physical show from a, as a vendor, there is, there's a much more practical sales um, element that you don't get with the yeah. virtual show. Um, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I've not gone down and checked on the Flint store orders, um, but I can't imagine that 
our phone lines have been ringing red hot with orders as a result of my talk. So <coughs> in the past, the shows have tended to be a bit of the lifeblood in terms of trying to actually pulling in software sales to keep us afloat into Christmas. So that's an element that won't be happening, I don't think. I mean, maybe it will. Maybe there's going to be loads of orders on Pixar. I hope there is. But, um, things, things like, you know, those big monitors, those big curved monitors you sell. Yeah, I mean, they, they sell themselves when you walk in and see. Yeah, them. No, I, I agree. I mean, the, quite hard I always, it's horrible getting them in the car, but it, it, I always like to make a, a, a little bit of an effort for the shows to make things look look interesting and, and fun. And if people don't see the things live, they sometimes don't have an idea of a what we do and b what's possible with technology. I mean, things. Some of the, I, I always wish we could show a bit more in the way of networking and, and network storage and things because so many people don't have equipment because they either think they can't afford it or they don't know that how it would benefit them um and uh, and just sort of seeing does does sometimes give people ideas that they wouldn't otherwise have and i think you, you, the curved monitors are a classic example that people hadn't really seen big ultra wide monitors before um but seeing them at the show put, put you know sowed the seed um, you can't have a virtual charity stand <laughs> yeah, we've got some on that this year. We, that is true. That's, that's a very, very good example. Yeah, 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 that is true. I mean, there are two different experiences, but what about an international discourse show? It doesn't mean cancelling any any uh, local discourse show, just having an international discourse show for 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 just online for, for everyone that is. Yeah, we've got to tie in. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we get, having the physical shows, we need to have a separate one just branded as the international show that's yeah. an online one. Mm -hmm. it was, it was quite odd when I was advertising this, calling it a London show when it has no location. It's irrelevant. <laughs> kind of why I was touching on the physical, the kind of internet physical tie-in a little bit uh, as a potential option, but you do really do lose the kind of the hallway track and the random encounters, just running into someone at the the show that's talking about doing something similar or of interest to you and striking up a conversation. That's very true. Phil, while you're there, I've just done a quick inventory of some old floppies I have. Where right. do you want the info sent? Uh, I think my e email address was up earlier. I'll just drop it in the chat again. Um, and I'll pass that along to the, the folks in the Stardot Preservation Group, see what's, what the interest is. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll reply to that as well with the Discord link. So I've got that on a tab somewhere. Phil, um, Hi. yeah, clear it for you. Um, have you got any other plans for it, or is that all the applications that come with it? Well, he's thinking about that. Just to say, brilliant show, everyone. I have to go because the Memsar has just said that dinner's ready. Okay. <laughs> I'm Thanks to everybody. Sure. Absolutely brilliant. Farewell. I'm quite sure of a question. Yeah. 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 The only the only thing I wanted to add to before was that for years, I, you know, I'm very sensitive to the international show because for years in Italy we never had uh, any news about risk costs because we were not enough people to make a show like in Rome or Milan, and and there are other communities very small, uh, you know, in other countries that probably really need something like that despite this the, the, the logo show guys thank you very much this was amazing um i gotta go I to buy some burgers <laughs> <laughs> following you on YouTube, but it's still running thank you thank you very much bye nice seeing you paolo yeah thank you leo <laughs> goodbye to everyone